Theological Conference in collaboration with Indian Society for Plant Physiology for the first time in Kerala. Before moving to the program, the participants are requested to kindly keep their mobile phones in silent mode. Prayer is an act of communication by humans with God that brings peace, harmony and love among us. So let us begin the program with a prayer and may I request Ms. Parvati Krishnan of First MSc Botany to begin the program with a prayer song. like to request you all to observe one minute silence as a condolence on the demise of our beloved Dr. G. S. Sirohisa. May I request Professor M.B. Chetty, ISPP President, to share some fond memories. Sir, please. Good morning, everyone. I am here to share a few words about uh, Dr. G.S. Rohi. Probably youngsters are not aware who is Dr. Siroi, but most of the physiologists, senior physiologists in the country, they are very well aware of the contributions of uh, Dr. Giriraj Singh Sirohi. Dr. Giriraj Singh Sirohi had his last breath on 1st July 2022. He was uh, suffering from pneumonia and he could not recover. He died at the age of 96. He was uh, stepping into 97, he had stepped into 97 years. I happened to be the student of Dr. Siroi for my PhD at Indian Agriculture Research Institute, New Delhi. I will not make a big speech, just in few words, I would like to rem remember the contributions of Dr. Siroi. Dr. Siroi is the first Indian to go to Antarctica in 1964. He was the student at University of California, Los Angeles. From there, he got an idea of studying the biological clocks, how the plants behave when we take them to Antarctica. That was the mission which Dr. Siroi had. And he stayed in Antarctica for 100 days alone and conducted the experiments. And of the four people who started their journey from Los Angeles to Antarctica, Two people could not sustain the seasickness and they returned back. Two people finally reached the destination 
Antarctica. Of the two people, after a few days, one person died. And those days, there were no communication and also the transport, which was easily available as of now. And Dr. Siroi was conducting experiments, keeping a dead body in his uh, tent for 100 days. And because of his braveness and because of his contributions, the U.S. government named uh, a place in Antarctica as Siroi Point. If you Google through the Antarctica map, you will find Siroi Point. And those days in 1964, $10,000 award was given to Dr. Siroi. And he came back and he was head of the Department of uh, Division of Plant Physiology at IRI. He was offered the vice chancellorship in number of universities like PU Ludhiana, HAU Hisar, Pantanagar, and many other places he was offered the vice chancellorship. He said, no, I don't want to leave Delhi and go, and leaving the Division of Plant Physiology and go. And he finally, uh, you know, retired from the Division of Plant Physiology uh, at New Delhi. This is in brief about Dr. Siroi. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for your kind words. The Department of Botany extends our warmest welcome in the form of a special welcome song composed in Hindi and Malayalam by our own students, Parvati Krishnan, Chandni, Kavya Pradeep, Aparna Shri Kumar, and Jiji. So may I invite the group to play the melodious song.
Guru Parvati and team for such a lovely song. Most Honorable Vice Chancellor of Calicut University, Professor M. K. Jairaj, the Chief Guest of the Day, Professor M. B. Chetty, President, ISPP, former Vice Chancellor, University of Agriculture Sciences, Darwad, Karnataka, Distinguished ISPP South Zonal Secretary, Dr. R. Gomti, Principal Scientist, ICAR Sugarcane Breeding Institute, Coimbatore, Respected Professor P. Partha Sarathi, Co-Convener, Department of Environmental Sciences, Andhra University, Vishakapatanam, Distinguished Professor Sergei Shabala, School of Agriculture Sciences, University of Tasmania, Australia, Respected Professor Joe Steve Puthur, Convener, Head, Department of Botany, University of Calicut, Professor Santosh Nambi, Department of Botany, University of Calicut, I, I kindly request you to be seated on the dais. Dignitaries on and off the dais, eminent scientists and professors of various institutes, teaching faculties, non-teaching staff, research scholars and students. A warm welcome to the inaugural ceremony of International Conference Come Workshop on Physiological and Molecular Mechanisms for Abiotic Stress Tolerance in Plants, jointly organized by the Indian Society of Plant Physiology, South Zone, and the Department of Botany, University of Calicut. To welcome the gathering, may I invite Professor Josti Putur, convener, head, Department of Botany, and the Director of Central Sophisticated Instrumentation <coughs> Facility, University of Calicut. So <coughs> please. Honorable <coughs> Vice Chancellor of uh, Calicut University, Professor N. K. Jairaj, Professor Chetty, the SPP President and former Vice Chancellor of uh, Darwad University of Agriculture Sciences, uh, Professor Sege, uh, Professor Partha Saradi, Dr. Gomadi, and uh, my dear colleague uh, uh, Dr. Santosh Nambi, uh, Professor uh, Om Pragash Jangar, yeah, then uh, Professor Raghavendra, Dr. Umesh, our resource persons, Dr. Babu, Professor Raj Gobal, Dr. Vanaja, Dr. Dinagar, other uh, senior professors and scientists from various institutions faculty from our department, non-teaching staff, other participants from various institutions, and my dear students, a warm good morning to all. This conference was planned some six to seven months back, and that started with the visit of uh, my mentor and guide, Professor Partha Sarvi, in last January to our university for a frontier lecture. When he visited that time, he gave me, or he in fact, he told me that uh, you need a new dimension in your research now in order to make a right angle turn, we need to conduct an international workshop. And it started with all with that. Then when I discussed with him, I told, okay, we are getting resource persons for the workshop. Why can't we make it a conference so that more, more people will be benefited? because our students will get an exposure to the resource persons and all. Then he readily agreed. The next stage was that I talked with uh, our uh, dear Dr. Gomadi, who is the South Zone Secretary of ISPP. And ISPP is a very big uh, professional scientific society with more than 1,500 life members. And uh, we have separate uh, zonal secretaries for each zone, and uh, she's taking care of the South Zone, and when I discussed with her, she very happily agreed to that and told, yeah, we need a South Zone uh, event, and let us make it as a national event, not just South Zone. We will make it as a national event. Let us make it as something equal to National Conference on Plant Physiology, and CPP. And that way, we went ahead, and today, now everything has happened, and we are witnessing our uh, conference, what is happening over here. Moreover, when we planned for this conference, we also planned it uh, along with the 90th birthday of Professor Govindji. I am sure the seniors who are sitting here, 
very good number will be knowing about professor govind ji is an authority in uh, photosynthesis and uh, he has worked with the nobel laureates and he has worked with uh, stalwarts in photosynthesis like uh, rabinovich emerson the students may be knowing about emerson enhancement effect at all in photosynthesis so he got the opportunity to work with that and in the outside you must have seen that z scheme and uh, he has detailed the set scheme he along with his other group that is why in order to make it symbolic and in order to commemorate his 90th birthday we have kept that uh, z scheme over here and today evening 7 o'clock will be on which was day before yesterday and that is his 90th birthday so we wanted to have this program coinciding with that then when i first uh, floated the brochure i got the comments from the northern part of india saying that jos your conference is going to be failure why it's diwali time nobody will turn up and you yourself are witnessing the hall is full and we are finding it difficult only the few seats in front are vacant just because our uh, students are very reluctant to come forward and sit in the front seats that is why otherwise the hall is full if you turn back you can see the hall is totally full so the diwali has not at all affected uh, our conference and in fact some has taken it as an advantage because this is a holiday time so they can move around and uh, enjoy conference as well as kerala i think most of them have turned out with uh, this uh, thought and we have an overwhel overwhelming uh, response for the registration of this conference and just to give you a statistics on that we have 350 participants each day and uh, total abstracts is 108 and invited lectures are 5 lead lectures are 7 short lectures are 12 and uh, oral presentations are 49 poster presentations are 49 so this is at par with any national conference event and we have tried to make it as much as good possible and i know you all have traveled a long way we have uh, participants when i just saw the list of registrations i see people from shimla is here from goa from uh, haryana then uh, from uh, the eastern side from every part of india has reached 120 outside registrations that is a big record and you have taken great pains to travel and reach here and i have to thank you all for that now this is a mega event academic event we have 10 days program it starts with today we have uh, three days of uh, conference after that you know botany cannot be studied inside a particular room or in a hall so saturday we are moving out for a field study saturday and sunday we will be in the field study of course only few people have opt opted for the field study and saturday sunday we will do the field study and come back on monday for the workshop which is another five days so the total event comes to be 10 days that is the total mega event academic event taking place we have tried to make your stay as much as comfortable as possible but there may be some uh, shortcomings and kindly bear with us and whatever possible we can try to do just uh, try to hint we'll try to do the best for you and i am sure you are all going to have a wonderful academic experience because the great physiologists are here sitting here sitting there and sitting here and the youngsters should interact with this uh, great physiologists it's a rare opportunity for you to get uh, interaction and i am su sure you will get a good time of uh, interactions and deliberations of course we were missing this sort of uh, academic events for uh, two years you know about the covid situation and i think this may be one of the mega physiology events after a, a big gap of uh, covid even uh, ncpp has not taken place if i am right only the online form has taken place last year not the uh, offline process yeah now i will uh, come to my duty uh, our vice chancellor uh, is our role model he is a great uh, academician and also uh, he He has good number of publications and citations as well as patents, and we always look ahead to him because uh, we are uh, always trying to see some role models. And I have seen him as a role model for our uh, professors. And also, he was uh, spearheading our uh, NAC accreditation process in the last month, 
because uh, I was closely working together with him in the NAC accreditation process. And uh, I'll take this opportunity to congratulate him for getting A plus for the university in the last accreditation process with a grade point of 3.45, which is almost near to A double plus. That is the highest uh, grade what we can get. And uh, uh, one thing what I have noticed that whenever I approach as head of the department and uh, director of central sophisticated, sophisticated instrumentation facility, whenever I go to him with some uh, proposals, if it, it is an academic event, I am sure to get it uh, uh, granted before I enter his room. I know it will be granted. That is the quality of a great academician. And I welcome you, sir, for this uh, uh, inaugural function of our uh, conference. <laughs> Professor M. B. Chetty, our ISPP president, is here. And uh, as I told earlier, he is the president of one of the largest uh, uh, professional scientific societies, that is Indian Society of Plant Physiology. And uh, he, I would already told around more than 1,500 members, life members are there in this particular society. And uh, I was fortunate that he retired last month because otherwise he would have been not been here. <laughs> I was just talking to Dr. Gomadi. Then uh, she said, no, no way he can reach because he's too busy. Fortunately, the month previous to this, I think in September, sir, you got, July, he got re retired. And now we are fortunate. I think he is little less busy now. So, and I re thank you, sir, for coming over here. And when I called him over phone, he readily agreed. We had very few less interactions in N NCPP meetings. But when I called him, he immediately responded, Joe, what, what news? So he has already learned about our conference as well as about me and all. So immediately responded and he said, yes, I am coming. Um, get ready with uh, other activities. So thank you, sir. I welcome you for the function, our inaugural function. <laughs> Professor uh, Sergi Shabala from Tasmania University is here. He is giving the opening lecture. And uh, I have the first contact with him when I was in EMBO lecture, EMBO conference in New Delhi in 2019. And I think we had very few interactions during this EMBO conference. But still, when I told him about this conference, he readily agreed to come. And you have to think of his the long travel he had, which he has to make. I think two days before he started from Australia, and he has taken all the pains to come over here. Welcome you, Professor uh, Sergey, for being with us for uh, three days. <laughs> Professor Parthasardi, my mentor and guru. And uh, I can say that I am here just uh, before, uh, because of him. He has really molded me and uh, recently he has just uh, superannuated from the uh, University of Delhi. Now he has uh, joined uh, in the uh, University of Andhra as uh, Emeritus uh, faculty. And uh, regularly we are conducting meetings. Once the workshop was started out, he was more interested in the workshop part. So regular meetings, whatever chemicals has to be arranged, whatever way we have to proceed with the workshop, everything. Mostly we are having the meetings every two weeks, yeah, once in two weeks, just to uh, find out how the things has to be planned well. So meticulously he has done that. And Dr. Umesh and Dr. Dinagar is here. We together are planning for the workshop. They are the resource persons. I welcome you, sir, the, for this international conference. <laughs> Dr. Gomadi, very vibrant zonal secretary. Yesterday she was here right from the morning and she has taken the charge of the conference. Immediately landed, she told, bring the conference schedule. I want to check the conference schedule, how it is progressing. So things have been meticulously <laughs> planned and she has done it very well. I welcome you, Dr. Gomadi, to this uh, work, uh, conference. <laughs> Professor Sandosh Nambi, one of the senior faculty in our department, former head, secretary of Indian Association of Angiosperm Taxonomy, another organization, big organization, having more than 1,000 life members. He is the Indian Secretary and we have the headquarters here in, for Indian Association for Angiosperm Taxonomy. He is the officer in charge of uh, Calicut University Botanical Garden. Today evening you all will be visiting that garden and you can appreciate and admire what he has done in the garden and all. So welcome you sir for this uh, inaugural function. And uh, I welcome all our uh, research persons here. We have uh, already I mentioned in the uh, beginning Om Prakash Dhangar, uh, Professor Raghavendra, Dr. Umesh, Dr. Babu, Professor Rajagobal, Dr. 
vanajja dr dinagar and uh, tomorrow uh, no today noon dr silvia from hungary will be joining dr ashwini parik will be joining day after tomorrow so all our resource persons i welcome the resource persons also i welcome the delegates from far and wide you have made this conference a success and so far i already mentioned how far you have traveled and we have people from shimla varanasi goa haryana gujarat mumbai i am not mentioning all states but more registrations have come up from ap andhra pradesh tamil nadu telangana kerala karnataka of course this is a southern part of india so this is, they can travel quickly so welcome you all delegates to this uh, uh, function and uh, students have shown a great interest i was astonished to see that there are uh, registrations from 22 colleges from nearby colleges and 130 pg students ug students are here now tomorrow another 100 will be coming so they have shown a great interest so uh, welcome you all students and uh, we have students uh, i already told is 132 and our former professors are here and professor uh, uh, madhu madhu sir is here he is always supporting our to our uh, department activities sir sir welcome you and also the faculty of our department is here they are sitting in the front row back rows and all and they are the real strength for our department the yesterday they were asking how you can arrange all these activities so meticulously i said it is because of my colleagues and my students they have done such a hard work and whatever you see is because of them i welcome and uh, i welcome you all to this function and uh, thank you thank you sir it is of great privilege to invite professor mb chetty president indian society of plant physiology and former vice chancellor university of agricultural sciences darwad karnataka to deliver the presidential address sir please thank you very much professor mk jairaj the most respected honorable vice chancellor of uh, calicut university dr josh puttur the convener of this international conference as well as uh, the workshop professor pardasarathi my old friend i can say old friend i know him for more than two decades professor pardasarathi from andhra university professor sergey shebala from australia dr gomati as mentioned by dr jos the vibrant uh, zonal secretary of the indian society of plant physiology dr gomati santosh uh, nambi the another colleague of uh, professor josh professor raghavendra the senior physiologist and senior mentor of uh, most of uh, the physiologists professor sharma from goa university dr lakshman from indian institute of horticulture research bengaluru dr umesh from texas a&m university babu dr raj gopal dr abida from kerala agriculture university and uh, many more faculty members from calicut university from other colleges and universities the members of the indian society of plant physiology and my dear student friends invitees press and media in fact it gives me a great pleasure to be in kerala time and again it is said that it is uh, god's own destination god's own country any opportunity of visiting kerala in the last 3 and 1/2 decades of my service i have never missed probably this may be nth time i am in kerala i was a regular visitor to kerala agriculture university trishur on number of occasions whether it is uh, conducting the examination of the students attending uh, national and international conferences selection of officers selection of professors and many occasions i never missed any occasion to visit uh, cochin trishur trivandrum many of the institutes icr institutes are also located in kerala and as uh, the assistant director general of the indian council of agriculture research when i was working in delhi i also never missed because i was conducting uh, the all india entrance exam probably many of you might have attended the students are here and the biggest problem i faced uh, was from kerala only because 
during that year, probably it was in the year 2018 or 19, 2017, incessant trains and the Cochin airport was washed off and no train service, no bus service and because and whatever the court cases used to come to ICR because of Kerala only. Number of court cases I had to face um, because by the students they went to court for uh, not reaching uh, the destination, uh, the venue of the examination in time uh, and also a lot of anomalies. So that's why I just cannot forget but uh, leave about uh, the bad part of it, the good part of it is every moment of my stay in Kerala, in any number of times I really enjoyed Kerala. So uh, that's why when Dr. Jose uh, called me, I said it is a wonderful opportunity for me to visit Kerala again. I instantly I agreed, Dr. Jose, I am coming. So that's how I am here in front of you this morning as uh, uh, one of uh, the admirer of uh, the Kerala state as, and also the president of the Indian Society for Plant Physiology. It's a really wonderful uh, occasion that uh, you are celebrating the 90th uh, uh, birth um, uh, anniversary of uh, Professor Govindji. I know Professor Govindji very closely. He was my teacher also. When I was uh, doing PhD, we had a United Nations Development Program, UNDP program at IRI New Delhi. Again, the UNDP was bought because of Dr. Sirohi, who died very recently. And uh, Dr. Sirohi was a very good friend of uh, Professor Govindji. And the photosynthesis and plant productivity course at IRI for me while doing PhD was partly taught by Professor Govindji. That's how I was inspired by his lectures and also I was inspired by the way in which he was working. And uh, that's what really made me because I was so impressed the way he used to teach about the Z scheme of photosynthesis. Many of the students because I see large number of students you are all aware of what is Z scheme of photosynthesis, photosystem 1, photosystem 2, whole chain electron transport and so on and so forth. Professor Raghavendra also working on the photosynthesis, probably he was, he was also a close associate of uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Govindji. And Govindji taught and it, that really inspired me. Then I, for my PhD, I told my Professor Sirohi, why can't I start working on photosystems in ERI New Delhi? He said, we don't have the facility. We, don't, we didn't have the facility at that time to conduct uh, the electron transport system. All these facilities and also the technical know-how we did not have. Only Professor Govindji used to teach the theory, not the practical part of it. So then I, had, I did not have the practical uh, you know, knowledge of uh, how to conduct research on the photosystems. Then uh, Dr. Siroi suggested me to go to Madurai University. There one Professor Gnanam was there. And in Delhi University, one Salil, Dr. Salil Bose was there. They were, that time, the pioneers. They are also students of uh, Professor Govindji. And they were Mohanti, Professor Mohanti. They all, they all worked in uh, the laboratory of uh, Professor Govindji. And uh, then Professor Siroi told you, go and stay there for one or two weeks. You get some training and come back and take up uh, the research on the photosystems. I started the research on photosystems at IRI Plant Physiology Division way back in 1983. So that's how I know Professor Govindji very closely. And I'm glad that uh, the, uh, you know, the Botany Department of Calicut University is, uh, you know, is, uh, uh, celebrating the 90th uh, birth anniversary of uh, uh, Professor Govindji. So that is about uh, my interaction with uh, Professor Govindji. And again, I continued my work on uh, photosystems. When I went for a postdoc at University of California, Los Angeles, because I wanted to do something and study the in detail about these photosystems and Z scheme of photosynthesis. And uh, fortunately, I was, uh, fo you know, kind, I mean, my guide was kind enough, Professor Noble, another great biophysicist who was working on uh, various biophysical aspects. He is basically an aeronautical engineer, developed interest in biology. He became one of the greatest biologists uh, in the world. And uh, probably uh, the students, if you look into the books of uh, Professor Govindji, Bioenergetic Subphotosynthesis, Volume 1, Bioenergetic Subphotosynthesis, Volume 2, they are the wonderful books written on the electron transport system. The huge volume, 400, 500 page book is writing only on various components of the electron transport chain. So that is how the contribution of these great scientists. And then I continued my work for my postdoc for two years at uh, UCLA uh, in US on photosystems only. And I could publish the, uh, you know, 
good you know, in, in plant physiology and photosynthesis research. That's how I have lot of respect and regard for uh, Professor uh, uh, Govindji. And uh, uh, once again, I would like to compliment uh, Professor Jose and also uh, Dr. Parasardi for taking initiative to celebrate the 90th uh, birthday of uh, Professor Govindji. And uh, coming back to the topic, the physiological and molecular mechanisms um, or the markers for abiotic stress tolerance in plants. Uh, you, why this, uh, you know, research on stress physiology, research on abiotic stress resistance is becoming important in not only in India, world over. Because you know that what we are facing, the climate change, uh, vagaries of climate, which we have probably uh, some of the states in, uh, uh, in India, like uh, Orissa, uh, when it comes to cyclones and floods, it is Orissa. When it com comes to the excess rainfall, it is uh, the Kerala. You have more experience of the climate change than any other part of uh, the country. Leave about the people, uh, you know, living in other states, but the people living in these two states, probably they can speak more and better about the climate change, what is happening to the nature, what is happening to every human beings, that's about the climate change. And the droughts, you all know that uh, I recently I read a paper by uh, the Un United Nations uh, Conservation to Combat Desertification. There is an association and uh, they have very beautifully analyzed about the impact of drought and how drought is affecting. A number of number and duration of the droughts have risen by 29% in the last 20 years from since 2020 the occurrence of the droughts, both the number and the duration. In the last three years, we are facing a different type of problem. In the last three years, we are getting excess rainfall. We are not uh, getting, we are, we, we are not f facing the drought. Maybe in, you know, in uh, select areas, very few areas, there may be drought. But otherwise, the normal prediction of the IMD, when it predicts the normal rainfall, it is always above the normal rainfall. The areas which were receiving 600 to 700 millimeter of rainfall are receiving not less than 1200 to 1500 millimeter of rainfall in the last three years. Before three years, we had a successive drought for three years. Before, uh, you know, uh, uh, we had we had uh, we had the drought, and uh, it is also estimated that over 1.4 billion people were affected by drought in the last 20 years, and this 50 percent of the disasters. Maybe several kinds of disasters occur and this 50% of the disasters are because of the drought and of the 50% of these disasters, 45% are occurring in developed nations and more so in Asia. But this year, this trend has changed because we used to have the you know, uh, um, rainfall shortage, we used to have so many other problems, but this is shifted towards Europe. Now you can see there is a famine, there is a you know, severe drought in many of the European countries and there is no drinking water. So this is what is really happening and this is all due to climate change, this is all due to the impact of uh, uh, these climate changes. And these droughts represented 15% of natural disasters but took largest human toll. So far, 6,50,000 people have died in the last 20 years because of the drought. This is the statistics given by the United Nations and uh, in the last 20 years, droughts caused global economic losses of roughly 124 billion. So you can imagine on an average, every year, 6 to 7 billion US dollars loss is caused because of the drought. And in 2022, more than 2.3 billion people face water stress. Almost 160 million children are exposed to severe and prolonged droughts and more than 10 million people died due to major droughts in the last 22 years. So this is the impact of drought. Under such uh, situations, it is necessary that we have to concentrate on how to mitigate the drought and how to overcome the drought. And uh, these are for mitigating the drought and what is required is multiple action plan is required and we have to prepare the road map. That's why people all over the world are working on abiotic stresses. Of course, the people are also working on the biotic stresses and the people are working on the abiotic uh, stresses. But uh, d doing research on abiotic stresses is not that simple as we think of because the response of the plants under changing climatic situation, whatever the data which we have accumulated, 
is different and what the data which we are going to accumulate in due course of time in the years to come is going to be different because we have to study all these things under the changing climatic situations. As if, you see, if you look at the plants, when you grow the plants in the greenhouse, when you grow the plants in pots and when you grow the plants in the open field, the reaction is not the similar. You may get some kind of, uh, you know, response but the reality it has to be in the open field and many of the studies which uh, people are conducting on abiotic stresses all over the world are confined to the greenhouses and glasshouses but it cannot be completely extrapolated to the open field conditions. What farmers are facing, the drought which farmers are facing is different and the drought what you know the abiotic stress which we are measuring under uh, greenhouse conditions is totally different. That's why we have to prepare a road map how this research has to be conducted. And uh, you all, you all uh, know that uh, uh, we are at the crossroads as far as uh, the managing the drought is concerned and for which the full global commitment uh, to drought preparedness and resilience in all the regions takes a pri priority. And in many institutes, probably uh, you are even in the institute because it is a, uh, you know, a general university, probably you may not have that kind of uh, road map as far as uh, uh, facing the drought is concerned, but most of the ICR institutes and also uh, state agriculture universities, contingent plan is prepared. Every year, contingent government insists on preparing the contingent plan. And this contingent plan tells about under situation of drought and depending on the duration and also uh, the intensity of drought, what kind of alternate crops can be grown. And if we identify certain markers, which this conference is going to aim, the molecular markers, because we have studied many aspects of the drought, like, you know, there are many ways the plants cope up with uh, the adverse climatic situations and the adverse drought situations or high temperature situations, ionic stress and all kinds of stress, plants have the inherent capacity to tolerate. But for tolerating the inherent capacity, it needs to have certain mechanisms, alternative mechanisms. We have to think of the alternative mechanisms with which the plant can cope up with the adverse climatic situations. Probably this conference as well as the workshop is going to focus on what are these molecular and genetic markers for overcoming the drought or making the plants more robust, sustainable, productive and long lasting. That is what I think uh, in the 10 days which uh, Professor Jose was mentioning that conference is uh, for 10 days and also workshop, you are going to work out the strategies, you are going to work out the roadmap for preparing all of you for the drought as well as diabetic stress uh, tolerance. And it is not just because we have all these days with the several research, um, you know, uh, for the last, because as a student I have, uh, uh, you know, studied the law, uh, I have studied the abiotic stress situations and how the plants cope up under abiotic stress situations, what are the modifications which the plants undergoes, maybe physiological modifications, physical modifications, phenotypic changes, genotypic changes and several modifications plants uh, un um, you know, undergo and probably you see the, uh, the desert species and what is, what are these desert species? De desert species are nothing but the modification to adjust to the limited water conditions and they experience not only uh, the abiotic stress situation, not only the water shortage, but also they are exposed to high temperature, uh, high, high temperatures. That's how they are modified, but they are not productive. Like, you know, <coughs> I was uh, uh, discussing with uh, some of uh, the people with whom Professor Raghavendra has an association of converting C3 to C4 mechanisms, like mulberry. I am on the, uh, you know, I am the research <coughs> chairman of uh, the research advisory committee of Central Sericulture board, uh, Sericulture board and one of the scientists has taken up the work on convert because mulberry is basically a C3 plant and they want to convert C3 into C4. I told him it is not that easy. People have been trying since decades of converting C3 to C4. It is only the adaptation which has to, you know, take care because you have genetic markers, you can identify the genes which can convert, but the thing is converting C3 to C4, even the anatomical changes have to take place. That's what I, we were discussing and Professor Raghavendra is expert, probably he may be speaking on those things uh, during uh, uh, this conference because I used to refer to one of the papers of Professor Raghavendra when I was a PhD student. So I don't know whether he knows or not, but he's sitting here 
but I, that was a wonderful paper. I, when I met him about a decade back, I told him, Sir, I was referring your paper about the comparison of C3, C4 and camp plants. Because, because the mechanism of stress tolerance and mechanism of abiotic stress resistance in C3, C4 and camp plants, it is totally different. It is, it is not just, uh, you know, uh, what is really required. It is not just the chemical manipulation. We can induce the drought by chemical means because you know that which of one of the you know important hormones as far as uh, abiotic stress tolerance is concerned, it is abscisic acid. So there is a chemical means, there is a, 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 a genetic means and now they have added microbiota, they have added microbiological means because plants are grown under natural soil conditions and they in, in the root in the root zone there are several microbes both beneficial as well as harmful microbes exist and how these microbes interact with the root in the root zone with the plants and how they impact either uh, you know synergistic synergistic effect or antagonistic effect or multiple effect on the plants as far as stress tolerance is concerned when we study the abiotic stress tolerance in plants we have to concentrate not just on the tolerance mechanism we have to concentrate on the productivity also we just cannot ignore the productivity part of it if you just like i i visited in hawaii when i went to hawaii i visited uh, volcano park there is a place called volcano park in that path it is identified and every time every year the volcanoes erupt when the volcanoes erupt you never know when i visited the volcano park i saw well park park i saw a plant which is you know there next to the fire and i asked the people you know the, the, uh, working there in that volcano park they said that this plant is there i, I have been seeing since decades and next to that it the always the volcano but that is a kind of adaptation this is a kind of mechanism which has it has developed what mechanisms this have developed i have always uh, posed a question to our uh, biotechnology there may be many students interested in biotechnology and there may be many faculty who are experts in uh, biotechnology i always uh, pose a problem to our biotechnologists that uh, why can't you introduce a gene into uh, the plants you know you know uh, the field crops like maybe it is uh, sorghum maybe it is pigeon pea chickpea uh, you know maize sugarcane whatever maybe why can't you introduce a, take a gene isolate a gene from the prosophis juliflora probably i do not know how many of you are aware of prosophis juliflora in canada we call it as ballari jali wherever you go under any conditions whether it is a severe drought and severe high temperatures like you know 50 degrees celsius in jodhpur in gujarat in other places or you go under flood flooding situations any kind of situations marshy lands well fertile lands it grows very profusely nobody fertilize, uh, fertilizes and uh, nobody puts fertilizer nobody gives water but still it profusely grows so what mechanism it has if we identify isolate the gene from such of the systems and introduce into our field crops then we can certainly bring in kind of resistance as well as the productivity what is important is not just studying uh, the the tolerance mechanism to abiotic stresses or resistance mechanisms to abiotic stresses we should also concentrate more on the productivity when it comes to agriculture because you know that uh, uh, food is necessary we have to grow more and more food to feed the burgoing population of this country so that's why under such situations identifying the molecular markers and the number of genes have been identified like the uh, like uh, several genes have been identified which are bringing tolerance to abiotic stresses and these genes it should not remain at the uh, you know publication level it should be extrapolated to the field level and most of these genes and the why the physiologists over the country over in the country have failed i don't say that because we have not been able to show our existence as a physiologist in any scheme or in any system i have not been able to show the physiologists have, have not been able to show their existence because we are at the academic level but it should be at the practical level we have to take all this research you identify the genes what what next after identifying the gene after identifying the markers where they can be used in speed breeding it can be used in which of the mechanisms it can be used so that it brings in more tolerance along with the productivity with these few words i will not take uh, much time i think already i have exceeded my time limit so with this uh, few words uh, i once again uh, thank professor josh for jo josh putur for uh, inviting me to chair 
and also be preside over uh, this uh, important uh, international conference and also workshop and also thank the honorable vice chancellor uh, for permitting josh to uh, in invite me and uh, dr gomathi who has uh, always been uh, very uh, active in all the society uh, interactions and society meetings and that is the reason she is being consequently being elected as the south zone uh, secretary and i am really glad that she has been contributing a lot for the development of uh, the society with this few words i thank every one of you thank you so much thank you sir for your kind words honorable vice chancellor professor mk jairaj university of calicut was a professor in department of physics cochin university of science and technology and a visiting professor in tokyo institute of technology japan may i request honorable vice chancellor to officially inaugurate the program by lighting the lamp and delivering the inaugural speech sir please P.P. Dr. Gomadi, Professor Pasarzi, Professor Shabala, the keynote speaker, distinguished guests, delegates, and my dear students. A warm welcome to Calicut University. And I congratulate the Department of Botany as well as ISPP for organizing an international conference on physiological molecular mechanism for abiotic stress tolerance in plants, especially a period when Kerala is facing cloud blasters and floods and so on. So this area is somewhat something which has to be studied in more detail. And I am sure that this conference like this will come up with solutions for abiotic stress tolerance in plants. And I believe that abiotic stress as well as biotic stress these are all interlinked with global warming. <clears throat> Today also we witness commemorating the 
contributions of two great scientists. Professor Guam Ziji was contributed to the understanding of photosynthesis. Also, we were listening to Professor Shetty about uh, the contributions made by Professor Sirohi, who spent 100 days with, his, uh, with the dead body of his colleague in uh, Arctic to study the stress behavior in plants. I believe that the life of these two scientists will enthuse young states how to how dedicate you have to be to contribute to the area where which in which you are involved i am coming from an area of physics and for us climate change is there from the origin of universe if you look the even the history of Earth, it has a period where the temperature was something like 2,300 degrees centigrade, when there were more collisions and Earth was so hot. And gradually when it cooled down, <coughs> you had an atmosphere which is full of methane and devoid of oxygen, and you had the microbes. And Earth also had a period when its uh, ice was covered from polar to equator. And you have uh, later that uh, there had been volcanic eruptions which resulted in the greenhouse houses like uh, carbon dioxide. And the atmosphere was conducive to have photosynthesis. You have the cyanobacteria which produce the photosynthesis with the help of solar energy and uh, water. And uh, nowadays, the, most of the physicists and uh, chemists are trying to mimic this photosynthesis for having uh, efficient energy production. If you want to have something efficient, the easiest way is to mimic nature. So these things, as, uh, as you know, that there was changes in the climate. But what we're speaking about global warming and climate change is nothing different from what the history of Earth evolution. The climate change and its effect uh, became more prominent after uh, 1900 or 1950s. The global warming was uh, about only 0.18 degree. Uh, before 1900. Now you can see that the global warming rate is about 1.3 degrees per decade. So this is something alarming. And uh, now we are seeing the direct effect on our own life. As the professor said, was showing that, saying that Orissa is seeing unnatural droughts and uh, heavy rains. In Kerala, if you look the uh, rainfall statistics, maybe the rainfall is, uh, average rainfall is as same as before, but we have the heavy cloud burst, which results in floods. That flood was very unnatural. We have never experienced 100 years during the last 100 years. But last four years, we have repeated floods. This kind of uh, global warming produces uh, uh, taller the uh, stress in abiotic stress in plants. So we have to find some ways how to have plants which has a tolerance in uh, to abiotic stress as well as biotic stress. So I'm sure that a conference of this kind, which will address this kind of problem and produce and uh, come up with solutions so that uh, <coughs> it is our duty that our generation is or our, our previous generation has more contributed to the global warming and uh, then it is our duty to 
find out solutions for that. And uh, as a responsible scientist, we all come together and we will find out solution to this kind of problem. So I'm not prolonging more. With all your permission, I declare this international conference on physiological and molecular mechanism markers for abiotic stress tolerance in plants inaugurated. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now I would like to invite Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor M.K. Jairaj, to present the memento as a token of our love to our esteemed chief guest, Professor M. B. Chetty, President, Indian Society of Plant Physiology, former Vice Chancellor, University of Agricultural Sciences, Dharwad. Sir, please. Thank you, sir. We are what we are today in the scientific community because of the ambition, hard work, and dedication of our foreigners. We always look up to them for inspiration, and at occasions like these, it is our obligation to appreciate, honor, and thank their efforts. Now, I wholeheartedly invite Dr. Jostri Putur to extend our gratitude to our beloved professors and faculties for their outstanding and enviable contributions in the field of botany. Sir, please. Our uh, former professors as well as the present professors have brought uh, laurels to our department. But in this great occasion, we would like to honor uh, the great professors who have uh, brought extra laurels for our uh, department. And uh, the first is uh, Padmasri Professor K.S. Manilal, the former professor and head of the Department of Botany, as well as the former president of Indian Association for Angiosperm Taxonomy, and he was also the chief editor of international journal Redia. And uh, one of his greatest work was the interpretation of uh, the Hortus Malabaricus in translation to Malayalam and English. And uh, he was awarded, not because of this work, for the entire work in taxonomy, he has been awarded the Padmasri by government of India, but due to ill health, he could not turn up and he is uh, having a great difficulty in moving, so he has not turned up. And second is Prof. Ram Sabu, and uh, he was the former head Department of Botany and also former secretary of uh, Indian Association for Angiosperm Taxonomy, and recently he was ad awarded the Janagi Amal Award by the Ministry of Environment and Forest for Plant Taxonomy and he also could not turn up because of some uh, preoccupation. And uh, another is our uh, Professor Sandosh Nambi, who is in the dais, the former head Department of Botany and the present Secretary of Indian Association of Angiosperm Taxonomy, Executive Editor of Readia, the journal uh, published by the association, former vip, Vice President of Indian Botanical Society, and he is the recipient of Todd Stutze Gold Medal Award in 2020 and also P. Maheshri gold medal uh, constituted by Indian Botanical Society in 2022. And I uh, request uh, our uh, Vice Chancellor to honor him in this dais. Dr. Manju C. Nair, he's the, she's the recipient of the Women Botanist Award of the recently concluded uh, 45th Conference of Indian Botanical Society, which was uh, in Lucknow University. Uh, it was in last month. I invite uh, uh, Dr. Manju C. Nair and uh, our Vice Chancellor will be honoring her.
Thank you. Thank you, sir. As it is said that old is gold, we are also we are also having some true former professors, Professor N. Nilagandan, Professor S. Nandagumar, Professor Nabisa Salim, and Professor K. M. Jairam, who led the plant physiology and biochemistry division with such pride and prominence. So we are here delighted to honor them at this auspicious occasion. Due to their ill health and preoccupation, they are unable to be physically present here. May I request Dr. Mani Vijay, an alumnus of the Plant Physiology and Biochemistry Division and a PhD student of Professor Nanda Kumar to share some memories about the dearest professor. Sir, please. Our uh, Vice Chancellor has got a meeting, so with your permission, he wants to leave the meeting right now. So. Esteemed uh, dignitaries on the dais and dear participants, <coughs> I am standing before you with great pleasure to introduce the great teachers who laid down the foundation of plant physiology and biochemistry division of the Department of Botany University of Calicut. They are, as told, uh, Dr. N. Nilagantin, Dr. S. Nandakumar, Dr. Nabisa Salim, and Dr. Jairam. Professor Dr. N. Nilagandhan completed his MSc and PhD from the Sardar Patel University, Gujarat, served the department during the period 1972-2004, and he struggled a lot to establish the plant physiology back in division during its infant stage. Produced six PhDs, retired as the head of the department, his area of interest was growth and development, and still I remember his smiling, innocent face. Dr. Yen, uh, Dr. Nabisa Salim completed her MSc and PhD from the University of Calicut under the guidance of Dr. Nilakantan. Her postdoctoral studies was under Dr. P. S. Krishnan, joined in the department in 1990 and retired from service in 2010, produced 12 PhDs, published over 60 papers. Heavy metal toxicity and seed germination studies were her specialized areas. Professor Dr. Jairam K.M. completed his MSc and PhD from the University of Calicut under Dr. Nilagantin, published over 47 research papers, guided six students for PhD. He was focusing mainly on stress physiology. Professor Dr. S. Nandakumar completed his BSc in chemistry from Sanadana Tharma College, Alapura, joined for the MSc in the Department of Biochemistry, University of Lucknow, joined for research in the Department of Biochemistry, University of uh, Lucknow in 1969 under the legendary guide, Dr. P. S. Krishnan FNA, who was the student of Nobel Prize laureate, James B. Sumner. The topic was biochemical aspects of angiospermic parasites. PhD degree was awarded in 1976, and in the same year he joined the, as a lecturer in the biochemistry uh, uh, joined as lecturer in biochemistry in the Department of Botany, University of Calicut. He also taught the students of MSc Zoology, Calicut University for over 15 years and MSc Biotechnology students for over 12 years. Undertaken two projects, guided six MPhil and seven PhD students, published more than 15 papers. His major field of interest was in isolation, purification and characterization of enzymes served the department for over 30 years and retired from service in 2007. He was a member as well as chairman, board of studies, UG and PG, Calicut University for over 15 years, was subject expert in many UGC committees, was member of Pharmacopoeia Committee, Indian System of Medicine, Government of India. I borrow his words, wants to be better known as a teacher who strived to teach the fundamentals of biochemistry to students. 
I am sure that the present team of Plant Physiology Division, led by Dr. Jose Putur, is following the footprints laid down by their predecessors, and I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now it's time to virtually release the Book of Abstracts for the International Conference Come Workshop on Physiological and Molecular Mechanisms for Abiotic Stress Tolerance in Plants. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome our chief guest of the day, Professor M.B. Chetty, President, ISPP, and former Vice Chancellor, University of Agricultural Sciences, Darwad, to officially release the Book of Abstracts. Welcome, sir. Thank you, sir. To enlighten the audience on the activities and contributions of Indian Society for Plant Physiology, I cordially invite Dr. R. Gomadi, South Zonal Secretary, ISPP, and Principal Scientist, ICAR Sugarcane Breeding Institute, Coimbatore. Ma'am, please. Very good morning, all present over here. Respected uh, Honorable Vice, Vice President of uh, the largest member ISVP Society, Dr. M.P. Chetty, and uh, Professor M.K. Jairaj, Honorable Vice Chancellor of uh, Calicut University, and uh, Convener, Dr. Jose, and Dr. M.M. Manoran, Member S Syndicate University, the Calicut, and uh, Professor Bhattasaradi, and Professor uh, Sandos Nambi and uh, Professor Sabala from uh, Australia in Dias. And after Dias, I'd like to um, mention the uh, Dr. Raghavendra, Professor Ra Raghavendra, and Professor um, um, Tankur, and delegates uh, from National International Forum, student friends, and faculty members from University KU and University TNAU and University, Kannur University and Calicut University and uh, for everyone, very good morning. I stand before you, it's a proud moment. I would like to tell you about the activities of Indian Society of Plant Physiology, which was headed by now uh, the eminent scientist and professor, able leader, uh, Dr. M. P. Chetty, sir. This Indian Society for the Plant Physiology, ISVP, established in 1958, is one of the oldest academic society in India. It was in origin to vision and zeal eminent plant scientist Professor Bose, Saint Professor Asana, Professor JJ Chennai, and Professor KK Nanda, and the financial support of the government of India. Since this, the society has uh, serving the cause of research and education in the field of plant physiology, allied disciplines, uh, and agriculture. The society is based in National uh, Agriculture Science Center of Indian Council of Agriculture Research, ICR, New Delhi, and about 1,700 uh, life members and more than 2,000 annual members. So these 2,000 annual members one day become a life member, hopefully. So this is the strength of uh, our society. We have, uh, for effective functioning, we have five zones. One is located IRI central zone, uh, central unit, and central zone, and north, east, west, and south. This south zone consists of uh, 200 life members, only 200 life members. And uh, with uh, stalwarts like Professor Gurumurthy and Professor Uday Kumar, Professor A.S. Raghavendra and Professor M.P. Chetty and Professor Chandra Babu and Vijay Raghavan and um, Dr. Um, uh, uh, Professor um, uh, Uday Kumar sir and team, entire team, uh, Prasad, sir, uh, Prasad sir, DG Prasad sir, all the people are strengthening the South Zone. The, um, uh, we are doing uh, con uh, consistently associated with ISVP and promote the activities pertaining to plant physiology related areas among our emerging scholars 
and the students of the region. The society has been continuously engaged in the highlighting the advances in the field of plant physiology and related disciplines by way of, uh, by way of organizing the national conference and international conference and re related disciplines by way of uh, all the peoples are gathering together and we are kind of each year we are celebrating the event. So uh, in this uh, contest in the IAP, ISPP South Zone 2019, we have conducted uh, uh, one um, national conference uh, which is a very successful conference uh, consists of 350 members uh, across the nation and it is very uh, successful which was uh, headed by Dr. Chandra Babu sir, Vice Chancellor, previous Vice Chancellor of KE University. And uh, subsequently we have organized the IPPVS International Plan Physiology Conference 2021 at ICRSBI and uh, associated with uh, um, Society of Sugarcane Research. ICR SBI. It is a very uh, successful conference we have conducted. It is uh, conducted in hybrid mode. People have uh, supported uh, enormously for the successful conducting. We have given a recommendation also. So uh, in this, uh, this is the third conference. Now we are conducting here. We are happy to. We are happy to accept and uh, thanks for the Vice Chancellor giving the opportunity to being here and conducting the wonderful event on the Govindji, commemorating the Govindji, one death and one de birth. This two is celebrating here. The death is uh, Dr. Surahi and birth is uh, Dr. Um, uh, Govindji. These uh, two stalwarts we are remembering now at this point of time and we are here to celebrate those people birth and death. So this, uh, with, uh, we are in this order, now, this title of the conference goes like this, Physiological and Molecular Mechanism of Abiotic Stresses, Tolerance in Plants, and followed by workshop on Physiological and Molecular Markers for Abiotic Stress Tolerance. And it is a continuous marathon uh, event. Hopefully everybody will enjoy this event and you uh, contribute to this, get benefit of all this uh, event also. And finally, I would like to um, tell that, request one thing. And South Zone, we have only 200 members. Only 200 members. Yes, uh, yes, yes, South Zone Secretary, it is my duty to request to you and please you be a member. Is the online uh, website is there, ISPP online, arc.in, www.ispponline.arc.in. Kindly all the requ requested all the faculty people, KU, Kerala Agriculture University and Calicut University, Kannur University, and all the Kerala people, I request to students, request to you to get in to register a membership form. Only 200 annual member. Then subsequently you can register as a life member. We are spending money for many things unwantedly. So we are academician. Our goal to be a member in the one um, important oldest and largest society. Be proud. Whatever I am here because of the society, I proudly say that. Whatever I am here, I am known to everybody because of the society. We have to get attached with the blankingness to, should be there as a physiologist. This is my motivational speech to you, all of you. Please all the academic uh, from the botany or plant breeding or uh, whatever the faculty, uh, microbiology, get involved actively. We are here to help you. Many awards are there, many recognition will be uh, given. It's zonal, uh, I, I request, uh, sir, um, uh, we are honored to be here because MP Chetty is uh, representing South Zone. He is a president. What a kind, nice opportunity we have, no? So this is a rare, rare combination. South Zone, uh, being a member of South Zone, and he is a president of ent entire, uh, this uh, all over India. So we can uh, freely approach, sir, and we can uh, get benefit of that. And we have to have some other awards for the zonal activity also. So I, I'll take an opportunity, be a member for the member of the ISPP and get benefit of all this uh, academic uh, deliberation, all the things. And with this, I'll wind up my uh, talk. I congratulate the organizer for giving me the opportunity and uh, jointly conducting this conference. Uh, Dr. When Dr. Putur is uh, approached to me, I readily, uh, happily accepted. This is how, uh, what for that, for that only I am holding the position. We have to conduct each year some program and uh, we are gathering, nice to meet you all, many new faces, many old faces, and we can interact uh, all the things and we can share the knowledge. This is a very good opportunity. M kindly make use of this opportunity in better way to improve your academic career and uh, to, it, it, motivation. When see the Raghavindran sir, at uh, this age and he is coming and uh, uh, so, uh, Dr. Uh, Om Pragas sir, he is coming from the UC. So many delegates from international, uh, why not we? 
Now, international people are recognizing our society. Why not we? So this is the, my motivation, um, strengthening our membership in South Zone. I, with this, I'll wind up my talk. Jai Hind. Thank you, ma'am. Moving on, I wholeheartedly invite distinguished professor Sergei Shabala, School of Agricultural Sciences, University of Tasmania, Australia, to extend the felicitation. Sir, please. Distinguished guests, uh, ladies, gentlemen, colleagues, friends, I think I have one hour of talk before you, uh, just after the break, so I'll be very, very brief in my speech now. Just two comments to make. First, Jos, uh, thank you. It's fantastic effort. And I really appreciate it. After three years of COVID, we are all sick of the Zoom meetings. And you can get the science from there, but you don't get networking. These days, you can only make breakthrough in science through collaborations. And Zoom meetings are a poor substitute for that. You really need to see people's eyes. You need to do face-to-face -face contacts and networking. And in fact, the DNA code was broken in a pub in during the lunch time in UK in one of the pubs, just sitting and chatting and discussing ideas. You cannot do it online. So we need these meetings and that's a fantastic opportunity. The second comment I want to make is about the topic. Uh, I believe it's really great that physiology is firmly on agenda. Uh, again, I don't want to repeat some of the content of my talk, but we lost abiotic stress tolerance during domestication. For the last 50, 60 years, the breeding was driven by the yield and quality traits. We are after the crops which uniform, we are after crops which really have a good shelf life and more productivity under normal conditions. The climate change make it all different. It's all not applicable anymore. The plants which are performing perfectly well and respond to fertilization under control conditions are very poor under stress, whatever stress it is. We have all the omics available to our disposal. We can do a lot of different things with molecular breeding and tools. We don't know what to target. And that comes to physiology. We are losing uh, the young generation of physiologists. Everyone is capable to do the transformation and molecular analysis, but very few understand how plants work. So I'm really looking at the, the audience here. You are next generation coming after us. Uh, keep that in mind. Uh, physiology is resurfing back, and I think it has a very bright future for the next 15, 20 years. People start to realize that it's really very critical for that. Okay, I think that's all I wanted, and I'll talk more about specific science in after the break. Thank you. Thank you, sir. The next dignitary to honor us with this presence is Professor P. Parthasarthi, co-convener. He is a renowned international physiologist who also spearheaded the physiology division of University of Delhi. Presently, he is an emeritus professor, Department of Environmental Science, Andhra University, Vishakhapatnam. I invite him to grace the occasion with his kind words. Sir, please. Thank you, Ria. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be here, to interact with great taxonomists and physiologists. Uh, and of course, uh, I have been learning a lot from the scholars here and also from the teachers. Uh, now, uh, when you look into things, I certainly agree with uh, what previous speaker has talked. Because we need to protect physiology. How are we going to protect it? Now, one of the things which Jose has uh, stressed is try to learn this particular thing in the field. Can we learn in the field? Because when I visited this university, I learned a lot in the field. I'll give one very simple example. Courtesy Professor Pradeep, I, he has become my mentor, and I have been trying to learn along with Aswati certain aspects of uh, physiological taxonomy, we were trying to learn something about vivipari. People have not observed, okay, we do see that particular thing. But when I visited that particular thing, I have seen vivipari in Jinji Berevsi. For the first time in life, I have seen vivipari, which I'm, I could see the things. I was just asking uh, Professor Pradeep, what is it? Is it really vivipari? And we found that it is literally vivipari. Now, as physiologists, as a taxonomist, he said, these are the things which are features which, are, which you are finding. You know, during this particular thing, for example, Professor Chetty has been talking about a plant which is able to withstand volcanic eruptions. He's talking about the 
plant which is able to withstand extremely high temperatures. Similarly, when we were talking to the, when we were listening to the Honorable Vice Chancellor, he was talking about instances of how exactly the things got evolved. During evolution, how climate change has made life to change. Because everything is in nature. Nature has created everything. Now, our objective is to just see how to understand this particular thing right from basics. There's nothing big in science. There's not, nothing big in physiology. And of course, I, I'm always afraid of taxonomy. But after coming to this particular place, I started enjoying some aspects of taxonomy. Courtesy Prasad Pradeep, of course, uh, he's a great mentor as far as I'm concerned. I feel that, yes, I'm learning a lot from him. And uh, so therefore, when we basically wanted to organize this, our objective was to make sure that youngsters will develop interest. Our objective is, we don't want a subject to die. We are here now, tomorrow we will not be there. But our future generations would be there. It is our job to ensure that subject survives. That's the most important thing. That's the place what uh, uh, we are all looking forward for. Again, as uh, rightly said, molecular biology is not everything. Getting, isolating genes and putting in something is not really great science. It's now become a technician's job. Today, when you talk about biotechnology, what is biotechnology? It's a technician's job. Fine. Similarly, today when you are talking about making genes or synthetic genes, who is doing that? I give it to a company. A company makes, uh, synthesizes that for me. I don't, know, don't need to waste time of my student to hook nucleotides together to get a synthetic gene. I mean, today in India also the things have become so simple, within a lakh, I will be able to synthesize one synthetic gene. I can insert it in a plant and try to express this. There is nothing big in that. But what is important is, can we try to find out from these taxonomists what are those specific features you are having? There's a lot of things which has been said about morphological features. When Persisteti has been, of course, he has been a great mentor uh, for me also. I visited his thing, we have collaborated with him for a very long time. And in the field, we are able to see several things, several important features. When he is stressing on, try to focus on this uh, uh, features which are unique if something is doubt tolerant why is it doubt tolerant now can we try to find out within the biodiversity that my interest would be rather than going for transgenics my interest would rather to look for the phenotypes of let's take a very simple example of rice 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 is something which is having extremely high degree of plasticity high degree of genetic plasticity you look for the thing if you want to look for, if you want to have uh, some uh, genotypes which are able to withstand extremely high flooding, you will be able to get them. If you want to uh, identify genotypes which are able to withstand high drought, you will be able to find them. We do have genotypes of rice which are able to withstand alkaline conditions. We have towards other extremes, those which are able to withstand acidic conditions. Why don't you tap them? And here we are having the taxonomists who are able to find out some of those important features. We may not be able to identify. We have to take the help of those taxonomists. And I think somehow the physiology and taxonomy has not come together in that particular way. I think this is the university where I think we can do wonders uh, with the taxonomists around us to identify those morphological features. I think that would be a great opportunity. I request all of you to, when you are going to the field, try to observe something unique. We are all here to learn from each of you. Our prime ministers, as well as even chief ministers, always say that e each and every individual has some unique feature. They will be able to provide some in unique clue that we should try to tap. Can I tap that knowledge which someone is having? So everyone has unique features, so let's try to understand those particular things. So now another important thing, as of course, uh, one of the things which we discussed about the workshop was <coughs> related with kids. We all have the habit of molecular biologists. Of course, I have also been a molecular biologist. It's not that I did a lot of molecular biology. Once upon a time, I used to be called as a molecular biologist, but I always hated someone calling me molecular biologist. I always wanted to be physiologist, a botanist. That's good enough. 
All these rest of the things are just tools, nothing more than that. So therefore, when I'm basically trying, when, when, uh, when we are trying, planning to organize this workshop, we were having the discussion regarding kids. That's what Professor Dinakar and uh, Professor Umesh, when we were discussing with them, we, we basically thought that we should try to let these people to know basics about the kids. There are many molecular biology labs which are there where people use kids. The scholar will come and say, sir, this kid didn't work. That's why I'm not able to get the result. But first and foremost thing, we should know what is there in the kit. If you know what is there in the kit, kits are nothing big. They're just buffers. There's nothing very uh, big in that. When you're talking about restriction enzymes, when they say they're giving so many units, how are you storing them? What is the way they need to be stored? No, how, they are the things which have been taught by, for example, Professor Sirohi is to always emphasize on some of those important things. He is one of the masters of uh, water potential and of course, Professor Chetty, we have done a lot of work uh, in his lab in Darbad on some of those water potentials using psychrometer, using osmometers. So there is something which is there. So, but only thing is we need to go to those grassroots levels. Let's not hate preparing buffers. Let's not hate measuring pH. Let's not blindly use kits. So that's what we wanted to emphasize on, uh, uh, in this workshop. When we discussed with uh, Professor uh, Dinakaran and Professor Umesh, as well as uh, uh, Professor Vanaja, uh, we were of the impression that, yes, we must teach these basics to them. So therefore, those people who are attending the workshop, I ask, I request you people, don't attend the workshop just for getting certificate. Please attend the workshop with true interest to learn. And we are here to teach you. That's the precise reason I'll be here throughout. <laughs> so anything which is required, you're most welcome to come. Don't think that something is big or something is uh, small. There's nothing big, nothing uh, small. Like preparation of buffer is something which everyone wa wants to know. But I still have some doubts about preparation of buffers. I do seek the advice of some of my students itself. My students have been my mentors. So many times I do. Like many times I talk to Umesh. She's sitting at Texas and A&M. And I say, Umesh, I'm having this problem. How to, how to solve that? Then he says, sir, you do this, this, this particular things. Let's try to see. We discuss. Go phone and then we try to resolve that particular thing. So it's always better to seek the advice of our youngsters also. The reason why I'm here is I want to learn a lot from the youngsters. Fine? So I don't want to take any further time. <laughs> I, I wish all of you uh, a very nice day uh, here. And uh, I hope you are going to enjoy this uh, conference as well as workshop. Good luck for your conference. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Now, I would like to call upon the organizing secretary, Professor Santosh Nampi, former head, Department of Botany, University of Calicut, secretary, Indian Association for Angiosperm Taxonomy, and executive editor of the International Journal, Redia, to propose the vote of thanks. Sir, please. Respected President, Professor Shetty, Respected Professor Shabala, Professor Parth Saradi, Professor Josti Puttur, Respected Professor Gomadi, Distinguished Scientists, Delegates, Students and Friends. Good morning to all. It is in fact our pleasure to host this three-day conference and the workshop at this Calicut University. We, have, we are fortunate to have a galaxy of eminent scientists across, the, across India as well as from outside also, like Professor Dagavendra, Professor Dankar, Dr. Dinagar, my mentor Madhusar is also here, and on the dais also we have such a galaxy of scientists. And I think our students will be benefited because of their presence, because of their interaction, etc. We are running short of time. And we know this conference is being organized with the support from different agencies. From the university also, we got enormous support from the administration as well as from the vice chancellor. 
and Science Engineering Research Board, INSA and ISPP all supported our this conference come, uh, conference come workshop. At the outset, I must thank our Vice Chancellor for being uh, with us and he is, uh, as Joseph said, he is an ad ad academician and from whom we have learned a lot of things. And at the outset, I thank our Honorable Vice Chancellor for being with us, for kindly inaugurated the conference and also for his excellent words. We also thank the ISPP only because of their support and only because Professor Shetty as well as Professor Gomadi's keen interest in organizing this conference at Calicut, it has been possible. I thank both of them for being here and also for their words. Thank you, sirs. And Parth Sadisar was here almost one year back, I think so. He has been to in the department, also visited the botanical garden, and he is the mentor of our colleague Josar, and he is one of the leading physiologists in our country, and he has given a very valuable words to the youngsters who are attending this conference. Thank you, sir, for your nice words. Thank you, Professor Shabala, for being with us and also sharing some words in the dice. We know Dr. Jos is heading the department at present. He is not heading the department. He has a lot of responsibilities as the director of, sorry, director of uh, the science instrumentation facility. Earlier, he was the director of admission. Director of admission. And along with that, he is the best administrator. That's why he has, he has been able to look after many things at the Calicut University. He has been the coordinator of the NAC team, and sorry, NAC commit, you know, NAC program here. And under his stewardship, uh, the university also were able to score higher rank in the NAC accreditation process. Uh, thank you, Professor Jos, for being heading the department and also for nicely organizing this conference. And we have all our colleagues here. Our senior professor, jo jo sir is, John Sir, is sitting here. Dr. Radhakrishnan was here. And almost all faculties are sitting here. And all our students, research scholars are here. So only because of their effort, this conference is being organized in this excellent manner. Please give a big hand to the team botany. Uh, we have the media persons are here as well as the press. Uh, they are, are all here. So we thank the press and media for they have a given a wonderful coverage yesterday also. We are expecting more in the coming days also. So thank you for the press and thank you for press and media. And we have the office staff of the department are sitting here. So only because of their continuous uh, effort, we were able to we are we are able to organize this conference in this manner. So thank all the office team of our department. And I thank all the invited speakers and all the delegates. I think we have around 50 oral presentations as well as 50 poster presentations here. So only because of their active participation, this seminar would be come to a close in a better manner. So thank all the delegates, all the senior professors, all the invited speakers. Thank you for coming over here. And, and I welcome you all once again. And I, I request if there is any shortcomings, please excuse us. And we expect that we will be having an enriching session ahead. Thank you. Thank you once again. Thank you, sir. Now the inaugural ceremony has come to an end. Now let us break for the tea that has been served outside the conference hall. All are requested to be back by around 15 minutes.
we have to start for the next first technical session. There is an announcement. Participants for oral and poster presentations kindly report at the program help desk. Participants for the oral and poster presentations kindly report at the program help desk. Thank you.
Hello. Hello, this is announcement. We are sh uh, shortly going to initiate the session, technical sessions. I request all the delegates come and sit inside the auditorium. Going to start this uh, session one.
it is thought so uh, we have with two eminent uh, uh, professors with us to give uh, deliver a uh, lead lectures first uh, first lecture will be professor sergey sapala and who is working now from school of agriculture science university of tasmania australia and next lead lecture will be the professor om prakash tankur the university of uh, messet amherst usa so we are like uh, first i introduce about uh, professor sergey sapala and from australia so i will uh, briefly read uh, his biodata now sagay sawala is currently working as the head of the stress physiology laboratory at the university of tasmania he was awarded phd in plant physiology from the institute of experimental botany belarus in 1989 sawala focuses on biochemistry salinity biophysics ion transporter and botany he is very basic uh, scientist fundamental uh, founder he is trust area of the research includes plant stress salinity and biophysics ion transporter and botany his trust area of uh, um, plant stress physiology membrane transport with a major focus on the role of specific ion transporters in adaptive response to abiotic stress such as salinity water logging osmotic stress chilling acidity and elicitors and oxidative stress almost he covered all the abiotic stress uh, physiology mechanism he has demonstrated excellent leadership qualities in the research and scholars um, he has guided uh, most um, 48 phd students and uh, he is highly cited research and is currently ranked as the most cited research in the world in the field of botany in 2019 he has received the tasmania premier stem award in 2018 he, ha he had collaborated with 157 institutes in 39 countries and had obtained from uh, um, 18 dollar millions competitive research fundings he is a former president of australian institute of plant health scientist and uh, current editor in chief for functional plant biology with this uh, brief introduction i would like to invite uh, dr sawala to deliver a lecture on lead lecture on this um, title thank you very much sir i'll give a word to mike to sawala you yeah. time is one hour yeah thank you i'll i think i'll be quick yes. right so my topic today is uh, cell based phenotyping for I should stay away from that. My topic today is cell-based phenotyping for abiotic stress tolerance. And uh, I hope that by the end of my talk, I will convince you that we need some paradigm shift in our concept, how we do the phenotyping and how we approach breeding for stress tolerance. So I'll start my talk with just a slide showing the demographic uh, outlook for future and again i prepared this slide at about a few years ago and by that time we expected that by 2050 we expected 9.6 billion people on the planet now the number is changed and we're talking about 9.9 billion people so we have fast growing population and all these people need to be fed the problem is that the current trends in breeding in the last 50 years are not sufficient enough to make this happening. So if you look at very nice paper published by my good friends Mark Tester and Peter Langridge 10 years ago in Science, the blue line here is the production of cereal crops which are overall give more than 50% of the calories to world population. So if we start from 1960s and go, it's a linear increase, so we improve agronomy, we improve breeding, we improve other management practices and we get more and more yield. However, populations grow faster and if we continue as we did for the last 50 years, we will end up here at this point. And we need to be here to feed all the people. So business as usual, doing things like we did with the same speed is not good enough to make sure that we will be able to feed all the population. Another confounding factor is urbanization. We are losing the agricultural land. If you look at this graph here, the proportion of the rural area is shrinking. So compared with 70% we had in 60s, we have now only 30% left. So cities like that become more and more common and we have less and less available land for agricultural production. And in an, on the top of that, we have these avoidic stresses. I published a sort of 
physiological slash economical review in JEGS board a year ago, and we estimated that the cost of abiotic stresses was over 180 billion US dollars per year, and that was only four stresses which we analyzed all together. We are talking about really huge problems with flooding, drought, salinity. Uh, talking salinity as an example, and that's my sort of favorite baby, we lose three hectares every minute. Just think, I'll be talking for one hour. We will lose by that time more than 150 hectares of land taken out of production due to this second induced soil salinization. This is an enormous number, but we need to, to deal with that. We can argue who is responsible for climate change, whether it's anthropogenic or natural, but we need to deal with consequences. We need really to make sure that our food production systems are not suffering and are sustainable. So again, a lot of talks uh, today were about the potential uh, challenge to us, our production. Uh, if you look at the, this graph here, depending on the model, you accept whether it will be three degrees centigrade increase by the end of century or only 0.8 we have increase in a proportion of dry areas. So half of the all land will be simply not productive without the irrigation. So we need really to deal with this and we need really to think about how we manage our production systems. And the slide here at the bottom summarizes all sort of events. Uh, sorry for my German language here, but this is just, you can see the increase in a amount of the extreme weather events. Floodings, droughts, um, storms, hurricanes, other things. So that was uh, economical part of that. Now, we, we talk also about the environmental aspect and sustainability of production systems. So modern agriculture relies very heavily on fertilizers. And the Green Revolution really changed things a lot. We selected crops which are responsive to fertilizers. And we increased production several fold. For example, we increased production in the wheat by 2.7 fold by really increase in uh, application of nitrogen fertilizers by 7 or 8 fold. The problem is now that the varieties we selected for the being as being responsive to fertilizers, where they are selected under the optimal conditions. Right now, you can add fertilizer to a soil, but if plants are under stress, let's say drought stress, stomata will be closed, will be no transpiration, water movement will be no just bulk flow in the soil, so, so fertilizer stays in the soil. Next rainfall, and it's all leached, and go into waterways. So we have the eutrophication, we have a lot of the problems, environmental problems, which come with a huge economic penalties and a lot of a damage to environment. So really we need to balance the sustainability and profitability of agricultural systems, and we need it by really looking at the physiological basis of plant responses to these treatments. So, these few slides which I've spoken about can be summarized that we are now at the brink of the need for Green Revolution 2.0. So, rather than targeting yield on the optimal conditions, that's what we did from 60s, we need to move towards the targeting the abiotic stress tolerance, and that's the key topic of this conference. And we make sure that we apply the minimum treatment fertilizers, chemicals, everything, and we maximize the production on the stress conditions. That basically require starting from scratches, almost from scratches. And there are two, two possible things here. First, we can really think about the rewilding of a crop, wild species, relatives. Second time, this time for the abiotic stress tolerance, or using them in a already like doing domestication or of semi-domesticated species. So I'll be talking about the two possible approaches here, focusing mostly on the first one. As I said in my very quick one minute uh, talk during the um, uh, plenary ceremony, we have no problem with the molecular and genetic tools how to transform plants. The problem is that we do not need which one to select and which trait to target. And here we come to a problem of phenotyping as a limiting issue. It's a bottleneck in the breeding programs right now. So if you look at the, any published paper or if you look at the websites and you look at the internet, you'll see that this is what is advocated. So we are after, the breeders say, we need to, to screen 10,000 samples per day and that means, therefore it means we need really high throughput systems. 
What does it mean? It means we select not what is really scientifically justifiable, but what is more convenient for us, more suitable for screening purposes. And of course, the whole plant phenotyping is easier. We have these different systems called by different names. In Adelaide, we have plant accelerator. We have all these Lemna Tech, other companies, conveyor belts, which cost millions and millions. And we just have basically, we are doing what we were doing for 50 years, which is looking plant which is a taller or greener. We replace our eyes with sophisticated computers and things, and indeed it can be very efficient and productive in terms of the number of samples per day. But the problem is the plant which is greener is not necessarily the most tolerant. I will give you an example of salinity. If plant is treated with salt stress, the cells are smaller, the chlorophyll is more condensed, and the plants are greener. So the, the increase in the chlorophyll content is not necessarily a symptom or not necessarily the, the proxy for stress tolerance. It's quite opposite. So whole plant phenotyping is fundamentally flawed when you want to look at the physiological basis of plant responses. So when for yield, yield will be proportional to plant size and plant size is proportional to the leaf area or plant height. There's no doubts about this. When you talk about stress, whole plant phenotyping is really misleading. Jose Dineni, about 15 years ago, produced fantastic, it was one of the first papers, it was a science paper, when he did cross-sectioning of the root and longitudinal cross-sectioning, and he showed the tissue or cell-specific expression of different genes in just one part of the root, small part. So there are hundreds and thousands of different genes which really expressed and operate in a cell-specific manner. When you do the whole plant phenotyping, you are losing this resolution. You simply don't have possibility to see how they integrate. Again, to support my criticism by some real information, I will move to saline distress. And for years and decades, and many decades, plant were screened for salt tolerance by the sodium content in the shoot. So logic was that salt is toxic, it should be excluded, and the variety which is excluded should be more tolerant. So people did hundreds of papers, dozens at least, with QTLs, and by measuring sodium content, and they look, they discard, for example, in rice, the QTLs on four different chromosomes which are reported for the um, differences in the sodium content. If I show that to a breeder and say, okay, can you use it to improve the variety? Is it feasible? No. Too many QTLs? It really means that really you'll be not able to implement it in a practical purposes. More targeted approach was to look at the specific role of specific gene, but again at whole plant level. So again, my colleagues from University of Adelaide, Tim Ranamart, Mans, Matt Gillingham, and again, I published with them a lot together. They published a nice Nature Biotech paper about 10 years ago. Then they look at the gene HKT15, which is responsible for retrieval of sodium from the xylem. They found it in ancient uh, wild relative of wheat, incorporated it by molecular means uh, for QTL breeding into the um, highly productive varieties, and they reported in this Nature paper improvement by 25% when you overexpress this gene in a plant. So that was great, it was Nature paper, no one takes a credit off. The problem was that this beneficial effect was observed only on one field out of three tested sites in the field. So obviously, two out of three, it did not work. And more importantly, even if you look at these results here, the improvement was 25%, but the yield compared with control was still 50% less then. So it's really barely the tolerance. So what we're talking, we're talking about some statistically significant difference, but for farmers, that's not good enough. You still lose half of the wheat production. And explanation is very simple. Very simple. Looking at just the sodium content in this context does not give you any clue about how it operates. So we published a paper in Plant Fees a few years ago when we look at the metabolic profiles of root in two different zones, just one millimeter from each other. Elongation zone and root in a root apex and mature zone next to it, well, five millimeters apart. We found that 90% of the metabolites are changed in apex and they are more or less stable in mature zone. So if you analyze the whole bulk of the root, you lose the sensitivity. And again, uh, I'll skip the details, but there's a good reason for that. So where we are now and where we're supposed to move from here and what I'm suggesting today. 
I believe we should really forget about convenience of screening and going through a field and pick up plants which is taller in a field. It will be the last step for validation, but for breeding, we need to move down and look at the, what genes are doing in their natural environment. That means in a cell and tissue specific context. How do you do it? Obviously, you need to go down to cellular level, and this means in um, omics tools, it means single cell RNA sec, single cell omics, which is clearly available. Like just recently, we published a paper about the gut cell transcriptome, and we did it for proteomics and metabolomics of gut cells. So we can do it really for essentially use laser microsection, you get the tissue, and you can get omics. But we need to look at the operation of this gene, and that means some non destructive approach and tools. And here comes electrophysiology or fluorescent imaging in place. So my lab is probably most known for the running the MIFE system, so we can really have the microelectrodes filled with ion selective cocktails, which has a resolution of few microns and time resolution of a few seconds. You can count number of ions crossing membranes, so if your plant performance is affected by difference in membrane transport under stress conditions, you can quantify it and find the operation of different genes. You can also look at the internal distribution of ions between different compartments, such as cytosol, vacuole, chloroplast, by using the fluorescent dyes, if you are looking at, the, at ionic relations. So we can have these uh, cell-based tools to look at the operation of different genes. And I will illustrate this in the next uh, five, ten minutes by different examples. So again, I'm taking salinity as an example uh, for several reasons, but one of them, it's $27 billion per year at the cost of agriculture. Salinity is in India on the subcontinent is a very big issue. Maybe not in this province, but definitely it is, it is a huge issue. And it's getting worse and worse. So the first question we asked was, is really cell-specific responses important for salt tolerance, or it's still, I mean, the salt is more or less uniform. It's a bulk concentration in the soil. So what we did, we designed what we called multi-compartment chamber, and we were able to apply salt to either this small part here or this part, metuzone or apex, and they have the same size, and therefore the root exposed to salt had the same surface area. So when we did it, and we applied the salt to this compartment to metuzone, we see no really response of plants. So they continue to grow. When you apply the salt to root apex, the growth was stopped immediately, and this is to the metuzone. So obviously sensitivity of root apex and metuzone are strikingly different between these plants. Interestingly, sodium content was not affected, but plants which were exposed to salt in the apex lost more potassium. So obviously the difference come not from difference in accumulation of sodium, but difference in ability to retain potassium in a just one specific narrow area, elongation zone of the root or root apex. Oops, too much. So we follow this story and we applied, we use this MIFE technique for ion flux, non-invasive ion flux measurements. So we applied the salt stress and we measure amount of potassium which is loosed from the epidermis of the root. You can see in mature zone, the red line there was really almost no loss. When you apply the salt to the root apex, you can see that it goes to thousands of nanomoles per square per second. And that was related to the ability of plant in a mature zone to maintain better membrane potential. I'll skip the aspects of biophysics here, but the relation between the voltage on the membrane and the current or flux of iron is strongly nonlinear. So there are so-called outward rectifying potassium channels, which are uh, belong to the, the class of the shaky channels, specifically GORG, and they are described by these parameters. So when you start more negative and you shift membrane by depolarization up to here, the flux will be low. When you start less negative and shift is the same, you have a huge efflux of potassium. So what does it mean? It means really basically that if a plant has considerably higher HATPase activity, it's just one protein which operates and maintain membrane potential. So these plants will be more tolerant because they'll be able to keep more potassium. And this is exactly what halophytes are doing. If you compare the halophytic relative with the, the domesticated crop, you'll see 10, 15, 20 millivolt difference more negative in halophytes. 
And that's how they maintain their ability to grow fantastically under these saline conditions. Again, this is evidence about the ATPs activity and activation. So, keeping that in mind and the importance of potassium, or apparent importance of potassium, we did some pretty massive screening of about 70, I think, barley varieties. It took two years in a glass house and field for my student, and it took about one month in a glass house. So what he found, he found that if you screen them, and the screening is very simple, you take just a two or three day old seedlings, tiny, tiny one, growing in a petri dish, and you apply salt and you measure, using our techniques, the amount of potassium lost by microelectrodes. So if you work with tolerant varieties, this is a phenotyping, after one month in glass house. This variety is sensitive, so you see it's dying, well, nearly dead, after one month of salt treatment. This is control, and this variety is a tolerant one. So that's what happened after a month of treatment. If you only look at the first half an hour, the blue line there is the variety which is tolerant. You can see there's very little potassium loss. These red and pink ones are sensitive varieties. So we can separate and tell which variety is sensitive and tolerant by screening at two-day-old seedlings, and we can predict what happened in a field or in a glass house after months of treatment. So this is a way how we can phenotype it. We use a potassium efflux as a proxy for salt tolerance, and we did some genetic analysis. It's perfectly inheritable, and it's correlation point R square point six between their ability to retain and crop yield. So 60% of genetic variability in barley is confirmed by its ability of root to retain potassium in mature zone. Why it's important? Again, I'll skip the details, but on the saline conditions, root cells commit suicide, program cell death. So under normal conditions, when potassium level in cytosol are high, the enzymes responsible for PCD are suppressed. These are the endonucleases and uh, so caspate-like proteases and endonucleases. When potassium is lost, these enzymes become active and the cell undergoes PCD. So ability to retain potassium is critical to prevent that. Under some conditions like water logging stress, loss of potassium and PCD is important because these cells become voids and the root form enchyma. Under saline conditions, enchyma is not needed, so the loss of this one, especially in the elongation zone, means the death of the entire plant. So again, I skipped the details, it's all published, and uh, we did some overexpression of the anti-apoptotic genes and we got the salt tolerant phenotypes. But again, we come to this idea just using these screening techniques at the cellular level. Putting ROSs into a picture, uh, we know that under every stress, abiotic or biotic stress, there is a shift in the redox balance and there is increase in amount of reactive oxygen species in the plant tissues. So what we showed here, again, you can screen it by viability staining, like in this one. So you can see that there was enormous difference in apex and amateur zone. So these are control plants. You can see that the, the intensity of green color is proportional to amount of the pyrogen peroxide in the root. So under salt stress conditions, in a mature zone, the amount of rest is really reducing. It's going down. In the apex, it goes over the roof, like 20-fold high intensity. So they have very big sensitivity. And they can be, these are the patch clamp results, they can be activated by concentrations as low as 0.1 millimolar. So sensitivity to RS and differential sensitivity between different functional different root zones and tissues has enormous impact on iron homeostasis. And you cannot screen it by the whole plant phenotyping. You really need to go for specific response on specific tissues. Again, I'll skip uh, all the details, but these are non-selective cation channels. So as I said, another technique we can use for cell-based phenotyping is using the fluorescent dyes and particularly confocal laser scanning microscopy. So by going through the cross-section of the leaf after loading the dye, we can see the peaks and troughs in iron concentration, well, in intensity of fluorescent dye. And again, in vacuole, so most of the sodium sits here and low, very low sodium amount in the cytosol. So this particular species is good with the internal sequestration of sodium in a vacuole. You will not get this results if you just analyze the tissue sodium content because it will average everything. So this was really actually interesting and very unexpected topic because we all know that the SOS1 transporter, which is essentially the pump 
well, it's not pumped because it's a secondary active transporter, so it really gets all the sodium out of the root tissue under certain conditions. So if plant take salt, 95% of sodium which is taken are immediately pushed back into the rhizosphere by this source one transporter. And there's a lot of attempts to pump or to improve crop tolerance to salt stress by overexpressing source one. Hundreds of attempts, dozens of published papers. Still, we don't have the tolerant varieties in the field. Why? Because it's not that simple. So first thing which we were really surprised is that we, we seen that the highest level of the fluorescent signal was in the elongation zone of the plant, not in mature zone. And source one is really expressed in root apex and not in mature zone. So that was really unexpected. We expect its lowest concentration and we have highest one. And also was very interesting to compare tolerant and sensitive varieties. So we did about 50, I think, uh, body genotypes here. So we look at the tolerant and sensitive, which are just three examples in each group. And when you look at mature zone, in a cytosol, you don't have any surprises. Tolerant varieties maintain low level, sensitive varieties have higher concentration, therefore it's sodium toxicity. And in a vacuole, oh sorry, and this is what happened then, when you average them. However, when you look at the vacuole, it's opposite, good sequestration, intolerant, poor, insensitive. This part, this part of the picture make perfect sense and consistent. When you look at the root Mary stem, we found the very opposite. The tolerant varieties had about four times more sodium in the cytosol than sensitive one. It's completely unexpected. Essentially, if you select variety which has the lowest concentration of salt in a cytosol in the um, apex, in the Mary stem, you will really after selecting the salt sensitive variety. We could not understand that, but as I said, we have sample size of 50 genotypes and probably 20 plants each. So the story was very clear. Tolerant varieties accumulate more salt in the cytosol in apex. Later on, I suggested to my student, okay, let's try to do something about phenotyping. We have no mutants, of course, so what we can do? We went through a pretty barbaric uh, way to do it. We used a scalpel blade and we removed the Mary stem by just cutting it here. And you can only imagine, barley root has, it's not a single root, it's several seminal roots, so my student had really to cut these roots in every plant and keep doing it for all newly emerging red lateral roots as well. But when we did it and we look at the phenotype, you can see that these are intact plants and this was a plant which we, the meristem was removed. So you see chlorophyll content is less, you have difference in the uh, sped readings, you have many other things. And, there. and later on we look at the, what happened in the, in the leaves and what we discovered really that removing the root apical meristem prevent the salt stress being signaled to a shoot and really uh, interferes with sequestration of sodium sequestration, oh sorry, with sodium sequestration in vacuoles. So essentially, to summarize again, this was published in a couple of papers, I think that was Plant Journal uh, and GX Board, but the, what I'm saying is root mary stem harbor salt sensor. So when the plants are on the saline conditions, they Temporary increase in the salt level in the cytosol in the meristem send a signal to a shoot, and this signal express the genes responsible for vacuole sequestration and eject transporters in the shoot, which we showed by just looking at the change in gene expression here. When you cut the meristem out and prevent plant the ability to signal salt stress, this overexpression of NH excess does not occur and plants are compromised for the sequestration of salt in vacuoles in a shoot. So, disturbance of the root to shoot signaling has enormous consequences for phenotype. And once again, when you analyze the sodium content in root, you will never be able to answer that if you do the bulk of the root. You really need to look at specific tissue, specific zone. So again, this is an interesting question, what is sodium sensories? We still don't have any. There are some Oscar, a few other suggestions, but there's nothing really proven specifically. So that's highly interesting potential topic for improvement, which no one actually even tried to address in their studies. Talking about this vacuole sequestration, so this is our key player, NHX. 
Eduardo Bumwald, in late 90s, early 2000s, published a series of papers, again, all nature papers, and he was on the news uh, in every medium about overexpressing the checks, and he got its inorbidopsis, brassica, tomatoes, many other things. So you can really have plants treated with salt water, essentially, with saline water, and they're growing all right. It works sometimes, it doesn't work sometimes. But what I want to say is that we're able to use fluorescent imaging to separate the tolerant and sensitive varieties. So this is a Karchia, one of the standards for salt tolerance. This is cytosolic signal, low, and vacuolar signal is high. Vacuole, vacuole, cytosol, cytosol. This is a barred variety, which is sensitive. You see, it's opposite. Cytosol, 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 vacuole, vacuole, vacuole. So we can really screen them relatively easy and straightforward. The, the technical thing is with loading of the dye. Once you standardize it, the rest is computerized. Three, four minutes of screening and you've got the, the sample analyzed. So we can do it in theory. Okay, what about this source one? If you believe it's important, we have a very nice tool when we can use it to screen and see the difference in uh, plant performance. So what we did, we applied this MIFE technique and in this example we used 25 durum weeds. So when we screen of them, all of them, you can see that some of them were able to pump at a huge rate, 1,400, 1, others are much less efficient. So the protocol is very simple. Again, you have the tiny root or root segment. You put it in the salt for 24 hours. You let the source one overexpress and operate, and later you put it in sodium-free medium. So they start to pump sodium they accumulated, and the ones which are pumping more actively can be selected here. So you can see from the, the top graph here, six varieties are not efficient. The average is about 300. These ones are intermediate. These ones are pumping more than 800 up to 1,000. And these are the tolerance. So you can use one of these. One of these. You can do the DH population, and you can really get the QTL for the operation of a source one, one particular protein. So this is really the approach I advocate. We can use these tools to create the genetic material which can be later used for improvement rather than try to look at the whole plant iron content. Again, the same approach applied to the RS screening. My name, Chinese student, we look at the responses of plant roots to peroxide and uh, hydroxyl radicals. And again, she compare barley, which is salt tolerant, bread wheat, which is intermediate tolerant, and durum wheat, which is sensitive. We can see that was a really nice correlation in a responses in calcium and potassium fluxes. And the yeah, R-squared values are highly significant. We moved further and she also used it, these DH lines between the varieties which are capable to respond with differences in terms of the iron fluxes. And we ended up with a couple of pretty sharp QTL peaks for calcium potassium flux position on a few different chromosomes. So again, I'm skipping this for details, but that's really the, the way how we can improve the tolerance doing this cell-based phenotyping. My another student uh, looked at the QTL for the membrane potential ma maintenance. That was in relation to water logging stress. When plants are, flood, plants are flooded, there is much less oxygen available in their media, and therefore the operation of the mitochondria is not as efficient, so they produce only two ATP rather than 36 under normal conditions. So it's 18-fold drop. And therefore, the proton pump, HADPs, is not capable to operate. We found the parental lines, TX, which was able to maintain pretty much negative membrane potential, minus 115, compared with the Nazanijo, which was minus 70. So we did the 140 lines in TH population between these two. And my student was able to find just one QTL, which was responsible for membrane potential maintenance. Surprisingly, it was nothing to do with the, any structural unit of HATPase. So it was related to one of the kinases which control the operation of the pump. Again, that's, that's a more or less clear way how you can approach the breeding programs by. It's a tedious process, I should tell you. So that one in, in implies impalement of electrodes inside the cell. So nine out of 10 cases may be an artifact. You really need to practice that, but as I said, we managed to do it for 140 different varieties in um, probably a few weeks' time. So, that was the first part. Now, back to this revolving concept. 
how we target it. Do we really start from scratch as breeding for tolerance or we try to move with some semi-domesticated species? And here's what I was, my lab was focused in the last 10 years, uh, quinoa plant or chinopodium quinoa. I was a part of the big consortium with China where we published the genome. We lost a few months to competitors from the Saudi Arabia and Adelaide, but we, the publication came in the same year, so we published Nature paper. So why I like it and why I want to attract your attention to quinoa, it represents a nice, absolutely fantastic model system, better than Arabidopsis, better than anything else, but more importantly, it's already a crop. So this is a response of a wheat to soil treatment. This plant is dead or nearly dead after a month of treatment and it's 150 millimolar sodium chloride. And this is control. These are response of quinoa plants to different salinity treatments. You can see that the highest performance, the bushy plant, highest biomass is somewhere between 100 and 200. So the concentration of salt which kills wheat is stimulating for quinoa, which is a facultative halophyte. And when you look at the grain yield here, you end up with, this is improvement in wheat, and we're talking about maximum in Australia, under Australian conditions, it's published for Australia, two uh, tons per hectare. In recent years after the, we started the Green Revolution. When you look at the yield of quinoa, it's the same. The difference is you can irrigate it with seawater. A wheat needs fresh water. That's the difference, right? So that's very promising. But for me, it's really absolutely promising as a model species. Come on. Yeah. Because the halophytes, which are naturally salt tolerant, they deal it by two principal pathways. They sequester salt either in the vacuoles, in the, these parenchyma cells inside the, the leaf with no metabolic activity, or half of the halophytes are putting salt into the external structures called epidermal bladder cells. Kino is one of them. So this is a picture of the kino leaf. You can see these balloons on the surface and this is a microscopy, scanning microscopy image. This is the atiplex. You can see they are able double layered or dense one. So what we did in our breeding for salt stress tolerance, we selected varieties which pump sodium out because that was how the phenotyping was done. And we don't have really much success. Truly tolerant species like halophytes, what they're doing, they are either pumping sodium inside the vacuole more efficiently and they have the succulency of the tissue or they pump it in external structures. And the last one opens almost unlimited opportunity for improving traditional crops because epidermal bladder cells are modified trichomes. So hypothetically, if you understand how a salt is going into bladder cells, you can reproduce it in wheat, barley, rice, maize, because trichomes are on the surface of every leaf. First, I'll start with sequestration inside the vacuole, because vacuoles are in every and single crop species. So what you need, you need to have this NHX. You need to have the, it's fueled. It's not enough just to have it. You need really, it's operating, so you need to maintain the hydrogen gradient. And importantly, in the third component, you need to prevent that this sodium which pumps here, pumped here, is not back leaking back again into cytosol. There's hundreds of papers about any checks. There are a few papers which deal with co-expression of these genes and there's only one or two which really put attention to these leak channels. And that's very wrong. So there are two possible pathways for the sodium leak through non-selective channels in a tonal plasma membrane. And here is an example why I believe that the quinoa is excellent model species, because when you compare old leaves and young leaves here, you'll see that the epidermal bladder cells here are very dense, and here there are only a few of them, and they are all wrapped. So old leaves rely on internal sequestration. The young ones rely on external sequestration. So if you compare properties of channels, we have exactly the same genome, everything the same, except the different strategies. So we did that. And again, to skip details for the sake of the time, there are two possible pathways for sodium back leak into cytosol through fast vacuole channels. Name comes from kinetic, it's very quick response to voltage, or slow channels. It takes a few seconds for the current to stabilize. So we were hoping secretly that the halophytes have something to do with selectivity. 
Uh, our crops were unsubstantiated because we look at them and they are similar to crops. They are not really selective. The permeability for sodium and potassium is about 1 to 1 or 0.8 to 1.2. However, when we looked at the regulation of the channels, we found absolutely different and stunning differences. Again, this is a patch clamp experiment uh, published in a couple of papers. One of them was plant fees because the audience may be not really interested in details or in the sake of the time, I will skip the details, but the takeaway message from here is that if plants is grown under um, saline conditions, halophytes are capable to reduce the permeability or conductivity of these channel plus channels by fivefold, three to tenfold, depends on condition. So essentially what they are doing, they are very effective pumping sodium in vacuole and locking it there. If they don't do it, like crops, Glycophytes, salt leaks back immediately and become toxic inside the soil again. And you need to repeat it. You pump it and it leaks back. You pump it, it leaks back. It's a futile cycle. And this is what halophytes are able to prevent, this futile pumping. Again, I'll skip the, the details about how it's regulated. But I want to turn your attention to one simple, well, it's not simple, one biophysical calculations. We published a new phytologist paper in 2020, I think, with these things. So. Each cell typically has between two and 400 vacuole channels, which are sodium leak channels. If plant has 10% of them open, operated at the same time, you have 100% of all the energy cell can produce by mitochondria wasted for this pumping and leaking. If you have 5% of channels open, you have two thirds of the energy wasted. So if you even have one channel open, you have already 11% energy loss. So what halophytes are doing, they open less than one channel at a time. So they open a channel for a couple of miles, milliseconds and close it. Open and close it. It's a flickering activity. In the crops, they are open more wide and for longer. So if you find a way how they opening regulate it, we cannot knock them out. They're important for transport of calcium, potassium. They're responded to these cytosolic calcium spikes in response to stress. We cannot knock out these channels, but we need to find out how to regulate them. So that was pretty major part of our research. We look at the different chemicals. Again, I will skip. There are many second messages which control them. But what was absolutely amazing was a choline, which is considered to be an amino acid. And everyone read in textbooks or in numerous papers that choline is used for osmotic adjustment. Well, one in or five or 10 millimole of choline can hardly help you to tolerate 300 millimole of salt outside. But 10 millimole choline is absolutely efficient, providing 95% block of the um, tonoplast leak channels. So obviously, if it's increased in a specific location in a cell, that's enough to use sodium as cheap as moticum, and that's what halophytes are doing. Again, you can only get this information getting down to cellular level rather than doing screening at a whole plant level. In the last five minutes, I will be talking about this external sequestration. I will try to argue my position. So first, we answered a very simple question. Are they really important or not? Yes, they are on a leaf surface, but are they really doing something with salt tolerance? So what we did, we did the very crude phenotyping experiments. We just brushed the salt bladders from the leaf very gently. So we did dozens of controls. We look at the metabolic profiles, we found really no impact. So there was no mechanical damage under control conditions. So this is a native leaf, this is a brushed leaf. We're very soft, not that brush, of course, a paint brush. And later we did the electrophysiology. So when we did this brushing, so this is non-brushed, this is brushed under control conditions, we found really not much difference. A slightly lighter color is just a reflection of light. So obviously it's just the optical illusion. And we did metabolic profiling with no single metabolite which was changed by brushing. So it's all fine. However, so and we did it for intact plants, we did it for cut plants. However, when you give the salt stress and you look at the difference, the brushed ones are more salt more sensitive. So we got the salt sensitive phenotype by removing the possibility to sequester the salt into the epidermal bladder cells. Again, you can look at by biomass, by iron content, by SPET readings, Etc. Etc. So, from calculations or from experiments, they are responsible for about 25% of the salt load being put into them. That's a lot. 25% is a very significant amount. 
and concentration in some of the halophytes can go up to one molar or higher, like in mesembryantum. We published the um, sort of concept mod model paper in a trans and plant science with Ryan Hedrich, and we predicted the existence of different transport systems in um, this model system. So that's epidemis. This is a stock cell, the small part in there, which is a headquarter basically, it's trafficking the salt, and this is a big bladder with a huge vacuole where the salt is accumulated. And later on we start to quantify or characterize one transporter by one. So we published a few papers on that. So we found that HKT, which is supposed to be sodium, oh, sorry, potassium uh, exchanger, operates really as a sodium channel and highly selective. So I will skip again the details, but if you look at the selectivity, I think in the next one, yeah. It's really very perfect, perfectly selective sodium channel. In fact, it's more selective in quinoa than in uh, some mammalian systems. So we do have sodium channels, right, in plants, but not in every plant. And obviously this one is involved in taking sodium into the bladder cells and to make sure that the cell is operable, its, it's a operation is balanced by the HAC transporter, which really is highly expressed in a really in a leaf without the bladders and you can see there the difference in the expression between the, the different uh, treatments in there. Again, there are a few other transporters we are currently trying to characterize, but that's, so what? Okay, again, last couple of slides. So why is it important? As I said at the beginning when I was talking about the external sequestration, every plan has a trichome. Right, this is the surface of the barley, wild barley, and this is the surface of the wheat plant, and this is the surface of quinoa. So the difference is that the epidermal bladder cells are simply bigger, right? And here is where molecular genetics and molecular biology can come to help. What we need to do, we need to transform the trichomes using trichome-specific promoters to make them bigger. And later on, we need again to use trichome-specific promoters to put these HKT or other transporters in there and we'll be able to pump sodium into the external structures on the leaf surface. And that will be the solution for the rice and wheat and barley. And interestingly, uh, this is a wild barley. This, these trichomes do not have secretory ability. These ones do have. So we have preliminary results showing, and Tim Flowers in mid-90s published a paper showing that the wheat plants have potentially secretory ability, trichomes in wheat, also in wheat, in the maize plants. So there's no boundary between the halophytes and glycophytes. It's all amalgamated, and they're all simply more efficient in doing that. So this is really untapped resource for the breeders for salt tolerance, but I would say also for drought tolerance, because osmotic adjustment in plants by means of a cheap osmoticum like a sodium is a way to go. Uh, compatible solids are far too expensive and drain all the energy stores in there. Right here, so this is a suggested way forward what we need to do. We need to address a few things. Molecular identity of these transporters, as I said, we already found HKT and HAC and CLC for chloride. Next one is we need to increase the size in them and we need to increase the density of them. Again, for density, Arabidopsis provides really pretty good uh, answers. We have about 40 different genes which are potentially involved in the determination of the cell fate in epidemics, and it's not different from a stoma, from stomata formation, it's the same sort of transcription factors. Uh, and as for the side, size sorry, and volume of trichomes, uh, it's the end reduplication. So again, there's a hormonal control of that. What we need simply, we need the people who was working, will be working on this uh, topic and try to, to address it using quinoa as a model species rather than mesembryantum or Rhabdopsis, which are not suitable for these purposes. Very positive moment is, as I said, that three groups in 2017, I was part of one of them, uh, published the uh, quinoa genome and uh, this, this crop, which was known for probably 20 years as semi-domesticated crop, is now highly on agenda in different places around the world. I'm sitting on the advisory board of the project funded in Denmark by Carlsberg Foundation, and I think they have about 18 million uh, US dollars 
for the, um, it's called, how am I called? Well, it's basically a project about domestication of four or five different species which are semi-orphan crops at the moment. So, again, a lot of resources, a lot of people interested in that, and uh, I think it's highly, highly promising. As again, quinoa is now, you can buy it in Australia in a healthy food shop. It's, it's, a, it's a food, it's already a food with high potential and high tolerance. But, as I said, it's a perfect model species as well. You can use for a variety of different things. Okay, I will end up just saying a quick thanks to, so this was my lab a few years ago. Um, and I have plenty of international collaborators, so I put only a few key names here. But my lab normally collaborates with more than 100 labs in, across the globe, um, 35 countries, I think. <laughs> and in, in a few years ago in my lab, I had probably nine nationalities of people. So take that as open invitation. If someone is interested in any of these aspects, uh, I'm most happy to reply to emails, talk here in the corridors and uh, set up another collaboration, 156 or whatever it will be. Uh, really, very briefly, earlier this morning, uh, these days uh, you cannot do research yourself. You cannot have all these facilities in your lab. Well, you can if you are a director. And if you are a director of a big institute, you have no time for research. It's as simple as that. So the most efficient way is you need to collaborate with colleagues who are not administrators but are scientists and have this drive and enthusiasm for research, but at the same time they have facilities. So complementary is the answer. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sabala. You have uh, really did wonderful job. You have elaborated how the iron channels will be utilized for this, uh, improving the salinity tolerance in wheat and barley. I reserve my comments at the end of the two, uh, two speakers. Now the topic is open for discussion. Five minutes, ten minutes. Hi, uh, Sergey. Uh, that's a very wonderful talk, and thank you. Okay. Yeah, so my question is, uh, when you show the slide uh, that you cut the meristem, root meristem, and the yellowing of the leaves, and uh, you said it's something related with the signaling, salt signaling, but how you differentiate that? Because it could be the affecting the uptake of essential nutrients ions. Well, in control, there was no yellowing of a leaf. It was only under salt conditions. So under control conditions, under no salt, there was no impact on phenotype, so the leaf were still green. You remove a tiny part of the root, which has not much role in nutrition. So that was not involved in, uh, that part was not involved in the nutrient uptake? No, 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 no. Okay. The bulk of the root is intact. My, again, I, for sake of a time, I skipped the details explanations, but my first guess was, oh, cytokinins. Yeah. You know, the root apex produces cytokinins, a specific site. I said to my students, oh, let's do the complementation experiments. So he added, didn't help. So one of the mRNAs or whatever the signal can be, again, I applied for a huge project from China, foundation, we didn't get it, well, for various reasons, I still keep trying. This is a topic I want to explore, because root to shoot signaling is completely unshattered territory. And this is really, as I said, we have six-fold difference in the NHX expression in a shoot when you remove this signaling. Six-fold is huge. I mean, it's not 10%, it's, it's, it's a huge, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, uh, this is Raju Gopal from University of Hyderabad. I just have a, maybe, you know, out of your uh, topic, so when you give a salt, sodium uh, chloride, so in the cytosol there is an imbalance of sodium and potassium. What happens if you go to the chloroplast? Because you know, chloroplast uh, you know, tend to reduce the pH. That means it goes to delta pH will be lower. So during the such conditions, what is the status of ATP, the motor, ATP synthase? Because you know, there will be imbalance. The delta pH will be lower. The ATP motor will be more active. That's what my, you know, can comment on that. Uh, I cannot really give you the answer from the top of my head because chloroplasts were um, interesting but on the side of my research. Yeah. But I had the Indian postdoc, Jay Boze, who is now working at uh, Western Sydney University. And we have done the my thing on the chloroplasts. So we have these results, still not published. So it was planned journal initially and we delayed and delayed it. 
But what I know for sure, we did publish a GX board paper, review paper with him, and in the halophyte species, the presence of high concentration of chloride is essential for chloroplast operation. There are simply a few enzymes, uh, which again, I remember, do not remember from the top of my head, which benefit from chloride in the present. So they are, I think the tolerance in a chloroplast for salt is most likely determined by preferential ability to uptake chloride on expensive sodium. I found that in a membrane potential in a mesophyll cells in a, some succulent plants, that resinomous potassium loss under control conditions you increase the salt concentration and membrane potential becomes even more negative because they preferentially take chloride and chloride hyperpolarizes membrane. So I expect something like that happen in the thylakoid membrane or envelope. And yeah, and we also have the so-called FACC fast cation channel in the chloroplast we published in Fab's letters, which provide this shunt and operate together with proton pump for maintenance membrane potential. Again, there was no simple answer, <laughs> unfortunately, but yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> you uh, I have a question regarding sodium accumulation in uh, various uh, tissue, like you said, uh, mature and um, cytosol, vacuoles, and like too much data was there for grasping it. But my question is regarding that you said that there's more accumulation of sodium in uh, younger part, uh, leaves, and it is uh, not harming uh, compared to the older leaf. So my question is related to that, that uh, is this higher amount of sodium in uh, younger leaf is helping the plant to balance uh, plant water status, uh, solid potential, to have better metabolic, metabolic, metabolic activity in the younger tissue compared to the older tissue? Could be. I don't think uh, we have evidence that younger leaves accumulate more sodium. It's less because of transpiration brings sodium to mature leaves more, and they live longer. But uh, I think the, the key to your answer is uh, a plant may need to sacrifice some tissues for signaling purposes, and that's what was, I was talking about, the meristem. But for the bulk, it comes to a sequestration. So the cell vacuole is 90% of the volume. So if plant is capable to put the salt in there, uh, it will be cheaper to osmotically adjust by means of compatible solids, the cytosol, which only 10% of the volume, and use 90% for the bulk of the cell. And in uh, young leaves, the metabolic activity is very high, and sequestration is most critical than even in mature zone, no, in mature leaves. So, the, and because of a higher uh, amount of metabolic activity, they also have higher smolarity and they, therefore they require to adjust to higher values. So ability of the young leaves to take sodium and put in vacuole as a cheap osmoticum is probably one of the, the key factors uh, which can be used uh, to target. So the question is really uh, when the sodium comes into the uh, xylem and goes through main veins and passing the apoplast in the leaf, uh, what controls uptake, what controls exclusion? and we don't really know what the, the traffic controller is. So we know from empirical observations, or not empirical, from really measurements, that most of the sodium first go in epidemis, and mesophils start to be loaded after the epidemis is full. We have no idea what makes the sodium 10 left to epidemis around the right to mesophil. Exclusion does not work, obviously, because expression of these source one exchanges is about the same. So it's something, yeah, something to do with really the regulation of channels, which can be polyamines, can be RSS, can be cytosolic calcium, uh, and all plenty of second messengers which can have ligand uh, GABA. We showed recently uh, in a TIPS paper that the GABA is, has specific binding motif in the GORC channels. Uh, yeah, plenty of yeah, questions to answer. <laughs> yeah. Hope this is. If there is no doubt. Sorry. Any doubt? <coughs> Professor Sergey, uh, a very good lecture and thought provoking. I have a two uh, query, not a question. Uh, number one, when the root is growing under the salt stress, there are two competition. One, plant have to maintain the growth and development. At the same time, they had to fight with the stress. 
So do you think uh, what is there because if I know that if I am driving a car and there is a fair chances of accident, why would drive in that way? Question number one. Second is that how this colon is going to offer protection because you showed the that it is it is hampering the channel, but how? I don't know. The third is that have you tried to do any of this experiment because the science paper about wheat, what you have showed, that are the field based. Because uh, from since you are showing the collaboration with the Copenhagen, and if you look at the Gothenburg, there are a lot of people is working in the area of field omics using large scale omics technology, mm -hmm. especially in Sweden and all these things. So have you tried to look at this mechanism in a larger scale because it, people from very early and the last 10 years that in all the conferences, people will so go and do the things in the field. But when we come to the laboratory level, at the feasibility level, there's a lot of challenges, especially at the level of statistics and the factors and all these things. So have you tried this in the field level? Because a person like you should have thought about it. Thank you. Okay, it's a lot of questions and uh, I'm not sure how to answer oh, it in a quick way. We, we can interact during the lunch time. It's time to the next uh, lead lecture. And now Maybe just 20 seconds, yes. quick one. We did field for water logging. There is a barley variety released in Australia, which is done by my colleague and partner with whom we supervise like 30 PhD students. It has considered air and chyma in Bali, which helps under water log conditions. And that's based on our findings using these techniques. For salt, no, it's more complicated, but we are working on that. The problem is I have, at peak my lab was 20 people, now it's probably 12, 15. I don't have resources of the big institution, so that's the answer. Yes, I thank uh, Sabala for a wonderful lecture and uh, uh, explanation against the queries. Now we want to felicitate you. Stay back. Thank you so much, Professor Sergey, for your inspiring talk. Now I invite Chair of the session, Dr. R. Gomadi to present the memento to Professor Sergey as a token of our gratitude. Ma'am, please. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, sir. Next lead lecture uh, from Dr. Om Pragas Tankar. Uh, Dr. Om Pragas Tankar is a professor in crop biotechnology at uh, Stockbridge School of Agriculture University, Massachusetts Amherst, USA. Professor Tankar completed his MSc and MPhil uh, degree from uh, Guru Chetra University, Haryana, and was awarded PhD in plant molecular biology from Durham University, England, UK, 1998. He dedicated uh, his research career towards understanding the molecular and biochemical mechanism of abiotic stress tolerance in plants, including heavy metals, drought, high temperature, and salinity and nutrient stress for developing climate resilient crops. He was instrumental in engineering non-food crops for phytomeditation of heavy, met uh, heavy metals and uh, metalloids and also um, dealt with the metabolic engineering of oil, seed crops for increasing oil content of food for food. Biofuels and value-added bioproduct. He studied the role of uh, glutathione homeostasis of enhanced oxidative stress tolerance in plants. Professor Tankar has also utilized nanomaterial as a nano fertilizer and a nano pesticide for sustainable agriculture and food safety. He has explored the molecular and physiological strategy for developing arsenic free rice. Professor Tankar received Outstanding Agriculture Research Scientist Award from the Association of Agriculture Scientists of Indian Origin. That is called AO SIO in 2021, Haryana, and um, followed by uh, Saman Award from the Government of Haryana State in India. Many awards, he is a recipient of many awards. I could not read about almost 15 awards he, he is having. Noble awards all. The plan, and finally, I'll end with the plant genome and crop science and food and energy security. He is a member. He had a published 120 research publication in reputed international journals and has five international patents. He has achieved a total 6,500 citations and a Hutch index of 44. 
with this i proudly invite dr tankar for the second lead lecture on strategy for arsenic phyto remediation and limiting arsenic accumulation rise thank you very much Thank you, Dr. Gomti, uh, for the uh, elaborated introduction. Uh, I just we can save time to cut down the short in the introductions. Uh, thank you very much. And also, I would like to take this opportunity to convey my sincere thank to my friend, my collaborator, uh, Dr. Josh Pothur, and he, all his uh, uh, students, and also Dr. Shakira, that I yesterday I she hosted me at Kanur University, Dr. Abdul Salam. So thank you very much for, and uh, I re really enjoy this uh, uh, beautiful occasion here, as well as this uh, nice little warm weather. <laughs> thank you. Because I, the, the, the time I left from Boston on Friday, you said uh, Sergey had two days visit, uh, 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 transit or travel, I had three days. And uh, the temperature was minus two at the time on the morning. Uh, anyway, so, this talk is slightly different than the theme of that uh, conference on abiotic stresses, and uh, the blame goes to Dr. Joe Sputur. He asked me to give this lecture on arsenic, because yesterday I gave the talk in Kanur University on abiotic stresses. The, the, so here he asked me, please talk about arsenic. So I will do my justice, and so what I'm going to do is, I'm going to show you some of those, my work, and some of those strategies, how I can limit the arsenic in the food chain and also clean the environment. So this is my beautiful campus, uh, University of Massachusetts. Few of the audience has already visited there, and uh, uh, this is the university, this is the tall library, and campus pond, and then the, our our state of art, this one is not going to work. The, our state of art facility for life sciences laboratories, we have perfect four we weathers, a very beautiful scenic valley, and uh, also the, we have a lot of snow. So, uh, and in the fall, these, these are not painted. These are original images. I just took it last week uh, on the weekend. Uh, this is the perfect fall foliage, uh, the best in the world that we have the fall foliage there. So I invite you to come and visit uh, Massachusetts. Thank you. So what arsenic is doing? Arsenic is an acute uh, toxin. It's a carcinogenic. It causes uh, several forms of cancers, and uh, uh, like uh, uh, cancers of liver, uh, skin, uh, kidney, and many of those uh, these, uh, other health defects, and, and the blisters and all those. So it's, a, it's an acute uh, poison, basically. And it has been used as a, as a the most Impo a kind of the number one poison used uh, to kill people actually in the past. And even Napoleon was supposed to be, the, 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 there are theory about that, N Napoleon was poisoned by arsenic. So I didn't, uh, and then arsenic contamination is widespread. So here uh, most of the sources of arsenic is uh, underground. And underground, uh, because of the uh, soil formation, a lot of these volcanic activities, the, uh, the arsenic is deposited in the underground rocks, and uh, underground water is contaminated. A lot of uh, activities from the mining and smelting, and also naturally occur occurrence of soil. But in the past, lead and arsenate has historically been used as herbicides and pesticides to control the disease in the orchards. And also, lead, lead and arsenate were used in cotton field uh, to spray the cotton field to uh, kill the foliage so that they can harvest the cotton balls with the machines. So there is a lot, of, and, and being this uh, non-degradable met, uh, metals, arsenic is metalloid, so they stay there forever in the soil and water. And also, uh, farmers are digging up tubules and extracting uh, the underground water and that's contaminated uh, with the arsenic and they uh, irrigating the paddy fields and arsenic built up in the topsoil there. And India, actually India has a really uh, a very critical situation with the arsenic, with, especially in the drinking water and West Bengal state and the eastern part of UP, Bihar, pan, part of Haryana, Punjab almost 10% of the Indian population is affected by the arsenic, and maybe more in the water alone. And you can see uh, mostly the arsenic deposits are mostly in the Gangetic uh, basins, 
and and then in in the west uh, in the, in the eastern state of those and here the the country of gods and goddesses are blessed we don't have arsenic in kerala much yet so or maybe not discovered yet maybe the bl blessing by the gods and goddesses right so so what are the arsenic forms available in the environment there are two species of arsenic uh, the forms organic form of arsenic and inorganic form of arsenic inorganic form of arsenic is mainly arsenate and arsenite and organic forms are monomethyl arsenic dimethyl arsenic inorganic form of species of arsenic are more most toxic arsenate and arsenite are more toxic and out of those two arsenite is the potent toxin and how this arsenic in the food system is affecting especially in the rice so what uh, since we start growing the high yielding rice and wheat varieties uh, during the after the green revolution and that requires standing water and lot of fertilizers so what farmers were doing it to eat to meet the irrigation demand they are digging up tube wells and pumping the shallow aqua uh, the underground water from the shallow aquifers that contain arsenic and they irrigate the field and water evaporate and due to repetitive irrigation a large amount of arsenic deposit in the top soil and then when you grow rice rice is very much adapted to un un under flooding condition to accumulate arsenite and uh, and that's how this uh, arsenic is coming into the food chain but you grow these veg vegetables and other food crops on the arsenic contaminated soil that accumulate that and that affect the food sa food safety and rice is well designed basically is naturally uh, adapted to accumulate more arsenic and like here you can see many of those uh, uh, studies shows that arsenic uh, in rice is a very high level globally in india in bangladesh in many part of the country and recently in us because of the arsenic and cadmium and lead and mercury level was found to be very high in baby food formulas and and those the us congress mandated these two studies and, they, and, and then they, uh, and mostly these uh, the baby food the, the companies that gerber and all these they make the baby food formulas is very high level tenfold higher than the even the parent like in rice alone so it's very high level and because of that us us congress mandated the baby foods uh, act of 2021 and the action is the demand is closer to zero action means no arsenic in rice or other food crops zero arsenic and that's a challenge to for scientists uh, soil scientists plant scientists to deliver that so how what are the strategies how we can limit arsenic in the food chain and how we can clean the environment so there are several strategies but there is no single magic bullet that can work so there are various strategies you can apply uh, genetic engineering genome editing approaches to manipulate the genes to uh, exclude the arsenic prevent the arsenic accumulation uh, also there are some agri so, uh, uh, agriculture practices uh, that soil amendments with the engineered nanomaterials uh, mineral fertilization silica sulfur and uh, iron kind of fertilization water management practice and all those also phytoremediation of arsenic contaminated soil and water and then as uh, dr parthas arthi said this morning the the, um, the rice has a very high genetic uh, plasticity and i'm sure there are wild cultivars that exist in the in, in the nature that may have capability to exclude arsenic so we need to identify those and then introgress those traits in uh, through the marker assisted breeding and develop those arsenic free rice so i will show you few of those as uh, what i have done my lab has done in those so on, on that one how arsenic is getting into rice so in here arsenic is basically arsenic and silica arsenite and silica behaves very similarly in the soil and in rice rice is well adapted to accumulate very high level of silica around 20% silica is in rice and then these silica transporters lsi1 and lsi2 Uh, uh here these are the silica transporter they transport arsenite from a uh, soil to the uh, root to that and then translocate all the way to the above ground tissues and and then it goes in the also uh, it goes in the uh, seeds but if you manipulate if you knock down these two genes lsi1 and lsi2 which are silica transporter 
then it will affect the rice yield and rice performance because silica is absolutely required for rice in a high concentration. And, and, and plants could be sensitive to disease and other kind of those uh, 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 yield penalties as well. And uh, yeah, so uh, in rice grains, uh, the tomography of uh, uh, this, uh, this image shows that in the rice, the arsenic is basically in the ovular, uh, this vascular transport system here uh, in, in that one. And it's very, if you wash it, some of those will be before you cook rice, if you wash it for a, a little bit longer time, some of that can be prevent, uh, can be washed off, but it is staying in the, in the, in the, in the traces there, so it's difficult to get rid of that. And uh, if you knock down the LSI-1, which is a liquor transporter, plants become sensitive to insect uh, uh, damage, and also there is a significant yield penalty as well. So we cannot manipulate those silica transporters to just get rid of arsenic. So what are the other alternatives? What we can do? So al alternatives is because uh, this LSI1 and LSI2 are the members of aquaporin family. Aquaporin family is a large family. There are uh, subfamilies of aquaporins, PIPs, TIPs, NIPs, and SIPs. And NIPs are basically, the LSI1 is belong to N N NIP. So we should not be uh, manipulating this, otherwise it will affect the rice performance. So what we did was, we look for those alternative members of the uh, aquaporin families, PIPs, whether they are transport in arsenic transport in rice. And these are the, uh, those talented people that they work for my lab. And uh, th this work was basically started uh, by Kundan Kumar, who is a, a faculty at BITS uh, Goa campus now, an uh, associate professor there. And Karim, he's a full professor in uh, Dubai and Sudesh Sikara and uh, the current postdoc, uh, Ahmed. So they, they did this work on this project. So here, this, uh, we, 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 we clone some of those. Uh, there are 11 members of PIPs in RISE, and we clone some of those, around eight. And then we did the genopus oocyte, what uh, Sergey said about the electron transport, and uh, in, in, the, in the frog's uh, egg, uh, genopus oocyte, and we use those and to see the, whether these uh, overexpression of these uh, aquaporins, uh, the PIPs, transport arsenide in the genopus oocyte. And compared to the positive control, which is the LSI1, many of these PIPs also co-transport arsenic as well. So we want to see what, whether this manipulating these can have impact in the, uh, arsenic accumulation rise. So we heterologously overexpress these in the Rapidopsis, and overexpression of these uh, like here is the, 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 the wild type, it is the transgenic lines, overexpression of these, uh, like one of the member PIP1-3, PIP2-6, they provide strong tolerance to arsenide, but in, that's the heterologous system, but they, they have strong tolerance and there was no accumulation of that arsenic. The accumulation was not diff, diff, uh, differing in the wild type and transgenic, so we were puzzled why is the... There's a lot of water coming here, that's... Uh, risky to maybe uh, yeah I, I'll be shifting on that side yeah so so th they were tolerant they were tolerant but there is no accumulation and we look at that why there is no accumulation then we did the efflux and influx studies short term efflux influx and we found that in short term like one hour two hour four hour compared to wild type. Transgenic lines, they are influxing more in the shoot and as well as in the root. And then after four hours, uh, we see, uh, we did the influx for short-term influx, efflux. And then here, after four hours, here is the transgenic lines, here the wild type, and it's efflux out. So basically, and when effluxing, proportionally, uh, the, the more arsenic built up in the media. So that shows that these transporters, PIPs, I are bi-directional transport. They pump in according to the concentration gradient. When there is a more arsenic in the, in the media, more, uh, then, then the more arsenic goes in the, in the, in the plant shoot, root. And when a uh, high arsenic built up in the plant roots, they start pumping it out. They reverse the function. So there are very few bi-directional transport uh, pumps. So our role was to see in plant up function of these genes, whether they can have impact on the uh, arsenic accumulation and tolerance. So we use the RNAi approach. I'm not going into more detail about the technology, 
I'm just going to show you the key results. So basically, we uh, make the hairpin loop structure for the RNA, and then we introduce this gene into rice uh, by the uh, this tissue culture, through tissue culture methods, and then we uh, get that um, um, various transgenic RNA lines, and we see the expression loss of transcript. So you can see there is a significant loss of transcript compared to the wild type uh, in these transgenic lines exp uh, the, for the PIP2-6, also for the one, PIP1-3 as well. So we use three of these lines for further analysis. And then to see the accumulation, we designed the experiment in two ways, short-term hydroponic uptake and long-term soil, up, uh, soil studies, uh, port studies. In the short-term uh, uh, hydroponic uptake, like eight days, and we just like, grow the plants in those uh, kind of very uh, low kind of quality uh, uh, technology that we designed this uh, from the pipette tips boxes, and we use those for growing rice. And so uh, for, we did the hydroponic short-term and the long-term maturity studies. And when the short term, the results I'm showing you, knockdown of PIP 2 3, uh, sorry, 1-3 and 2-6 both basically showed less arsenic accumulation compared to wild type in the shoot and root in the short term hydroponics seedling stage. Both, uh, both genes show the same results. So this shows that these plants are translocating less arsenic from the root to shoot because there is no difference in root. No difference in root, only difference is in the shoot. So that means there is a less translocation from the root to the shoot. The total amount of arsenic may not be affected from the soil to the root, but translocation is affected. And to see that, whether this is a root specific, and we, we saw that uh, from the previous studies that this uh, uh, P PIP1-3 is root specific, specifically, uh, 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 the localized in the endodermis and the, uh, this ex exodermis. And here we also see the transcript, transcript abundance in the transgenic lines, uh, in, sorry, in the wild type control plants. It's more of the transcript abund abundance is higher in roots and for PIP2-6 is both uh, in shoot and root. So PIP1-3 is more root specific and we are doing more localization studies in those. But then the key results was, we want to see whether there is a less arsenic in the seeds that we eat. So in the long-term studies for the, uh, for the maturity level, uh, we grow the plants in the uh, pot studies, and here, again, you can see there is a less arsenic in the transgenic uh, RNA lines compared to wild type in the shoot. Uh, there is not much significant difference in the, in the root except this, uh, in this one. And then there is a less arsenic in the flag leaf and almost 20 to 25% less arsenic in the grains. So that, and that's in the post study, post studies, in, in the field studies could be very different as well. So basically what I, and also we not only knock down by RNA, we also overexpress uh, this, whether the overexpression can increase arsenic accumulation uh, more. So here in this model, when we knock down this RNA, uh, this uh, PIPs uh, by the, uh, by, uh, using the RNA, there is a less arsenic going in the shoot. But when we overexpress, uh, when we overexpress these genes, there is a more arsenic, go uh, arsenic going in the shoot and uh, grains. So it's basically reverse. So it shows that, clear, clear, clearly shows that this, these genes, PIP genes, are involved in arsenic translocation or transport in rice. And then second thing was uh, soil amendments. So we use the nano engineered nanomaterial, uh, uh, mainly the sulfur. Sulfur is the most abundant nutrient that plants require that in high amount. And we use the sulfur, instead of regular sulfur, we use the sulfur in the nano form. And here, uh, the results I'm showing, because nanotechnology is gr growing big, uh, there are a lot of uh, approaches for the nanotechnology in the different fields. It's the fastest growing field uh, in, in our modern history, in any of the sciences, in nanotechnology. Every year, there are more than uh, uh, 20,000 publications are there. So, and this, and this, so we use the nanosulfur materials, and this uh, PhD student, uh, Sudhir, and Ahmed was PhD student at the time, now he's postdoc, and uh, Joe, uh, sorry, Sam is also PhD student, and Jordan, master student, they work on this project. So, we published this paper showing that nanoscale sulfur improves plant growth as a fertilizer, 
increase yield, but also significantly decrease arsenic in the grains. So here you can see the port studies. Uh, this is control plant. Plants uh, exposed with the, only with the nanosulfur. Plants exposed to arsenite. Arsenite plus nanosulfur and arsenate and arsenite, arsenate plus nanosulfur. You can see plants are bigger here compared to wild type, but arsenite is toxic. Arsenate is toxic. When you add nanosulfur, growth was recovered. And when we grow these plants at maturity in the pot studies, you can see uh, there is a significant decrease in arsenic accumulation uh, with the nanosulfur treatment. Here is the arsenite alone. In the, and this is in the shoot, this is in the root, and here is the arsenite plus nanosulfur. Uh, there is a, almost like a 45% decrease, and with the bulk sulfur, regular sulfur, there was no there was decrease, but it was not significant. And arsenate, uh, we just ignore that because rice uptake arsenite, not arsenate directly. And here, but in in the in the root, it was almost. Uh, 75% decrease in the arsenic accumulation. The nanosulfur amendment with the soil, 75% decrease, decrease in the arsenic uh, accumulation. But most important parts are the grains. Here, with the nanosulfur alone, uh, with nanosulfur treatment with the arsenite, there is a 60% decrease in the grain. So this is, so there are opportunities to uh, do this kind of various practices. Not all the time biotechnology or molecular biology is the key. This is a, a easily deployable, acceptable technology in the field without going through any regulations because sulfur is a nutrient. So this can have a big impact and in the, in the flag leaf there was no significant difference. So then the third part is uh, uh, the phytoremediation of arsenic. Let me get a sip of water. Phytoremediation of arsenic is my long-term interest. Uh, but then I've been, I started my postdoc career when I moved to Georgia. I started on the phytoremediation. Dr. Uh, Parthasarthi knows that. He visited my lab when I was postdoc there uh, in Georgia. So, uh, and I designed this phytoremediation of arsenic from the scratch. Uh, there is uh, uh, only one plant identified, uh, Teres vitata, a break, Chinese break phone, as a hyperaccumulator, but has a limitation, cannot be grown everywhere. It, has, it can be grown only tropical climates. So what I did was, I was developing a genetics-based uh, phytoremediation strategy. I call it a suitcase strategy. You, you, you can uh, uh, take this uh, technology and insert those, uh, those genes in any plant species of any native uh, climatic conditions. Instead of introducing new plant species, you can introduce those in the local varieties. So the idea was, in the aerobic environment, in the, in, in the soil, not in the rice flooded, con flooded condition, but aerobic environment, arsenate is more prevalent. So plants can take arsenate is getting into the plants by phosphate transporters. Because arsenate and phosphate are structural analogs. It's very similar. And behavior is very similar. So arsenate is getting into the plants through the phosphate transporters uh, uh, system. And once the arsenate is getting into that, our idea was we can translocate arsenate to the above ground tissues. And because arsenate cannot bind, cannot be chelated, arsenite is highly thiol reactive. It can bind to sulfide groups of any amino acids that contain sulfur. So, and arsenite, uh, once arsenite is bound to those uh, glutathione or phytochelatin sulfur containing peptides, it's no more toxic or less toxic. And that's the only form that can be uh, squistered or accumulated in the uh, uh, vacuoles in the leaves. So our idea was to increase the phosphate transporters, but there are al already nine high affinity phosphate transporters in plants. Uh, we don't need to do much. Uh, our arsenate is naturally getting into the plants. Our aim was to reduce arsenate to arsenite in the leaves and then uh, increase the glutathione contents to uh, uh, increase the chelation of those arsenite and then arsenite chelated with the glutathione and phytochelatins can be stored into vacuoles. But while we were doing it, we also found out there is a natural uh, adaptation in the plants. Plants try to keep the, uh, the toxic metals below ground to prevent the uh, uh, above ground tissues uh, from damage. 
So we, we found that uh, plants as an endogenous arsenate reductase as well, we need to knock down, otherwise uh, arsenate will not go up. So while we were doing it, we just used two genes uh, first. Uh, I used this uh, uh, arsenate reductase, RC gene from bacteria and gamma ECS from bacteria. So arsenate is basically reducing, uh, this uh, arsenate reductase is reducing less arsenate, toxic arsenate to more toxic arsenite. And arsenite is toxic, it can kill the plant, but if we simultaneously increase the glutathione level uh, by overexpressing the uh, uh, this uh, gamma glutamyl cysteine synthase or phytochelatin synthase genes, it can increase the phytochelatin levels and it can bind to arsenite and arsenite bound to that is no more toxic. And that was the paper uh, basically uh, very early on in 2002. I, 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 I published this in, uh, there in Georgia and basically uh, idea was arsenate will get into the roots and arsenate will be arsenate will become uh, going in the shoot in the above ground tissues. There we can uh, by, by a shoot specific expression uh, of RC we can convert to arsenite and in, increase the glutathione content and store in the vacuoles. That was the whole idea. So we put these two genes together first. Now you can see because plants converting arsenate to arsenite they died. They are sensitive. Plants uh, 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 expressing gamma ICS alone, they are moderately tolerant. But when you combine the expression of these two, that complement the function of each one, and transgenic, double transgenic plants become super resistant to arsenic. These plants have 17 times more biomass than the wild type uh, non-transgenic plants. And these transgenic lines, the double transgenic lines, they accumulate three times more arsenic than the control or the single transgenic lines. So 17 times more biomass, three times more arsenic per plant basis, they have 51 times higher arsenic accumulation and tolerance. That's a significant. So, and that's basically very close to a natural hyperaccumulator kind of definition. So basically, when we did this one, then we found this is another strategy here. We need to knock down this gene. Then, but I'm not going to show the data on that one. Uh, but we want to translate this strategy into field crops. So, idea is for, for phytoremediation of arsenic or heavy metals, the best practice is do not use food crops. Try to find non-food crops, high biomass, fast growing crops that you can remediate this, uh, and, and you don't uh, uh, use the food crops, people accidentally eat those and uh, uh, worsen the situation. So I found Crambi absinica as a member of mustard family uh, it is a basically inedible non-food crops uh, and a, a short life cycle for maximum biomass. For phytoremediation, we need maximum biomass. We don't need maturity. And here, it's low agronomic practice. Also, the best trait for this crop is it's self-pollinated. It does not cross-pollinate, so no, no escape of gene, gene flow as well. So here, we put those same strategy. We translate that strategy from Arabidopsis to Crambi. Uh, done by this, uh, now this uh, new graduate student from Kenya is doing this, uh, taking over from those, these people returned back to India, and he's doing that one. And here, what, initially what we found, when we overexpress the gamma ICS uh, uh, gene in the plants, plants are tolerant to, compared to wild type. And trans transgenic plants expressing uh, RC, arsenic reductase, were even sensitive than this one. But when we combine these two genes together, RC and gamma ICS, you can see the difference in the tolerance level on arsenate. Uh, this is uh, almost 300 mic micromolar arsenate, and you can see that these plants accumulate, has almost a uh, uh, three-fold, uh, four-fold biomass as compared to the uh, wild-type plants, and also they have almost double the amount of arsenic accumulation in the above-ground tissues as well. And this plant is very robust growth. It can produce almost uh, 30, 40 ton wet biomass. And so ideal for phytoremediation. So now basically uh, what we are doing is we are using the nanomaterials to enhance the arsenic accumulation, uh, 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 translocation from root to shoot, and combining all those five genes, stacking into a single plant species so that it can be taken from the soil all the way to the root, to the shoot, and to the vacuole storage. So it, it will be a, a challenge, but we are doing this one. And the idea is, in particularly in context to India, we, where we have the arsenic problem in the rice paddy fields, we are growing rice, putting more uh, arsenic contaminated water, arsenic built up in the soil, we harvest rice, 
then we are planting wheat. That's the wheat rice cycle is in India is more common. And so in between the rice and wheat, if we get four, five weeks, a month period, we can grow this crop, this transgenic cranberry, to clean the arsenic built up after a few years and then grow other crops. So it's a kind of, can, can go in a cyclic manner and we can basically maintain the low level of arsenic in the soil, so prevent the accumulation of those. Okay, so here, what I showed you was that uh, uh, the, the rice accumulate very high level of arsenic and uh, uh, these silica transporters are involved in arsenic transport but manipulating the silica transporter is not ideal because it will be affecting the rice yield and, and, and uh, functionality. So we need to find alternate transporters that are involved in arsenic transport and we found uh, members of PIP, plasma membrane intrinsic protein family and those are the uh, we showed you that uh, by overexpression and knockdown, uh, they showed that uh, they involved in arsenic transport and translocation from root to shoot tissues and above ground tissues. So uh, we need to uh, kind of uh, manipulate those to uh, lower the arsenic containing rice and other crops. And also uh, we use the nano sulfur as a soil amendment treatment for arsenic, uh, blocking the arsenic uptake uh, from or how the sulfur is behaving is basically uh, up, uh, from the, our studies, what it shows in that in the paper is sulfur is interacting with arsenite and be, uh, bound to arsenite and arsenite once bound to sulfur, it makes arsenite sulfide complexes. Arsenite sulfide is non-soluble, precipitated out and hence less arsenic is available to rice. And then also we are doing the uh, this uh, uh, a phytoremediation approach to clean the arsenic contaminated soil using non-food high biomass crop species. So with that, uh, this is the, basically the work is done by the uh, talented postdocs and students. Uh, I only just give the advice and guidance, but hard work is done by them. And I, 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 I give the credit to them for all this hard work. So Ahmed just finished PhD now, joined postdoc, Gurpal Sudhir, and this, all these people in the green, they are the PhD, current PhD students and, and these are the, some of those visiting faculty and some of those uh, honors, uh, honors undergraduate students and some of those uh, the, uh, recent postdocs. The work I showed you was from Sudesh and uh, Kundan and uh, also uh, 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 this uh, uh, Kareem as well. And all those my collaborators uh, uh, in, in US, uh, Jason White at Connecticut Agriculture Experiment Station, uh, Dr. Puthur here at Calicut, uh, Dr. R.D. Tripathi at Lucknow. Uh, I have a long-lasting collaboration with him there. And uh, also Professor Swini Parikh at JNU and uh, my SPARK project collaboration at Haryana Agriculture University with uh, Dr. Upender Kumar and uh, now also with the doc Dr. Nita Lakra. She is also here in the audience. And my collaboration with uh, uh, the group in the uh, University of Parma, Italy, uh, Nelson Marmaroli and others and all the funding support from the NIH and RPIE and DOE, I acknowledge those. With that, I will stop and thank you very much. It was a roller coaster right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tankar. You have uh, maintained the timing in presentation and wonderful talk uh, to hear. It is quite interesting also. It is uh, really, it is eye-opener for the food safety and security aspect and uh, all over the globe. So the topic is open for discussion now. I invite only a few questions. I hope I made it, it clear. Uh, it was a little fast because of the time constraint, but I try to explain as much as I can do. And I try to make it simple, not to burden you with the, this, all these molecular jargons and uh, the technology. Done the job, better way. Yeah, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, sir. I am Lakshman from IHR. Sir, I just wanted to know, uh, uh, you have, in detail, you have explained us the strategies. So the one of the strategies what you suggested is the phytoremediation. So what happens when the biomass degrades? Excellent question. And because of the time constraint, I remove the slide. But uh, the proposal is, the idea is, you harvest the biomass, you basically incinerate, reduce the biomass from hundreds of tons to few kilograms as material and that will be highly enriched with the metals and you recycle the metal 
instead of mining more from the environment, recycle the metal and selling it to the uh, mining, uh, the smelting companies and all these, they can recycle that. And recover, not only clean the uh, soil and water, but also recover the metal and sell it for profit. Yeah. Any more questions? Sir, there are a lot of patients from uh, 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 India, kidney and liver patients. Is it because of food or is it because of medicine or any other side effects? Say again, madam, I, I couldn't get your question. There are a lot of patients in India, liver and kidney patients. Is it because of medicine or because of food, our food habits? <laughs> Especially in Kerala, sir, Kerala. Okay, uh, so the problem is that, you know, what we are eating today is not that it was the, uh, our uh, parents and grandparents were eating, uh, you know, 50 years back, uh, because we are very much on the rice and uh, wheat kind of those diets, and the, all the coarse grains are eliminated. Now we are coming back to what uh, Dr. Sergei Sabala said that about the quinoa. I eat quinoa on, uh, almost twice a week uh, because it's uh, healthy uh, for that. So, it's a, so we are coming to that one, but the, yes, the food is one of that, disease, cancers, is all because the farmers are spraying excessive pesticides and herbicides, and all these are, are the pesticides coming in the food chain, they are spraying, the, like say, eggplant, brinjal, they are spraying the, today, tomorrow it is going to the market. So all these excessive chemicals are causing the health defects as well, but also, these uh, fertilizers, excessive fertilizers because of the high yielding wheat and rice varieties we are growing, fertilizers contain uh, these toxic metals as well. They are contaminated with the toxic metals because they are basically like phosphate uh, fertilizers. They are from the rocks. And so they are coming in those, in the heavy metals are coming in the food chain. Arsenic, I show you the story, it is coming in the food chain. So the health defects are with the various reasons. And ultimately also not only food, our lifestyle as well, because we, we are accustomed to, we are, we are too much glued to WhatsApp on our, on our phones and not doing exercise. That's another uh, issue, right? Yes, sir. Rightly said. We are our sedentary life, sedentary life, I yeah. can say. So, w b before you uh, uh, conclude, I want to just, uh, what uh, Sergey said that he has a very highly international lab and I, he has wonderful lab. Also, I want to tell you, I have, my, I have very diverse lab. I have people from seven countries speaking seven languages from five religions. So I promote diversity in a big way. And uh, in the audiences here, yesterday I said that at, at Kadur University, I saw the audiences, 90, more than 90% were girls, females. And I said, hats off to the girl power. That's a, that's a real woman empowerment and we should promote that. Happy to hear. Thank you. <laughs> So this, this is the time to felicitate uh, the lead, second lead speaker. Thank you, Professor Dhankar, for such an informative session. Now I invite co-chair Dr. Abdul Salam to, rep to present the memento to Professor Dhankar. Sir, please. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I would like to thank Professor John E. Thopil for efficiently handling the technical session. I would like to invite Professor John to present the mementos to Dr. R. Gomadi, chair of the session. Sir, please. Gomadi, ma'am, please. Dr. Abdul Salam, co-chair of the session. Dr. Shakira A.M., the session rapporteur. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. As our first technical session has come to an end, let us break for a delicious meal. 
We'll be resuming the conference sharp by 2.15 p.m. Thank you. I feel really honored to introduce three eminent plant physiologists to this August audience. So the afternoon session, technical session two, will be chaired by Dr. Roy Stephen. He's a professor of plant physiology at Kerala Agriculture University, Vellanikara. Apart from that, he is the associate director of research, RARS. He joined the Kerala Agriculture University as an assistant professor of plant physiology in 1999. And uh, uh, prior to that, he was with ICR as an ARS scientist. He's a very senior faculty at KAU, and his major areas of interest are stress physiology, pollen biology, male sterility, and he has membership in many professional societies like Indian Society for Plant Physiology, Indian Society for Plant Physiology and Biochemistry, Indian Society for Biochemistry and Biotechnology, and he's a member of the Indian Science Congress Association, a tall figure in the area of plant physiology, and I feel really honored to welcome him to chair this session. Welcome, sir, Professor Roy sir, Stephen. So this session will be co-chaired by another gentleman, Dr. Ashish K. Chadruvedi. He's a plant physiologist, and presently he's attached to CWRDM. It's a premier institute under Kerala State Council for Science, Technology, and Environment. He is with the Land and Water Management Research Group of CWRDM, a very serious researcher and plant physiologist. He is a member of the Indian Society for Plant Physiology and a life member Society for Tropical Plant Research, Kanpur. And he is an editorial board member of Rice Research, Omics International, and editorial board member of Tropical Plant Research. So I welcome you, sir, to co-chair this session. And uh, this session, uh, reporter is our alumnus only, Dr. K. Sopna. She uh, did her PhD in the campus only, same plant physiology and biochemistry division. And she's an associate professor with the Government Arts and Science College, Calicut, a senior faculty member and her area of research are stress physiology and biochemistry, morphological, anatomical, physiological effects of metal toxicity in plants, bioaccumulation study of metals, and phyto remediation. A senior faculty member under Government College, and she's a member of the Board of Studies of University of Kannur and Board of Studies in Botany of this university. And she's a member of Professor P.S. Krishnan Foundation, 
and she has been associating with the activities of the department since long and a, a serious teacher and uh, researcher. I welcome uh, Sobna teacher to this session as a rapporteur. So I request Professor Roy Stephen sir to conduct this session. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. So, good afternoon, uh, Dr. Arashan, sir, Dr. Ashish, Dr. Sapna, madam, other respected delegates. So, we have uh, two important talks arranged uh, in this uh, specific session. So, let me introduce the uh, lead speaker, Dr. Umesh Bageshwar. So he's a research scientist at the National Center for Therapeutic Manufacturing, Texas Engineering and Extension Services, Texas A&M University, Texas, USA. So he's training staff from various biopharmaceutical companies and uh, involved in COVID-19 vaccine production and uh, purified its spike protein and uh, receptor binding domains. Uh, he's a consultant in uh, Joint Bio for providing technical know-how for biological nitrogen fixation and uh, microbial solutions. So he was awarded PhD in uh, bioscience from Jawaharlal Nehru University and uh, later postdoctoral fellow at uh, Institute of Plant Genomics and Biotechnology, Texas A&M University. So he's expertise in uh, advanced and novel molecular biology techniques and developed many fluorescence-based in vitro and in vivo assays to study protein transport pathways and designed high throughput screen assays for drug discovery, targeting the bacterial protein transport pathways, etc. So he was honored with several awards and uh, international peer-reviewed publications and international patent. So I'm sure in this uh, very important uh, uh, international conference, so his domain, because it's very specific, uh, mostly uh, his expertise in that uh, technical aspects, so will be of uh, highly useful for our uh, delegates. So I welcome uh, Umesh sir for yeah, lead lecture. Thank you for nice introduction. Uh, though I'm still, I'm working uh, in the therapeutics uh, manufacturing these days, but I always, uh, it was my passion and love to work on nitrogen fixation because I did my PhD in biological nitrogen fixation from Jawaharlal Nehru University in the year, I finished my PhD in 1995 and uh, my model organism was uh, Acetobacter vinyl and I. So here is the work I'm going to present, which is a uh, fruit of collaboration between me and Professor Patathati from the Department of Environment, Environmental Sciences, Andhra University, Vishakhapatnam. Today's my topic is mitigation of the soil soluble nitrogen deficiency with Acetobacter species augment crop productivity. We, before we uh, get into my work, I would like to give you introduction uh, uh, since my work, uh, current work is on the biological nitrogen fixation and how it can help increasing the plant productivity and improving the health of the soil, I'd like to give you a brief introduction of biological nitrogen fixation and various, uh, uh, yeah. So when we talk about nitrogen fixation, we all know that at mo we, we have about 78% of it uh, nit um, nitrogen available in the atmosphere. However, this nitrogen is not easy avail easily available to the plant system uh, because of uh, 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 because it is quite an inert molecule. Biological nitrogen fixation is one of the main factor 
uh, the nitrogen is being supplied. One of the main factors which is responsible for uh, enriching the soil with uh, nitrogen. There are other ways by which nitrogen is, uh, with soil is enriched with the nitri nitrogen. For example, decomposition of mineralization of the soil. It can be done by uh, rainfall. So nitrogen is usually in the form of ammonia and by the process of nitrific nitrification, it is available, converted to nitrate and nitrate is available, easily available to the plant system. The nitrate, uh, nitrogen is also being lost from the soil by denitrification, which is mostly is uh, performed by denitrification bacteria and it can be leached out of the soil uh, through petrification. So, before the discovery of uh, biological nitrogen fixation, uh, before the dis discovery of the Haber Bosch process in 1913, just before the Second World War, the crop productivity was quite limited. What I mean to say was that uh, because of lack of nitrogen, there was not an increase in the crop productivity. However, after the discovery of biological nitrogen fixation, you can see you can see a linearity between the nitrogen between the nitrogen is being produced uh, along with the, what you see is the population growth. You can always say that the discovery of chemically produced ammonia by the Haber, Haber Bosch process revolutionized the crop productivity. And you can also say that this, this discovery fed the world for more than a century. Can we really sustain it over a period of time of next 100 years or so? And the answer is no. So, though Haber-Bosch process fed the world for more than 100 years, but as, in, as of current scenario, this is, seems to be not sustainable system because Haber-Bosch process takes about uh, 91.8 kilo joules to produce one mole of, uh, to fix one mole of nitrogen. It is very energy intensi intensive. It takes about 2.4 percent of the global energy or the fuel, fuel uh, the carbon fuel is being produced and mostly energy is derived from the petroleum product. You can imagine how much pressure it puts our uh, carbon footprint. For one ton of nitrogen manufactured, it produces about 10 to 14 tons of carbon, and I, carbon, di carbon dioxide equivalent to the atmosphere which is being emitted to our soil. It is an absolutely environmentally unfriendly way to supply nitrogen to our uh, rhizosphere. There are several disadvantages. Uh, what brings the Haber-Bosch Haber process because of excessive fertilization of our soil is acidification of our forest, soil, and aquatic ecosystems. Hypoxia, which is lack of oxygen in the coastal and lake ecosystems. Harmful, harmful algal boom, which you have seen globally because of excessive release of uh, nitrogen to our, our water bodies. Loss of biodi biodiversity, particularly the biodiversity which is below ground in the terrestrial and the aquatic ecosystem, regional haze. De depletion of the ozone, global climate change, nitrate contamination of drinking water and several aquifers. So the estimated cost, which according to uh, a several organization, uh, uh, over production of, uh, over utilization of nitrogen uh, as a fertilizer causes 70 to 320 billion euro per year in the European Union and about 81 to 441 billion US dollar per year in order to take care of the excessive nitrogen utilization in our crop systems. So if you see in this picture what we have shown is the several components of nitrogen which are present in our soil or in the rhizosphere. My focus will be on the blue zone So uh, what it is shown in the blue is chemically produced nitrogen, 
which is almost half of the nitrogen present in our isosphere. Uh, there are some scientific studies which says that 80% of nitrogen in our body is being produced by Haber-Bosch process. Now, can imagine what an impact this can have uh, on, a, on our en environment. And most of this nitrogen is basically is a runoff in the water, which causes several problems. What it is shown in this green zone is biologically produced nitrogen. So in the year 2020, about 118 million tons of nitrogen fertilizer are being supplied to our uh, agricultural ecosystem, which is being produced by the Haber and the Bosch process. Now the question is, can we reduce the utilization of the Haber process? Um, and along with that, we can enhance the biological nitrogen fixation uh, to sustain our sustainable agri agricultural system. And the answer is yes. I would like to draw your attention uh, to this study. I'll get back to it. So let's get back to what are the biofertilizers and why azotobacter species are so special. So when you talk about biofertilizers, they are usually involved in the biological nitro nitrogen fixation, phosphate solub solubilization, or the organic matter decomposition. My focus will be on the nitrogen fixation. Nitrogen fixation can be carried out by symbiotic or non-symbiotic nitrogen fixation. Most of them are bacteria. And my focus will be on the azotobacter species, which is a non-symbiotic biological fixing aerobic organism. So when we talk about uh, biological nitrogen fixation, the Klebsiella pneumonia is a well studied organism. It is partially aerobic. It has uh, the gen genomic uh, configuration very much similar to Azotobacter species which includes Azotobacter vinylandii or Azotobacter crococum. They have 21 genes. I'm talking about the molybdenum dependent nitrogen fixation pathway, which is universal, universally present in all biological fixing uh, organisms or diazotrophs. They have 21 genes, they are arranged in seven operon. And the expression of all NIF genes is governed by a sigma 54 dependent promoter. Uh, the conventional promoter is uh, our minus 10, minus 35 promoter. Uh, however, the sigma uh, 54 dependent promoter produces a sigma factor which is responsible for the expression of the genes which has a minus, uh, which has a GG and 10 GC consensus sequence. Okay. And the promoter of all NIF genes binds to NIF A. I'll get, get back to you what the NIF A is. NIF A basically is a positive regulator. Okay. The transcription factor. So let's look at the genomic organization configuration of the NIF genes in Klebsiella pneumonia as well as in Azotobacter and Vinylandii. You have 21 genes, they are arranged in seven um, operons. Some of them are polycystronic operons, some of them are monocystronic operons. The main genes are NIF H, which is responsible for dinitrogenase uh, reductase. Uh, and NIF DK, they are forming for a structural component of the gene nitrogenase by the alpha and beta subunits. Along with these uh, structural genes, you have several other genes which are responsible for performing different functions, such as dinitrogenase uh, processing, uh, dinitrogenase uh, for the synthetic of various iron sulfur or iron sulfur molybdenum cofactors, but there are two special genes which are really close to me, which are regulatory genes. Uh, NIF A is a positive regulator and NIF L is a negative regulator. So what happened in low nitrogen, low oxygen conditions? Uh, I'll get back to low, low oxygen later on because I haven't discussed it. What really happened in low uh, nitrogen, low oxygen conditions, both NIF-L and NIF-A 
are transcribed and subsequently translated. And NIFL, uh, which is a negative regulator under low, ni low nitrogen or low oxygen conditions, is inactive. Therefore, NIF A is able to bind to all the NIF operons, upstream of the NIF operons, and responsible for the transcription of the genes responsible for nitrogen synthesis. However, under high oxygen and high nitrogen conditions, NIF L and NIF A, they are uh, transcribed and translated. But NIF L gets active under these conditions which interacts with, the, with NIF A by protein-protein interaction. Thus, uh, in that condition, NIF A is not available to bind to the NIF operons. So this is the transcript, the regulation on nitrogen fixation at transcription level. However, nitrogen is also regulated at translational and the post-translational levels. I'll just get some water. So as I talked about nitrogenase, nitrogenase is composed of two uh, components, nitrogenase reductase as it is shown here uh, on the top here, nitrogenase reductase which is coded by NIFH gene and you have a structural gene which is responsible for, which is basically the holoenzyme nitrogenase, is a, it is a heterotetramer and they all have an iron sulfur or iron sulfur molybdenum cofactor. The function of nitrogenase reductase is to supply electrons to the nitrogen and nit electrons to the nitrogenase and nitrogenase is responsible for converting uh, nitrogen, atmospheric nitrogen into ammonia uh, in presence of hydrogen and it takes about 16, uh, 16 ATP molecules to uh, convert one molecule of, molecule of uh, ammonia. So this enzyme is extremely oxygen sensitive. As you can see here, in the case of Klebsiella ammonia, 1.5 micromodal uh, of oxygen is good enough to fully inactivate nitrogenase from uh, Klebsiella pneumonia. However, the situation is different in azotobacter. As I said, the IC50 of the Klebsiella pneumonia of nitrogenase is 0.89 uh, micromolar. When you look at the IC50 of azotobacter, nitrogenase, which is much, much higher, which is between 45 and 400 micromolar of oxygen. I'm saying 45 to 200 because there are several subspecies of Acetobacter, Acetobacter crocogom, Acetobacter vinylandii, and so on and so forth. In addition to have higher uh, resistance to oxygen by the Acetobacter species, the Acetobacter species are known to have a higher respiratory quotient, means this is one of the organisms which has a very high respiratory rate, which results in forming a partial anaerobic conditions intracellularly that also produce nitrogenase uh, from these organisms. Secondly, it has a conformational protection. What the conformational protection is? The conformational protection is there is a protein which is called Stetna protein. This protein binds irrevers irreversibility to nitrogenase under high oxygen conditions and protect uh, the nitrogenase uh, from Acetobacter species. Both factors as well as like which means uh, contributes towards oxygen protection of nitrogenase in Acetobacter species. As you can see the IC50 of uh, nitrogenase inactivation in Klebsiella pneumonia is much much lower as compared to the Acetobacter vinylenda is, is, is distinctively uh, much much higher and uh, when you talk about uh, the IC50, you know that nitrogen fixation takes place in the aqueous conditions and the dissolved oxygen concentration in the distilled water at 101 kilopascal, which is at the sea level, 
is 258 micro molar. So in any condition, previous supervisor, Professor Skidas, we <laughs> wanted to see the role of NIFEL, which is a negative regulator in uh, enhancing the nitrogen fixing, fixing capabilities of this organism. Uh, this is not a combi combinatorial research, this is a targeted research which we designed based on the previous knowledge of nitrogen fixation we gathered over a period of several centuries. So what we did, we de deleted the NIF L from, from Azotobacter crocum, therefore it is not able to produce a repressor. So if you do not have a repressor, NIF A will be produced constitutively uh, even under high oxygen, low oxygen, high nitrogen, low nitrogen conditions and therefore it is not available to inactivate NIFA in any of the conditions. Therefore, NIFA will bind to all the promoters of NIF genes and they are constituted, constitutively transcribed and translated. As a, this is the whole scheme of mutagenesis of the, uh, of the production of NIFEL mutant. I'm not going to go into the details of that, but uh, I think some of the files are not looking good. Yeah. Yeah. So we named the NIF uh, L mutant. I think they are kind of not really arranged properly. Sorry for the issue. So Well, it has not, uh, this, this, the presentation is not showing all the slides which I wanted to say, but that's all right. What I mean to say, I can explain it uh, without slides. Uh, the NIF uh, L mutant we generated uh, enhanced the nitrogen fixing uh, 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 capacity of uh, by several thousand fold, number one. Number two, the NIF L mutant which we generated was not inhibited by the fixed, site, fixed source of nitrogen. Number three, under nitrogen su su uh, sufficient conditions, this mutant of Acetobacter crococum was not inhibited due to fixed nitrogen source. These are the th three main factors, but these are by the magnitude of thousand folds we are talking about. However, those slides are not available here, though I copied it. Anyway. So we generated a NIFEL mutant and uh, we thought we should check them, uh, how, it, how it treats, uh, how it helps in enhancing the nitrogen fixation capabilities of the wheat plants. So this is the whole protocol. We take the Acetobacterium crococum, wild type and the mutant. We grow them in the Berg's nitrogen free medium, which is containing a source of nitrogen. We pellet the cells and wash it with nitrogen free media. We suspend the, we suspend the pellet of the bacteria uh, BNF to the concentration of 1 to 10 to the power 10 cells per milliliter. We soak the wheat seals with Acetobacterium cultures, incub the incubate at over room temperature for three hours and then dry them for three hours. And then we sow the uh, seeds in the soil in vermiculite perlite mixture. Here, some of the web abbreviations are WT is wild type. My mutant strain is Acetobacter crococum. And number of acetobiotic crocum adhered to the east wheat grain was about 10 to the power 7 cells. Yeah. So you can see these are the experiments conducted in the pot. Uh, the first at is uh, there is no acetobacter. Uh, you can see. And we added no urea, urea to the 40 kilometer per hectare and to the 80, kilometer, 80 kilogram per hectare. This is CBD in no, no urea conditions. And HKD15, when we add 
when we add urea to 40 kilogram per hectare or we do not treat it with the urea, you can see when you compare two comparable conditions, when the soil is not inoculated, soil is not supplemented with the urea, as it is shown here, uh, sorry, supplemented with 80 kilogram nitrogen, would give the same yield when we added 40 kilogram of nitrogen per hectare with the uh, mutant strain. This says that uh, you know, we are able to save about 50% of nitrogen supplementation to the soil. Uh, that is due to the inoculation of the wheat with this mutant strain. We performed We performed the similar studies in, in, in soil, uh, in, the, uh, in the soil. The same thing, urea, non, uh, urea, there is no addition of urea in the first bar, second one is 40 and the third one is 80. This one is 140, uh, 120 kilogram of urea added per hectare and if you compare it with the urea to 80 kilogram per hectare, per hectare but the weeds were, wheat seeds were treated with the Azotobacter, Azotobacter crocogum, which has been mutagenized, which clearly says that whatever you yield, you get due to addition of one kilogram nitrogen per hectare to the soil, you can obtain the same yield of the wheat uh, by adding one third less of the fixed nitrogen to the, uh, to the soil. So if you look at the effect of this on economy and the environment, um, it can save 33% application of uh, chemical uh, fertilizer to the soil. When we talk about the wheat, wheat is usually, I'm talking about the global numbers, wheat is planted in about uh, 218 million hectare of the land and it utilizes about 260 kilogram of urea per hectare which means the global utilization of the urea uh, is 56,680 million kilograms. When we look at the cost and term effectiveness, if we use the strain which we have developed, is applied to all the wheat fields globally, would result in the saving of 18,704 kilogra million kilogram of urea, which would be worth about seven and a half billion dollar saving of urea and we are saving the environment. And if we extend this special strain to other crops, this would result in a saving of about 21 billion US dollars uh, globally. So can we find, now the question is we have on principle shown that Azotobacter species can enhance, enhance the biological nitrogen fixation efficiency uh, with less utilization of chemically uh, produced nitrogen source. Can we find some organisms, especially as a tobacter, which, are, which have a natural capacity to, to fix atmospheric nitrogen more efficiently as compared to the wild type and it's comparable with the mutant strain which we had generated few years back. And the purpose is to identify, develop suitable strains of Azotobacter species for improving the crop productivity of cereal crops. So why just Azotobacter? I already told you, Azotobacter has higher IC50 uh, for the inhibition of nitrogenase, and it has three pathways of nitrogen fixation, which, which was shown in, in some of the slides which have been used which I had prepared, they have three pathways. The first pathway is the molybdenum dependent pathway, okay? So it requires molybdenum. It's also called conventional pathway. The second pathway of nitrogen fixation is called vanadium pa dependent pathway or the first alternative pathway of nitrogen fixation. And the third pathway is molybdenum vanadium independent uh, uh, pathway. It means it does not require either molybdenum or vanadium to produce a functional nitrogenase. It just requires iron. So as a bacter 
species have three pathways of nitrogen fixation, and these seem to have evolved based on the uh, metal conditions in different soils globally. So the purpose of the project is to isolate uh, isolation of Acetobacter from the soil samples, identification of Acetobacter, and check if the isolate of Acetobacter can improve the crop yield uh, uh, in the laboratory conditions. So what we did, actually the soil samples were collected from the Department of Environmental, Scientists, Environmental Studies, University of Delhi. Isolation was done on Acetobacter specific nitrogen free Jensen media. We all, know, we all know that Jensen's media is commonly used to, to select Acetobacter species. And these isolates, uh, these isolates were grown at 28 degrees centigrade and colonies were observed for three, four days, three to five days. A total of 22 uh, um, different strains of Acetobacter species were isolated and they were small, sticky, translucent colonies. Isolates were purified on the, LB, on the Jensen's agar media for short-term storage and for the long-term storage, they were preserved at minus 80. So some of the colonies you cannot see here, but they are translucent colonies and they were further streaked for the single colony to, to obtain the isogenic cultures. As I said, sample one produced 21 colonies and sample two, 63, and number of translucent, translucent colonies were 10 and seven from the, from the two samples. So they were characterized uh, for being Acetobacter species based on uh, their morphology and the protocol was uh, followed according to the Burgess manual. They were checked for the gram staining, motility test, citrate utilization, and uh, utilization of the several carbon sources, urea utilization, and endo-3 acid, acid production. So several colonies during the process were were, were uh, eliminated because of the sh slow doubling time, not obtaining higher optical density uh, so that we have enough inoculum to inoculate different weeds and formation of pre uh, precipitation due to clumping of the cells and inability to maintain vitality of cells after several subculturing events under nitrogen-free conditions. As we know that starch hydrolysis test is very important because we know that starch uh, is the key and the major storage components in all grains of the cereals such as wheat. During seed germination, starch is hydrolyzed into glucose by an enzyme amylase, alpha amylase. Hence, the germination potential and the rate of cereal gra uh, grains are often tested through the hydrogen uh, through the hydrolysis of the starch by the alpha amylase. So these are some of the selected uh, isolates from Azotobacter species. Um, not all, we tested all of them, but I'm showing some of them. We showed a good alpha amylase activity as compared to the control. So these strains were later on tested uh, 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 in the, on, on the pod level, and the protocol I already described to you earlier. Isolate one, two, four, five, 21, and 22. They were tested, and you can see all, all the isolates enhance the uh, shoot growth of the wheat plants by various isolates. These are the same isolates after about 90 days, uh, 30 days, and this is the pattern it's been shown here, that all the isolates of Acetobacter outperformed the control with respect to height of the wheat plants. We uh, did some calculation. As you can see, isolate 21 outperformed not only control, but all other isolate with respect to the fresh weight of the shoot, root, inflorescence, as well as the dry weight of root and inflorescence. Here are the, uh, finally, uh, after the harvest, okay, this is the way influence look, looks like. Of all control, isolate one, two, five, and 11. 
We further tested uh, their statistics. Isolate 21 outperformed all the isolates with respect to total weight of the grain per plant and 50 grain of the weight and total number of grains per plant. So, so we also looked at the nitrogen content uh, of the rhizosphere, uh, total nitrogen in the leaves versus total nitrogen in the grains. It also clearly says that isolate one, 21 outperformed uh, almost all uh, isolate. Isolate one also seems to be doing equally good as compared to isolate one. When we go went ahead and uh, looked for the total phosphate content of acetal, uh, versus acetobacter species, inoculated with different isolates, here also you can see that uh, isolate 21 um, performed the best when we are talking about the total phosphate in the rhizosphere soil, total phosphate in the leaves, uh, total phosphate in the roots, and total phosphate in the grains uh, in the, as compared to the dry weight, when we are compared looking at the dry weight. We also looked at the photosynthetic activity, looking at the photosystem, uh, photo, photo, photosystem 2 activity, which clearly shows that all the isolate outperform the control. So we are also looking at the effect of these isolates on other crops such as uh, rice, corn, and sunflower. The results are very much similar to what we have discussed in the case of wheat. However, uh, some of the uh, out best performing isolates may not be the best performing isolates for the other crops, indicating that they may be the cross-specific uh, isolates. Different isotope, yeah. Different isotope to isolate outperform when comparing various growth parameters such as photosystem 2 activity and enrichment of the soil with respect to nitrogen and phosphorus. So the future plan is to perform the acetylene reduction assay, which mim mimics the nitrogen fixation activity uh, of uh, of the organism to see which one is out, which one is performing good uh, acetylene reduction assay and to perform the nitrogen uptake assay in a closed environment using N15. With this, I would like to thank you all for your attention. If you have any questions, please go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Umesh Bageshwar. It was a wonderful uh, lecture uh, because we are all now uh, like working at uh, achieving carbon neutral agriculture. So where you can manage the uh, carbon emissions or the consumption of fossil fuel. I think this will be a very good approach. Uh, so normally the interest of agriculture scientists are now going to the microbes because we say microbes give you answer to most of the problems in agriculture. Uh, so I think it will be a wonderful uh, interaction. So I think uh, you can permit two or three questions from the delegates. Sir, you have any like uh, studies with yeah. uh, with uh, different moisture levels as well as temperatures because uh, some. Uh, strains may not tolerate to the high temperature and the moisture stress. Yeah, we, we did the sowing of the wheat uh, actually with uh, co considering the uh, natural cycle of wheat around November month and we tested them all the way to 90 days, uh, maybe 105 days, that is the time. So basically we, we didn't worry about the temperature, uh, we sowed them in the wheat growing area and we, 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 we did the studies in the natural environment so that we follow the natural cycle of day and night and the moisture during the day and night cycle period. We did not get the moisture. Hello sir, uh, so uh, we we'll, uh, hear a lot of about the uh, biofertilizers including cyanobacteria and azotobacteria. So I was just wondering like uh, 
how effectively, because nitrogen will be fixed in this microbial biomass, so how effectively this usable nitrogen is transferred from this biomass to the plant? Well, these organisms live in the close by proximity of uh, the roots. We did uh, several microso microscopic studies where we showed these organisms live in the close proximity of the root. They do enhance, they produce IAA. And if the nitrogen is being produced in the close proximity of the uh, roots of the plant, they are easily being absorbed by, by the plant system. So they do not really leach out, out in the soil. It's a kind of a symbiotic relationship. Though it is a free living organism, you know. However, there is an undeclared symbiosis because the cell sap which is being produced a benefit uh, from each other's association. Uh, no, I think uh, what you said, it is not appropriate. Of course, it will not be retained in the bacteria. Because obviously, once you are talking about uh, ammonia, it may be diffused out. Even nitrate will also be diffused out. It's not that it is going to remain within bacteria. Okay. Uh, now, that is the place where we are basically looking for, you are you're right. When you're looking at the drop at ledgers, of course, this is the area which Government of India should promote. And of course, all the government across the world should uh, promote. Uh, for example, if you're looking into the Zezobacter species, it is also acting as a phosphorus fertilizing bacterium. Okay, what we are, we know, uh, we have enough phosphorus in the soil. But unfortunately, it is found in bond state. Fine? So, if it is... It is basically present in bond state, right? So only thing is this bacterium is doing something which is basically helping in solubilizing. When you are saying it is doing something means what is it doing? Does it release enzymes? No, it may not release enzymes. It might be just altering the physical chemical properties of that particular thing. Maybe it's something to do with pH. Okay, one very simple example. So it might be doing something else. We, at this stage, we are not very clear with what is the mechanism by which the phosphorus is basically being released. But as far as the other thing is concerned, I won't agree that it will be retained in the bacterium. It will be diffused out. Otherwise, that will die off. Excess of ammonia is going to disrupt its metabolism because it's going to disrupt uh, the electron transport. Right? So it will automatically diffuse out those particular things. Thank you all for your attention. Okay, I think we can continue the discussion during tea break. So, I thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for such an informative talk. Now, I invite chair of the session, Dr. Roy, for presenting the memento to Dr. Umesh Bhagwesha as a token of our gratitude. Sir, please. Just an announcement, please. Uh, immediately after this session, we'll have a poster presentation in the Botanical Garden. So if anybody has to put up the posters, has to go now. Anyway, they will be missing the session. But uh, we cannot avoid <laughs> because the poster has to be ready by the time we have to reach there. And you have to come back for the photo session in our guest house. That is more important. And if you miss the photo, you will not get a copy of the photo. Okay. <laughs> So now I think may I request our uh, uh, co-chair, Dr. Ashish, to introduce the speaker. Okay. Thank you all. And uh, first of all, it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. M. Vanaja, Maddi Vanaja. And Madam already she has asked some questions related to drought tolerance and physiological basis. So we can understand her experience is more than 31 years in the ICAR as principal scientist in plant physiology at CRIDA. And uh, she has been working in the area of climate change impact adaptation and vulnerability of rain fed ecosystem to climate change. And uh, uh, PI in a very uh, uh, national innovations in climate resilient agriculture. 
and as we know for climate change we require a state of art facility to study the multiple stress factors together so madam has been instrumental in developing uh, climate change research amenities in field environment as open top chambers free air temperature temperature enrichment system and ctgc carbon dioxide temperature gradient chamber facilities uh, with which we can have experiments or we can assess the impact of temperature co2 or moisture stress together in different rain fed crops she has visited a lab of professor bruce kimball at us water conservation laboratory usda arizona us then she has been working uh, worked in a, a uh, in a U world bank funded NAT natp rain fed agro ecosystem and uh, at a uh, Illinois University uh, at Illinois US uh, to understand design and ecosystem agro ecosystem of soy phase system is it is basically phase facility which is working on soya bean and she also visited Batsville Agriculture Research Center Maryland US for con uh, conducting experiments under controlled conditions she has uh, diff different different uh, more uh, uh, things are there in her name she has Uh, worked with uh, Professor Neil or R. Baker. If we know that somebody who has worked in the field of plant physiology on photosynthesis and response to elevated CO2, they may be knowing the name of uh, Professor Baker. So where she has worked with the elevated CO2 and drought combinations. Then uh, she has uh, she is also a, a fellow of Indian Society of Plant Physiology. And nine students completed PhD uh, degree under her guidance. and uh, she has several publications and many other uh, citations and h index is very high so with these few words i would invite uh, dr marwana ja ma'am uh, to give her lecture uh, as a lead lecture madam please thank you dr ashish and uh, respected chair and co-chair and uh, dignitaries of the dias and uh, my dear students actually from the morning you may be listening about the inner plant what happens in the within the plant but uh, i am taking you to a different world that uh, how we are going to face in the future with increased carbon dioxide and temperature so the chosen topic is individual and interactive effects of elevated temperature and carbon dioxide on physiological efficiency of c3 and c4 rain fed crops actually here i want to explain that there are three important things one is elevated temperature and carbon dioxide this is the main thing what we are going to face under the climate change situation and the second thing is c3 and c4 crops their response to these conditions are different and another one is the rain fed crops where the moisture deficit stress is an inbuilt so we have to understand this complicated interaction so for that uh, uh, initially I, because the uh, i mainly uh, intended to explain to the students because this type of seminars are like uh, introduction to them to the this type of topics and uh, some slides i have kept for their uh, understanding so uh, i am working at creda that is a icr institute where we are actually addressing the uh, rain fed agriculture ecosystem it is not only for the crops but also the moisture and also the nutrition so we total in totality we want to see that how best we can Uh, get a better crop per each drop 
So in that, uh, with that introduction, I wish to take you to the uh, climate change. Actually, uh, as I was mentioning temperature, so you are all aware that how it is showing that from 1950 to 2010, how the earth is actually uh, warming, like the temperatures are increasing. So this is the uh, yearly global temperatures from 1980 to 2021. Actually, they, uh, because whenever you say that there is an increase in temperature, first thing whether you, it is really increasing or if it is increasing, how much? That you have to quantify. So this is uh, from uh, NOAA and uh, the increase in the temperature was earlier was only 0.14 degree Fahrenheit or 0.08 degree centigrade. But now it is increasing at a faster rate. You all know that actually whenever you open a newspaper or uh, 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 actually see any news channel, the first thing they'll say that there is a flooding, there is a drought or there is some heat wave, cold wave, all those things are you are hearing. So that occurrence of these things are increasing over, uh, in recent times because of this particular actually increase in the temperature. And uh, I don't know how many of you know that RCPs, there are different RCPs. So they based on the representative concentration pathways, they made the projections by 2100. Because any preparation requires some time. Because when you understand that what happens in next 20 years, so whether the rainfall will increase, decrease, or temperature will increase, or uh, uh, what sort of carbon dioxide concentration is going to increase, how it is going to affect our ecosystem. Especially the, as an agriculture scientist, we want to see the, how it is going to impact the productivity, especially under the rain-fed situation. So the RCP 2.6, is the best possible, it, is, it should be the ideal. So where you can actually cut short all the carbon dioxide emissions, which is, which is uh, actually it is impossible to do with the present uh, actually uh, uh, lifestyles. Because the fossil fuel we are using, we can't cut down drastically. RCP 8, 8.5 is the actually high emissions. With the increased population, increased emissions, this will be the uh, concentration. This is uh, actually whatever the greenhouse gases. I am not going into deep into the greenhouse gases. Greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide. All together, uh, they will be quantified as carbon dioxide equivalent. So with that, uh, how the scenario will be by end of this century. So then Mauna Loa, they actually every month, or every day you can see the what is the carbon dioxide concentration. So it is for sure it is increasing, but the rate of increase is the concern. It is increasing, but uh, as it was mentioned that it already crossed 400 ppm and they recorded 440, uh, 14 ppm in 2000. And this actually, uh, you, you may be knowing that sea, sea water is the major sink for the carbon dioxide. So as the carbon dioxide concentration is increasing, its pH will uh, decrease, like it will become more acidic. So there is a 30% increase already was observed in the acidity. So this actually have impact on the flora as well as fauna of the uh, oceans. So the, uh, they have worked out how the decadal, because uh, any government has to take the steps. First of all, it should be quantified that what, uh, what is the uh, rate of carbon, carbon dioxide emission because majority of the emissions are from the fossil fuel burning. So uh, you can see that the decadal uh, increase for 10 years, it has gone up from 0 0.91 ppm per year to 2.43 from 20, uh, 2011 to 2020. And uh, you can see there is another uh, 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 graph where you can see there is a 350 ppm and 400 ppm. For students, you have to understand that 350 is the optimum, actually safe concentration for the earth. But already we crossed 400 ppm. 
350 ppm we already crossed in 1990 only. Now we have crossed even 400. That means we are already entered into the danger zone. That's what they want to show. So what are the projections? So how this carbon dioxide is going to increase by 2100 uh, uh, and methane and also nitrous oxide. So the carbon dioxide from uh, when you take the uh, 1990 as the base year, it is going to increase by two and a half times. So this way, you whether are you, because it is not the, as a plant physiologist, we feel that if carbon dioxide is increasing, it is useful for the photosynthesis. But for the atmospheric, this thing as a greenhouse gas, they are going to harm the uh, 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 environment by increasing the temperature. So what happens if one degree increase is there, two degrees increase is there, three degrees and five degrees. I think after five degrees, no living organism will be sustained on this planet Earth. So if one degree increase is there, not much impact will be there. But as the two, two to three degrees, crop yields are uh, actually expected to decrease. But there is some uh, positive aspect also where temperature is a limitation. These are all available in the NETMA. Uh, only I want to take you to the, my topic, so I am explaining all these things. So there, when there is like a high altitude or in temperate regions where the temperature is a limitation, that increased temperature is definitely going to actually improve the productivity of those crops. And another thing is the water and uh, extreme weather events. The concern is high intense rainfalls or floods, uh, heat waves, all these things are going to impact because their frequency is increasing. And uh, they have estimated, IPCC, you might have uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, they have estimated what will be the scenario in 2020, 2050 and 2080 based on their estimations. Because this much emissions will be there and this much warming will be there and this is the water availability in this region based on that they have estimated. So uh, based on that they, the governments need to because they are suggestive to the governments how best because the crops what we are growing. Uh, 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 ex uh, for example the spices in Kerala have international demand but with the increased temperature the spicy nature of your spices will be there or not. The productivity is anyway going down, but the quality, quality is also is a important, like basmati rice, whether the flavor will be there. So all these things, Darjeeling tea, all these things are concerned for the Indian government. So in Krida, actually we, uh, we have an agrometeorology group, they have uh, long-term weather data. So what they did, they actually assessed, uh, sorry, for the last 50 years, more than 50 years, how these uh, temperature trends are there over India. So they have found that in many areas it is increasing. Is, uh, you all know that temperature is a very location specific thing. Even though carbon dioxide is a, a global phenomena, whether you produce carbon dioxide in US or in Europe, India is also equally impacted. But temperature is again detected. Uh, determined by the your location, altitude, near to the water bodies, for, uh, forest cover, all those things. So this, uh, uh, they have, we have an agrometeorology uh, coordinating unit, so they have long term data sets. So based on that, uh, they have uh, quantified how the trends are there. But some areas they have shown decreasing and some areas there is no change. So based on that, the crops and cropping systems can be suggested to them. And when they have uh, actually analyzed the uh, rainfall data, because for rain fed crops, rainfall is also equally important. But there is no trend uh, they have found. But again, location specific, if you can see, yes, there is a difference in the rainfall uh, received in a particular uh, area. Overall India, it is not giving any trend. But in some areas it is increasing, in some areas it is decreasing. At the same time, uh, uh, drought years. So how the drought situation, is, whether it is moderate drought or severe drought, that also they have worked out. And another very important thing for the crops is the rain occurring during the crop growth period is very, very important. The number of rainy days and it is spread. 
because the uh, when it is going to flower and pot setting is there the rain moisture availability is very very important but what they have observed that the uh, rainfall during the september is decreasing in many areas and whereas in october it is increasing so this shift in the trends, rainfall trends is also going to influence the crop productivity based on that again you have to plan either a short duration or date of sowing or other management uh, uh, options and coming to the carbon dioxide so you all as a physiologist i need not to tell that the c3 and c4 are cam so how the the c3 is the basic uh, photosynthetic system but when it is uh, spatially uh, differentiated that is c4 because the co2 concentration mechanism was adapted by the c4 crops so the carbon dioxide increase is expected it will not improve the photosynthetic ability of the c4 crops and uh, actually when the temperature is increasing or carbon dioxide is increasing what are the positive impacts what are the negative impacts so improved actually majority of our agriculture crops are c3 crops like rice wheat in the cereals and also all the pulse crops oil seed crops they are all c3 so when the carbon dioxide is increased definitely they are going to have higher photosynthetic rate so thereby we can have and uh, at the same time the carbon dioxide has other physiological uh, response that it will close partially closes the stomata thereby reduces the uh, transpiration so water use efficiency will improve so this will actually help the uh, especially the rain fed crops so that is and increased productivity from um, as i was mentioning like decrease uh, the negative impacts are also uh, drought and floods are increasing to, uh, so that that will cause the damage to the crop and also heat, heat and cold waves and also there is a expectation of pests and certain pests and diseases will be more or new pests will uh, have uh, and uh, new weeds outbreak of invasive weeds that that is also is expected and the efficacy of uh, even herbicide or pesticide is also expected to be low so coming to the topic the agriculture production depends on crop variety because the variety what you are taking and also the temperature resign where you are working and also the water availability and the management crop management all this will reflect in the final productivity and each crop has different temperature threshold for each phenological as a physiologist you know that uh, for each phenology the requirement of thermal units are different and the individual component effects are if you work with only temperature the effects will be different if you work with only moisture stress the impacts will be different if you work with only co2 the impacts will be but when you work in a combination but in nature these will happen in combination so this to have the impact studies uh, at creda and also because there is one uh, uh, icr level network project was initiated and uh, creda is the lead center for that so we are working not only for the crops horticulture crops annual crops horticulture crops animal husbandry fisheries and also the water bodies and soil all these things were addressed in that program and uh, our group was involved with the uh, agriculture crops of rain fed so to conduct or uh, because to mimic the future conditions we need to have a uh, fa uh, have facilities which would which should not have major errors because co2 uh, studies are not new there i think uh, from uh, 60s 70s also you have seen that main, many papers on impact of high co2 on different aspects of physiological parameters but to mimic because when you do the experiment in the lab under growth chamber conditions you are using the artificial light and growing the plant in very artificial way so to have a natural system we constructed that open top chambers here the polythin sheet will be there and they are open from the top so the uh, co2 will be exchanged moist uh, the rh relative humidity will not be build up and the crops can be sown in the field, under field condition and this is another facility this is free air carbon, uh, temperature elevation and along with that we have even co2 temperature and co2 this is called fate with co2 facility 
this is the actually uh, the system where we are increasing sorry we are increasing the temperature by 3 degrees with the uh, uh, infrared heaters and also we have 3 degrees temperature plus carbon dioxide 550 ppm carbon dioxide and we have ctgc facility the carbon dioxide and temperature gradient facility where you can have both temperature gradient of 5 degrees and also carbon dioxide of 550 ppm so the structure will be like uh, it is 30 meters length so in this 30 meters length you will have plus 1 to plus 5 degrees and uh, the uh, width of this is 6 meters and height is 4 meters and here we have uh, all the four treatments like ambient without any change in the temperature and carbon dioxide carbon dioxide of 550 temperature 1 to plus 1 to plus 5 degrees and another is plus 5 to uh, plus CO2. So, these facilities are at CREDA and also in other places like IHR and uh, uh, ICR, NEH, Baramad. The initial work we, start, uh, we uh, uh, actually evaluated different rain fed crops and we found that all these crops are actually showing good response to the CO2. Then we have actually we want to see that what is the impact on total biomass, seed yield and harvest index. Why? Because if it is increasing the total biomass, whether the increased total biomass is translated into the economic component. Initially, we worked with both 550 and 700 ppm and what we could see that uh, in sorghum, this particular table shows that the particular variety. So, in my next slides, I will say that even in maize, how the variability within the genotype and pearl millet also where is the, uh, there is a variable. So, like that in cereal crops, you can see the, there is a uh, response of 1.3 percent increase to 26 percent increase in the total biomass at 550 and uh, what we could see that the uh, carbon dioxide concentration increased from 550 to 700. These uh, re response studies were conducted under optimum moisture conditions, N there is no drought. Uh, whereas the seed yield improvement is also 1.2 to 17 percent and uh, of course in, in maize it is even though the uh, yield response is low and that's why the even the uh, harvest index improvement is also negative like that means the response is more of vegetative biomass than the yield. So then pulse crops actually the interesting point is that pulse crops have shown very high response. One is that they are indeterminate nature, like if moisture is available or favorable conditions are there, they will give new flushes of flowers or flower to pod set. That is very, very important in pulse crops. That is uh, actually promoted by the elevated CO2. And oil seed crops, again this uh, groundnut is again leguminous crop and also sunflower. We have seen that the response is high, but the harvest index is not. The, the response is equally for both vegetative and reproductive biomass. And uh, uh, again, I want to sh share with you that when carbon dioxide was given, the leaf size increases, especially when you are working with the cropping systems, uh, when you have to think about the intercrops, this bigger leaf size uh, definitely going to have the shade effects. So you have to think about and what we could see that even the greenness of the leaf is increasing. So that is also we have observed and uh, the phenology, the next comes the phenology and uh, castor, it is a very actually uh, exciting result we got with the uh, castor that castor is a monoecious crop. I think botany students you understand the monoecious where male and female flowers are on the same plant spike. So when any uh, abiotic stress is there, the spike becomes more of maleness. But when good food is available, the uh, uh, flowering will be more of female. So when we grow the uh, castor under elevated CO2, we could observe that uh, all the spike became the female and it was very early. You can see the, on the same day, this elevated CO2 concentration has given more uh, female flowers and flowering was also very early. And uh, of course, in uh, uh, maize, again, it has anthers and silk. Anthers are male component, silk is the female component. 
so the uh, anthers is silking will be at different durations like anthers will come protandry so it will come first and then female or uh, organs will come later so the uh, duration between these two events is very crucial for the pollen availability as it increases the pollen availability for the silk to fertilize will reduce so thereby you might have seen that sometimes you will see the cobs but hardly you can see the uh, seed on that because the pollen availability was not there for fertilization of all the uh, stigma because it's a bunch of silk is nothing but it's a bunch of stigma so the stigma uh, receptivity will be uh, lost because of high temperature so in elevated co2 what we have seen that uh, anthesis a is stands for anthesis and uh, uh, s for silk so anthesis silking they got reduced both got reduced uh, it is not same for all the genotypes in harsha and uh, anthesis is not Im impacted but silk became early so in this way what we could see that there is a genotypic variability in the response of even though it is a c4 crop the response is different for the co2 in the same way pigeon pea it's again c3 pulse crop we, uh, we have taken that extra short to medium duration uh, lines these are different uh, duration lines in all the uh, uh, varieties what we could see that it has uh, actually early early only this i am talking about the co2 and uh, coming to the photosynthesis so in maize what we could see that the it, for our surprise the photosynthesis is also increasing uh, in some of the genotypes and transpiration is decreasing thereby you can see the water use efficiency is increasing so that it is very important for a, a scientist for a working in rain fed system so if per unit water if it is able to sustain for longer period drought conditions it can face a drought situation so you can see that in first genotype the photosynthetic rate is increasing but the transpiration is also not that much reduced so the, the, thereby water use efficiency is not there. but in third genotype you can see the photosynthetic rate is not increasing that much but transpiration is re decreasing thereby water use efficiency is very high in the same way in pigeon pea genotypes also we could see that there is a variability within the genotypes thereby the water use efficiency is also so the the contribution of improved water use efficiency is maybe due to improved photosynthesis under co2 or reduced transpiration this is also very important because what we could observe that there is uh, co2 also improves the root biomass root proliferation so if a plant has good root system it can excavate more volume of soil and it can sustain and also it produce more sugars especially in c3 thereby it can uh, it capacity to hold the uh, plant water uh, water it will be more so it can actually sustain for longer uh, dry spells and coming to the light uh, light response curves in maize in general what we have seen even though the uh, term, uh, uh, light uh, intensity is increasing the photosynthetic rate is increasing not that high it is similar to all all the light intensities but in c3 sunflower and c3 pulse crops it is showing very high response this also we have recorded and of course in maize again maize genotypes you can see the uh, dhm117 where even at 700 ppm there is a high at high light intensities we could see there is an increase whereas in other genotypes it is not and whereas in harsha uh, uh, rather it is decreasing so this actually uh, i want to show the impact of co2 on the final uh, expression either total biomass or the yield what we have seen that the total biomass is increasing but the vegetative biomass is not increasing in harsha and it is increasing the more of uh, yield so this is very very important actually whatever the uh, higher biomass is accumulated it is proportioning to towards the seed yield and uh, of course as i was mentioning in pulse crops the increase the pod number is the uh, major concern because uh, flowers it will produce but flower to pod set is another very important thing and uh, it, there is a variability within the genotypes and uh, that reflected in the yield 
So the yield realization, whatever the yield improvement is there, it is due to the improved pod number and as well as seed number. And uh, there is one experiment we conducted that how the plant uh, producing flowers and pods and we concluded that it is a better pod set which is contributing uh, under the elevated CO2. And another thing we, what we have observed when we are working with OTCs, we are working at different seasons. In one season, like when temperatures are uh, less than 40 degrees, like uh, in winter it is 13 to 24 degrees, where the response is different and the temperatures going beyond 40 degrees, the response of CO2 is different. So this is also, and also we have seen that five, at 550 ppm and 700 ppm, even the response is different. The genotypes which are not actually uh, showing uh, any positive response in summer, uh, at 550, they are able to show better response at 700 ppm. This is for biomass and this is the yield. So there is a variability within the genotypes because these genotypes we obtained from NPPGR and uh, they are collected from different locations. So their temperature optima is different for uh, uh, growth. So that is actually impacting their uh, biomass as well as seed yield. And also we have uh, seen that in groundnut, actually oil content, uh, oil quality parameters, what we have seen that oil content is uh, increasing. It is uh, slightly improving from 45.3 to 47.7 with 700 ppm. Whereas total sugars are reduced, it is not impacting that much the protein. Because uh, with elevated CO2, there is a, a, a actually concept that the carbon content is increasing by reducing the nitrogen. So the, that we haven't seen in the uh, seed of nitrogen, uh, groundnut. Of course, in uh, castor, we have seen the resinolic acid, which is a very important uh, and uh, high uh, commercial value uh, fatty acid. It is slightly decreasing, though the yield improvement is very high, but the resinolic acid, the quality aspect also very important for the uh, commercial crops. And what we have seen, the response of uh, elevated CO2 was higher when the moisture stress was there, even in C4 crops like maize. So when you give the moisture, of course, oh, sorry. Uh, so as I was mentioning in C3 and C4 crop, the C4 crop, even the maize, the reduction was 60, uh, like 13 percent uh, uh, for the root length, but there is an improvement of 39 percent. We could see that the uh, root length was increased and the root volume and the, the root parameters had showed less reduction with the elevated CO2. Of course, we, this we expected in C3, but in C4 also we have seen and the dry weight, total dry weight uh, and also the root shoot ratio, it has shown that the, the C4 crops also showed better response when moisture stress and carbon dioxide. And this is the fate facility uh, where we are conducting experiments uh, with uh, uh, different crops like maize and as I was mentioning anthesis silking interval. That is very, very important for the uh, final product like pollination. So when only temperature, here we have two uh, uh, treatments, only temperature uh, with elevated temperature, elevated carbon dioxide. So in future, we are expecting elevated temperature as well as elevated carbon dioxide. Elevated temperature work will actually give us clues that where at present where these uh, uh, genotypes can fit. Because in India, you have all temperate to tropical uh, situations. So the temperature regimes are different. So that will actually, we can see that DHM117, <coughs> only temperature increase actually improved, increase the ASI. That is around 2.3 days to 4.3 days, like DHM. Whereas in uh, uh, NK6240, there is another genotype. It is not showing any effect with the temperature, but CO2 has decreased. In 900M gold, this is also Monsanto uh, released hybrid, it has shown the temperature has some positive effect because it has what we could see that it has a high temperature optima. Then actually when you uh, uh, quantify the impact, so how much decrease 
we can uh, we have recorded with the different genotypes i am saying that uh, the c4 crop even though the maize is c4 crop the photosynthetic rate was improved i can i can say that there is a decrease with the high temperature of 21% to it has come down to 3.8% so it is actually uh, ameliorating actually it is protecting the even photosynthesis and also the uh, of course water use efficiency you can see clearly the water use efficiency is increased because it is more of protecting the photosynthesis that reflected in this so in the same way the biomass and also the grain yield you can see the grain yield uh, increase or decrease uh, it is uh, again uh, dependent on the uh, variety and also the uh, you can see that with the temp uh, with a high temperature as well as co2 it has come down uh, like uh, the uh, reduction has come down then coming to the pigeon pea the pigeon pea you know that it is a bit long duration pulse crop and uh, to our surprise what we have seen only temperature increase it has increased the uh, days to 50% flowering. Usually, in other crops, what we can expect that when you increase, the plant try to complete its life cycle fast. But what we have observed that when you increase the temperature, it is increasing the number of days for the 50% flowering. Because what, what we could understand, it is a perennial nature crop. So, in, usually in perennial crops or tree crops, the increased temperature make the plant to prepare itself to uh, face that harsh environment, then it will start giving the reproductive components. So that we have seen with the pigeon pea. Of course, with the, uh, even CO2 also, we have recorded it is again is showing slight increase. Of course, the being a C3, what we have seen, the temperature, with the temperature, the photosynthetic rate is decreasing, but uh, with the CO2, it is better than the uh, ambient condition. So, it is completely nullifying the temperature effects and uh, further improving the photosynthetic rate and uh, of course that uh, transpiration rate also decreasing so thereby it is it is giving higher water use efficiency of the plant so what the impact on the biomass and yield components you can see the the blue ones are the uh, reduction due to temperature and the reduction due to the uh, temperature plus co2 so, in the presence of CO2, you can see the pod number has increased than the ambient one. The, uh, whereas the reduction was completely or the mostly uh, nullified. So, this is the ameliorative capacity. So, what we could observe that CO2 is protecting more of reproductive components in this uh, pulse crops. And we have conducted experiments with our CTGC also. And uh, we have shown uh, different Blagram genotypes from gradient. And we, what we have seen that with the only CO2, what is the impact? And uh, ET1 means plus 1.5 degrees, and ET2 is 3 degrees, and ET3 is 4.5 degrees. So under this situation, because uh, every time people will ask that how much CO2 impact will be there uh, when the temperature increase by 3 degrees, 5 degrees, 2 degrees like that. So when we have to quantify that, then we have uh, grown the crop in uh, uh, CTGC and we, we have seen that with the temperature alone, what is the impact and uh, in the combination, what is the impact? Whether it is protecting at uh, 1.5 degrees, to, uh, 3 degrees and 4.5. And you can see with 3 degree, uh, 4.5 degrees, majority of the yield components gone down. Uh, so, the same thing, uh, because the seed filling, 100 seed weight has uh, gone down because seed number is maintained but the seed filling is affected. Here what we could see that as the temperature is increasing, the filling of the seed is uh, not happening. And also the pulp, pearl millet, which is again a C4 crop and uh, the interesting point what we have observed that the number of tillers actually the, with the CO2 are only temperature the tillers are decreasing whereas with the combination tiller number is increasing so this is very interesting observation we made actually uh, pearl millet has the capability to produce more tillers so that is enhanced by the temperature and co2 so that 
uh, you can see the photograph and uh, the number of uh, even cops are also increased but they are not fertile. So they could not fill the seed because it requires a different management. So that is uh, actually we are looking for. Of course, the groundnut crop. The groundnut is again very uh, oil, edible oil yielding crop and also the uh, actually it's a leguminous crop. What we have seen that the uh, being a C3 and a leguminous crop, it is completely nullified with the CO2. That biomass is completely uh, recovered and also the pod number, reduction in pod number was uh, less and the 100 seed weight, all these things were recovered. So, but what we want to see that even the oil yield and oil quality. So, the oil yield gone down with the elevated temperature, but with CO2, only few genotypes have able to recover up to the ambient. Even the oil yield has gone down. Yield means complete oil per, uh, per plant. So, that is not there. And then coming to the quality aspect. For heart patients, they will say that O by L ratio. Oleic acid uh, to linoleic acid ratio is very important. So, to our surprise, actually oleic acid content is increasing especially in three genotypes what we have seen with elevated CO2, it is increasing. So thereby the OL ratio was increased very, more than 1.4. That is very good. So this is my observations with uh, uh, experiments. So I need not to read the, uh, this thing. And I am very fortunate to visit uh, Illinois and where I met uh, uh, Professor Govindji. And uh, he took me to his lab and we took a photograph. And I wish him very healthy, li uh, long life. Uh, thank you very much. And I, I immensely thank the organizers, uh, both uh, Dr. Jose and uh, uh, ISPP secretary, uh, madam, and uh, for inviting me to deliver my work. Thank you very much, one and all. Thank you, ma'am. So already Madam has explained many things uh, related to means climate change impact uh, assessment on crops and uh, ranging from C3 to C4 crops and how field simulation experiments are being done across India and how for rain fed crops CREDA has been doing and uh, uh, we have seen that means uh, new information also we have collected like groundnut is not having dilution effect of this one in the seeds and even phenology is being affected. Uh, somewhere we found that even temperature increase uh, affects the uh, phenology. Then ameliorative effect of elevated CO2 on pigeon pea and permeate different crops we have seen in the, from the feed experiments in feed label. So altogether it is a very it means uh, informative for all the students as well as researchers who have been working in this same field. Madam, I have only one question regarding a query, small query, whether that temperature increase in fate system or in CTGC, we are taking uh, daytime temperature and nighttime both into consideration? Yeah, actually in fate we are, uh, we have IR sensors, so it will take the crop canopy temperature. So we have an ambient control and it will take the cam uh, canopy temperature of ambient and then 3 degrees above. In CTGC, the, we have uh, ambient reference is the atmospheric temperature. So throughout uh, 24 into 7, okay. we are increasing that temperature and CO2 is also, uh, we are maintaining at that uh, 24 into 7. Okay, okay. So whether we have separated out nighttime effect of warming means like... Uh, no, actually that sort of one project we are dealing okay, with the nighttime okay. uh, because nighttime respiration, because uh -huh. the nighttime respiration will... Uh, take the uh, daytime photosynthetic fixation. Yes, so yes, yes. that sort of experiments also we have uh, conducted in a growth chamber studies, not in the FATE or CTGC. Okay, uh, okay. And we have found that because the nighttime temperature will uh, you utilize all the extra yeah, reserves, yes, whatever yes, yes. Uh, uh, it is produced. So that is having other ill effects. That also we have quantified. Okay, thank you. Some other questions from the house uh, if we can have, please. Ma'am, uh, not a question, it's a, just a query. Can because, you introduce yourself, sir? Yeah, I'm Dr. Yogesh Misra from Banaras Hindu University. Okay. Uh, Department of Botany. Ma'am, uh, 
हेलो वेन यू गो फॉर द फील्ड लिस्ट सॉरी आई एम आई कुड नॉट हियर हेलो कैन सो वेन यू ग्रो no audience may not able to catch hello uh, ma'am uh, when you grow the crops in the field how you manage to fix the soil properties because the impact what we are seeing uh, because of change in temperature or co2 as per your uh, suggestion or as per your observation as the audience are at a person who is doing the research in a growth chamber how why i should trust that all the soil properties kept the same in the all the experimental things if it is the case then how you manage it yeah actually we have a multidisciplinary team we have a soil scientist microbiologist who is working actually how the microbial uh, combinations are changing and how the soil properties even including mineralization of n and other things we are working on all those things because the uh, Uh, whatever i have presented it is in the, under the optimum moisture conditions so they have what they have seen that the because of uh, high growth pattern under especially under co2 the uh, excavation of more uh, nutrients will be there so when you are growing crop after the crop so the uh, even the soil physical both chemical properties they are working on actually uh, haven't presented all those things but uh, even the nutrition scientist is working on our That's products so the, the sh that she claims that the, the zinc uh, absorption or zinc partitioning into the uh, seed is low so the zinc deficiency will be there in future so all these things are there and an entomologist is also working and how the pest and uh, even the uh, pest and diseases will be occurring because our entomologist is saying that your uh, elevated co2 grown leaves are very turgid juicy sugary and uh, having less uh, nitrogen than more carbon so the leaf eaters are damaging more so that also we, we have published all those things sir. so these are uh, because i can't cover many things in one go so what i have as a physiology group i thought this is this will be sufficient yes your point is very valid sir. thank you ma'am we can have discussion at tea time because uh, we are already learning little bit late okay. uh, so we will just have a discussion in I tea time i think one more question is yes. there from that professor uh. yeah please yes, yes sir yes ma'am it was very excellent talk and thank you a lot of data a lot of uh, outstanding facilities you have created for the community to use and i hope you will let the other researchers to use the facilities yes sir that how the science will grow as uh, hats off to you but my question I, i you partly answered my question uh, uh, because uh, you showed that under this uh, elevated co2 and temperature there is a lot of changes uh, physiologic uh, 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 morphologically as well inside i'm i'm sure you have done the physiological changes and uh, analysis lot of these uh, uh, 50% increase in flower and number of tillers increase so that means there is a lot of change in the resource to sink allocations yes, carbon yes. nitrogen allocations are definitely affected so how much is the impact on the nutritional value of the those crops you you talk about zinc yeah. but what about the overall other nutritional values like proteins and uh, uh, oils and uh, 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 and other nutrients essential nutrients actually even my uh, animal scientist is working the fodder digestibility sir actually they are working on how the uh, co2 or temperature grown Uh, fodder is whether it is digestible or what is the uh, protein uh, content all those things they are working because as a physiologist i am uh, basically looking looking for the only the response and how the even though we have done some osmotic stress uh, related parameters i haven't presented sir because of time whatever time i have allotted so to cover that and uh, because to introduce this topic to the uh, students especially i am interested to introduce this topic so we are addressing because it is a part of a national climate change program so the there is an expert committee and uh, uh, members are that uh, national level they will be scrutinizing our re research so they are suggesting and we are uh, definitely we are addressing all those things sir thank you
Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am, for an informative lecture. Now I invite co-chair Dr. Ashish K to present the memento to Dr. Maddie Vanaja. Sir, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. And thank you, Professor Radha Krishnan, for effectively handling the technical session. I would like to invite you to present the mementos to Dr. Roy Stephen, chair of the session. Sir, please. Dr. Ashish K. Chaturvedi, co-chair of the session. <laughs> Dr. Sopna K. S., the session rapporteur. There are some uh, important, yeah, after this. There Thank are some, you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. There are some important announcements to be made. Uh, right now, we will uh, move to the guest house just uh, behind this uh, for photo session. And uh, we have asked the poster people also to come over there. So we'll have all together just uh, 10 minutes. Then uh, after that, tea is arranged in the botanical garden. That is a small trick to take you to the garden, so that all <laughs> of you move into the garden. And it's a walkable distance only. Just outside the guest house, a gate is open, and uh, the whole day we were sitting inside, so it is better to have some walk also in between. And after the poster, you have an opportunity to move around the garden. It is 20 acres. So maybe you may take long time, but uh, it is up, up to you. Then uh, 5.30 to 6.30, our department is open and waiting for you. You can see the department and uh, visit our labs. And if you want to meet somebody and uh, chalk out some collaborations, you are uh, welcome for that. Then 7 o'clock, we will have the birthday celebrations of uh, Govindji over here. So by 7, we have to be here and it will be online. So he will be just watching that and we will be eating the cake here. And uh, after that he will be presenting and uh, at 8 we will be having the cultural program. So this is the schedule what we have ahead. So please uh, move to the uh, guest house area and we will have the photo session. Thank you. 
ഇതിന്റെ പരസ്യമാണ് മേ ഇത് 
അത്യാവശ്യം
May the good Lord bless you. May the good Lord bless you. May the good Lord bless you. Professor Govindji, Namaskaram. Namaskaram. This is Professor Om Prakash Dankar from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. I met you uh, several times at uh, JNU with uh, Aswini Parikh. Yes. And, yes, and um, uh, Madam was also there, and I hope she is yes, uh, recovering she well. Yeah. So, wish you a very, very happy birthday, and uh, wish you a long life, at least one more decade, yeah. and long <laughs> live. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. So, okay, then uh, I think we can start the session. In between, uh, we will enjoy your cake.
Is that fine? Okay. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. <coughs> I certainly like the T-shirt with the Z scheme. One we will send to you. Oh, that would be nice. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you can keep it. Maybe I'll come. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Hopefully, we will expect that. Yeah. It's very nice. Uh, the slides will be put up from your side or uh, from… Okay, it's, it will be put up from here. Yeah, I sent the slides. Yeah, it's ready, it's ready. <clears throat> so, when you want me to speak, I will start. Yeah. It's fine. You, no. you may start. All right. So what I'm going to do today uh, is tell you about my journey and uh, basically a research journey from my hometown, Allahabad, to Urbana, Illinois. And as I, what I did is I wrote things down so that I don't forget. So I'm highly grateful to the University of Calicut, Kerala and the Indian Society of Plant Physiology for this invitation to me to share some of my thoughts on my journey from India to USA. My special thanks go to Professor Josh Kutur, who we just saw in a minute ago, for his wonderful encouragement and for me to be here with you by Zoom. And what I want to add is the cake was great. I, could taste it in my mouth. <laughs> and thank you. And next slide, please. So, somebody will move the slide, I guess. Or do I have to move it? I don't know. Okay. So, next slide, please. All right. So, I, I, I want to first, before I start my talk, I want to remember my own students who are no more. The first one was Carl Sederstrand, who did beautiful work with me and with Eugene Rabinovich, who was also my professor. Then, and I have arranged them according to their date of year of birth, and not the year they were with me. Then was next my very dear student, Prasanna Mohanty, who had come from Orissa, and he was really a soul, a great soul, a wonderful friend to all here in the USA as well as in India. Then was George Papa Giorgio, Papa Giorgio uh, from Greece, and he did the first chlorophyll fluorescence work showing its importance to photosynthesis. And then was, as I said, then means in the year world, uh, Fred Cho who was the first one to make measurements of photos, fluorescence down to liquid helium temperature. Then came Mari Bazaz from Iraq, and she did wonderful work in separating bundle sheet and mesophyll chloroplasts and looking at the C3 and C4 photosynthesis long before others did. And the last one, one of the dearest of all, was Tom Wierzynski, who came from Australia. So with this, I move to the next slide. So what is where in Allahabad? Well, Allahabad is my dearest town and the Department of Botany and the, on, the, on the left bottom, I don't know. If, uh, you can see my arrow or not, I don't know. Can you see the arrow? It's, no. not, it's not seen. All right, so I won't bother with arrow. So uh, I will just say where it is. So the left bottom is the gate of the botany department, and the top is the Senate House, and on the right on the top is the Muir College, <laughs> it's called then, and uh, on the top, uh, in the central, I would say, and the very right is a, is a road, or rather the lane 
that led to the botany department. And I, we spent many years there uh, till 1956. And this is a great memory for me. Next slide, please. And from there, uh, actually there was a very important training that I received in the laboratory of Professor Sri Ranjan, who had come from England, uh, having worked with Felix Frost Blackman, which we know as the Blackman reaction, the dark reaction, the CO2 fixation reaction. But we were not working on that. We were trying to study for fun, basically. And none of us were doing PhD thesis on this. Is the effect of virus infection on different types of plants that were going all, all around Allahabad. And in that, we had three other friends. I'm sitting in the extreme right in the picture, on the left side of the picture. I had black hair, as you can see, a very thin guy. And next to me is my dearest friend, Manmohan Laloria, who was my classmate since class fourth. And then after that is Rajni Verma, then called Rajni Verma, who later was my wife uh, in 1957. And then in front on the, is Raja Rao, Tadimati Raja Rao. Raja Rao passed away, and I dedicate this slide to him. And he was one of the most important persons to tell us how you can make many, many, many samples in the same how to do a radial cut. Uh, and we could do 16 samples at the same time, and we can run different amino acids, different treatments. And here I show you one of the papers uh, which published with Laloria, myself, Rajni and Rajarao together, uh, showing how the Karika papaya leaves uh, change, how the amino acids change and so on. And one of our papers with Laloria and myself was published in Nature from this, from this work. Uh, but this was just a fun thing and the side thing. Next slide, please. And so how did I get interested in photosynthesis? <coughs> Excuse me. So my interest began when I was secretary of the Botanical Society at Allahabad University. And I'd organized what I call a mock symposium in, in which we students played the role of all the discoverers of photosynthesis. We dressed up as we thought they, they may be wearing. And my friend, K.S. Bill Grammy, uh, wore a huge top coat. I remember him very well. Uh, I also uh, remember his memory. He was a very good friend. And this remains, this if fun even remains alive in my mind even today, uh, because this was the beginning of my interest in photosynthesis. Next slide, please. So, well, that was okay. But then Sri Ranjan, my professor, or our professor, uh, asked us to go to the library. And he would say, you boys, go, go, go to the library <laughs> and find something that you are interested in. So I went to the library and studied a lot of papers and read a paper of Robert Emerson with Charleston Lewis in 1943 paper. And after reading that paper, I was totally baffled by that paper because he said that when light is absorbed in the far red region by chlorophyll A, uh, there is no photosynthesis. There's bad photo. So this was really the baffling thing that Emerson had discovered. And I decided then to write a paper uh, rather not a paper, a term paper, as we call it here in USA, and role of chlorophyll in photosynthesis. And I kept on it and on it. And then right after my MSc, when I would lecture to my class, I taught two years at Allahabad University. When I lecture to the class, and I would talk about Emerson's red drop, means there was a drop where chlorophyll A was the only absorbing pigment. And he, and Emerson's non-convincing, unconvincing, I would say, explanation would crop up and it constantly haunted me. Next slide, please. So during 1955, I had my MSc in 1954, I wrote my first letter using what was called an aerogram. I hope some of the older people in the audience may remember that. 
We wrote, I wrote a letter to Robert Emerson. He was called Bob in USA, but we in India referred to him. I wrote to him a dear professor, Robert Emerson. So I received an encouraging reply right away because I talk about the red drop. And I said, dear Professor Emerson, I don't understand it. So I received very quickly. Then he wrote to me to apply to UYUC University of Illinois to, for fellowship and also asked me to apply for Fulbright travel grant. And I did, and I got both of them. And that time when I reached there, I discovered that he was actually discovering to find out the source of this dilemma that had bothered me, the red drop. And Emerson then, while I was here, published the first paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. And that was the discovery of what is now known as the Emerson enhancement effect. Next slide, please. So this is just a picture. Uh, I went by train. These are fake pictures. They're not the real ship or not the real train or the real car. But I just to tell you, I went by train from Malabar to Bombay and from Bombay to Southampton or wherever, wherever in England by, by ship. Uh, no, no, excuse me. I made a mistake. I went by plane, uh, by plane from Bombay to London and then from London. Uh, with Southampton in England by ship to New York. And then, then again by train, I don't have all these pictures, and again by train to, to Ur Urbana, Illinois. And in Urbana, Illinois, I was received by Robert Emerson himself in his Mercedes Benz car because he loved anything that was German. <laughs> he, he thought they made the best things. So we came to Urbana, Illinois, and I was taken to what is called the Natural History Building, which is on the left bottom, the red building, and to his lab, to show the lab on the right, his monochromatron. And then afterwards, the rest is research story. Next slide, please. So, the red drop. So if you see the right, Emerson is sitting, and he had no office. It was just a desk. And this is a picture that I took at that time. So what is the red drop? So you, you plot on the wavelength on the, on the bottom, and you plot the quantum meal of oxygen evolution. So if light is absorbed less than less photosynthesis, divide one by the other, you should get a high number. And so the high number was there only from 560 nanometer to, let's say, 680 nanometer. Then there was a big drop. And on the left, uh, the, the, the drop is because the yellow pigment carotenoids do not. Anyway, I should not be giving a lecture on photosynthesis, but just to, I should move on. So this was the red drop I mentioned earlier, which had baffled me. Next slide, please. So what is the Emerson enhancement effect? So now you get two lights together and you measure uh, the, when you give two lights separately, and then you give two lights together, and you find that when you give the two lights together, you have much more photosynthesis than the sum of the lights given separately. So that is the Emerson effect. So the quantum yield from here, I, I, you can see my finger, from the bottom at 700 jumps up to the high level. And so this is the same slide I made it on the right, so you can see more easily, correctly, uh, to take care of what I call the Warburg effect, of the effect of light on respiration, which is corrected here. So still you have the big jump, and that is the Emerson enhancement effect. Next slide, please. So Emerson died in a plane crash in February 4, 1959, going from Chicago, I believe, uh, to Boston, uh, because he was in the uh, Harvard um, top level committees, and he had discovered and discovered, as I just said, Emerson effect. What is that? Well, on the right side, the first paper was presented by him in Bloomington, Indiana, and he's sitting here, as you can see, and his assistant Ruth Chalmers is sitting, and then Rajni is sitting on his left. What is the Emerson effect? 
So he made the action spectrum of the second spec. He discovered uh, in red algae at the top, you see the four graphs, the one on the extreme right top is the chlorella, the green alga. And he found the chlorophyll B was responsible for the enhancement. Then he took cyanobacteria and sort of phycocyanin was responsible. Fucoxanthol was responsible for diatoms and red algae phycoris. So the, he said one light reaction is run by one of the accessory pigments and the other is run by chlorophyll A. So this was the discovery, it was never published. It was only presented at a meeting where we, you can see where we were there. Next slide, please. I'm, I'm taking too long, I hope. I will be given extra time. <laughs> so now he dies, what do you do? What do I do? Uh, I thought I'd come back to India, but Rabinovas put his hand on my shoulder and Rajni's shoulder. Uh, by the way, we were married uh, in 1957 here in Urbana, Illinois, uh, October 24, 1957. And so we, uh, he said, Govindji, Rajni, do whatever you're doing with Bob, he said. So we continued with him. And so instead of just chlorophyll B in chlorella, I discovered chlorophyll A also in the same system in the diatom. So it became clear that both systems were run by chlorophyll, but different spectral forms. And that was studied by Carl Strand uh, through spectroscopy. Uh, so this is the discovery of chlorophyll A. It was published in Science with Rabinovich. Next slide, please. So now the question was, uh, is this true still? Is it, is it really in photosynthesis? Or it is due to, as Otto Warburg had said, in respiration. So Rajni did a very crucial and most important experiment on that. So she used chlorella cells and put benzoquinone, like Warburg has said before, that it kills respiration. So there, there is the graph on the left. I'm sorry, there's no way for me to say. I hope you can see on the left on the white background, you have chlorophyll. Uh, she used the chlorella cells. So you have the chlorophyll B as well as chlorophyll A band. And, and <laughs> this picture of with Rabinovich is after our wedding in 1957, Rabinovich saying, <laughs> I am taller than Rajni, but he was not. Uh, okay, so we both went uh, to Europe to present our work in Sweden in 1961. And here we are sitting on the bottom with Rabinovich, who was fluent in reading and writing any language in the world. That's re he reading Swedish newspaper. Next slide, please. So we are done with the thesis. Then after many, 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 many years, I saw the Z scheme, people wearing a Z scheme has been since 1960. So we had a paper in 2007 with one of persons who does a be beautiful drawing and arrangement. His name is Dima Shavela. He is originally from Russia and he is in Sweden and with Lars Bjorn who is in Sweden. So uh, I don't want to belabor this. And as I said, I am I'm able to explain in the sense because I don't have a pointer but if you see the yellow, big yellow Z scheme or Z scheme, and on the left uh, are the pr things. So the two systems on the top is a photosystem two, and the bottom is photosystem one, and all the very bottom, the tail, is all the electrons. So what did, what did we do? What is our discovery? The first discovery was, yes, chlorophyll A was in both systems. The second discovery was uh, the, pr the suggestion uh, that the photosystem one reaction center discovered by Besser Koch is P700, that there must be another reaction center P680. So that is a suggestion from one of my papers with Anna Cray in Proceedings of National Academy of Science, that there must be a P680 and, and photosystem two. The second important point we discovered that bicarbonate as a carbon dioxide not only needed for the Calvin Benson Basham cycle CO2 fixation, but it was needed as Warburg said for light reactions. But Warburg has said that that means that oxygen comes from carbon dioxide. And that we showed 
was wrong. Although today, again, people are raising the same issue and we have to deal with it. But what we found for sure, that bicarbonate was bound on, on the electron acceptor side of photosystem two near what we call quinone QA and QB. So that is our major finding about the unique role of bicarbonate, which is essential to run the light reactions. Okay, so that's one thing. The second thing we did was to show what are the primary reactions. We did the first with Jim Fenton, uh, one of my students, and with Mike, with the help of Mike Wazulewski in Chicago, Argonne National, we showed, made the first measurements on showing the primary photochemistry events of both photosystem two and photosystem. So these are the main things. Next slide, please. So, to just to explain, if you look at the two electron gate, as we call it, which was discovered in Allen, uh, in Doisen's, Lou Doisen's group. So what, what, what is bicarbonate doing? So an electron comes from photosystem two and goes into what is written here as Q, but it's actually what we call it QA now. And then the electron goes from QA minus to QB and becomes QB minus. So now everything is fine. It runs without bicarbonate. But when the second electron comes, second reaction takes place, the electron goes from QA minus to QB minus to make QB. Now that's bicarbonate is needed. And there's protonation reaction. And that's where all the bicarbonate functions in that place. So that is how uh, this works. Next slide, please. And there is another thing with Warburg. So always fighting with the Nobel laureate Warburg. Warburg said there's only four photons needed to give oxygen. And Emerson's data showed very clearly the eight to 10 goes is needed for oxygen evolution. And so this controversy lasted. And when Emerson passed away, died in a plane crash, Warburg started telling people that now the problem is solved. Well, he was not a nice person to say that. But what we did is, and he said uh, to people and wrote an article in Science that Emerson did not use blue catalytic light Emerson did not use 10% carbon dioxide and all that. So Rajni and I uh, then did those reactions in 1968 and showed that even under all the Emerson's conditions, it was Emerson's value, correct. And then Karen Nicholson came from Germany to work with me to write the book called Maximum Quantum Mill Controversy, Otto Warburg and the Midwest Gang. So we were the gangsters. And I was not included as a gangster because I was a small fry. And the cartoon shows uh, once Emerson on one side and Warburg on the other side and Rabinovich in the middle trying to bring peace. Anyway, this book is uh, done and Karen is thanked for having put that into place. Now, next slide, please. So, begin the bicarb. Now, the picture shows from left to right Tom Wydzinski, I mentioned his name. Then another student, Paul Jusenik. Then Julie Neaton Rye, one of my students who was a professor in New Zealand. Rita Khanna, who's a, in law now, lawyer. And then myself, and sitting Mari Bazaz, I mentioned him. And sitting uh, is Alan Stemler. This is at my house and my granddaughter, Sunita. So Rita Khanna, Tom Wydzinski, uh, Paul Jusenik, Alan Stemmler, they all worked in the bicarbonate effect. And Alan Stemmler was the first one. He is currently in California. He's also retired. And it shows very clearly that if you remove bicarbonate, there is no oxygen evolution. And when you add back bicarbonate, oxygen evolution starts. Okay, next slide, please. So I went to Holland to work with Lou Doisen's gap and Tina Spalas, one of students there, and it showed very clearly, uh, it's a little complicated site with a number of flashes of light, chlorophyll fluorescence. So first flash, low fluorescence, uh, uh, no, I mean darkness, low fluorescence, first flash, high fluorescence, then next flash, second flash, low. So there is a period of two in chlorophyll fluorescence. It is a kind of indirect monitor of the two electron gate I just mentioned. 
And so you believe me that when there is no bicarbonate, uh, everything is slow, electron flow is slow. And when you put back bicarbonate, and not only that, you see that the two electron gate disappears. That's why we became sure that bicarbonate functions on the two electron gate. Next slide, please. So here is the Nobel laureate sitting and with this, you look at his hand and look at his finger up. Means he believed what we were saying. It is not only that he believed what we were saying and what one of my students in Shong, uh, <laughs> he not only believed, but they had a parallel paper, not a parallel, but an important paper because they'd already done the crystal structure and showed where everything was. And we, of course, we didn't know anything. We were just plain physiologists and biochemists, and there was the top people. So they put bicarbonate in, the no, in iron, non-heme iron, between QA and QB. And when he came to visit me, he said, Govindji, this is exactly where it works. And then bottom picture is of Jim Barber, who went further into this. So with this structure, the placement was uh, then, and, Michelle and Dysonoffer had written a paper the same year that Jin Shong and I wrote a paper about, and not the same year, 10 years later, I, I, I'm sorry, I miss, miss, misspoke, uh, wrote the paper. So the structure was there 10 years before, and Ferreira et al. from Barbour. So all that was clear. Next slide, please. So now I go to the next, and I, I will be rather quick now, I hope, and somebody has to tell me when I should stop because my problem is uh, I, I'm not seeing any time. So I, I don't want to belabor the point. It's just to look. This is a slide from Don Ort, and, the, and it is actually for Zhu et al. 2010 Annual Review of Plant Biology a slide uh, showing where can we improve photosynthesis. So the now next step today, everybody, the whole world, wants to improve photosynthesis because the human population is going up not enough food will be there. So where can we change the light capture, conversion efficiency, electrochemistry, a biochemistry, energy. So efforts are being made all over the world, including India and USA and China and Europe everywhere to see what we can do. And uh, next slide, please. So uh, I'm sorry, I, I'm not going to talk uh, show slides, but just have some references to tell you one of the things that's going on in Bhaisnav Tripathi's lab in uh, New Delhi by Deepika Kondoy et al. paper, in which she overexpressed C4 uh, carbonic anhydrase in C3, and she got increase in amino acids potential and biomass. And, and it's published in Plant Biotechnology Journal, journal that Henry Daniel is leading. And then the next one was in China in S. Jiang's group, and it's published in Environmental Science. And they had to say, okay, uh, we, we can improve uh, uh, the growth of algae by killing the algae uh, that are taking over that we don't want. Bloom farming, cyanobacteria, and they killed it with simplest beta diet ketone. And this is uh, in S. Zhang's group in China. So that's another way. Next slide, please. And so in, in USA, there's Dick Sayre and Sangeeta Negi, who had come from India long ago, and Jun Minagawa is in the bottom uh, uh, in Japan, and myself sitting just enjoying retired life. <laughs> and uh, they, 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 they try to see how we can improve photosynthesis. So one of the, I, I'm a co-author of this paper, by the way. I didn't, I should, yeah, yeah, my name is there. <laughs> it is in green, by the way. So, uh, the paper says light regulation of light harvesting antenna size substantially enhances photosynthetic efficiency and biomass yield in green algae. So you reduce the antenna size and you have more efficiency of photosynthesis and more biomass. And this is in ground. And now today, uh, Don Orr's group in, U in Urbana, Illinois, and many others, I would think, are actually doing this Thing in higher plants, more important plants, and showing, yes, this functions also in other systems. Next slide, please. 
Uh, again, it's a very bad looking slide because of the, uh, I just have a title just to remind myself, not to you, and also if you want to read the paper. Uh, so there, there, there is, I went to Mexico um, to the group of Carlos Tejo and his student, um, Jimenez Francisco came to Urbana to work with, in Carl Barnaki's lab here in Urbana, uh, who was one of the great leaders in this field also, besides Don Orr, Steve Long, Lisa Ensworth, Andrew Leakey, everybody here. And we have a small paper uh, showing, uh, can we do something better by taking isolated cells? And so it's a comparison study. Then in Ashwani Parikh's lab, he was mentioned, he's one of the persons who has helped me a lot, and he's a lot of thanks from me, uh, besides by Santapati. So what they did is look at the CO2 and chlorophyll fluorescence in Sweda and growing under diurnal rhythm and after transfer. And so there's also one approach to see how to grow the plants, how best to make it. So this paper is published in photosynthesis research. Uh, few years ago in 2019. And then uh, in Jing Wangzhu's lab in China, uh, they, Saber Hamdani uh, led the most of the work and they looked at the changes in photosynthesis and uh, properties and photoprotection capacity in rice grown under different colors of light. This is one of the highest cited papers in photosynthesis research. And uh, you, can, you have to read it to see uh, what color of light it, it makes it good. I won't tell you more. Next slide, please. All right, so chlorophyll, what I love most is the light that plants give off. And that's chlorophyll fluorescence that competes with photosynthesis for excitation energy. I have exploited this, and you can see on the left Oh, oh, the slides are going by themselves. <laughs> so you, you, give, you give a light, it goes high up in a higher excited state, and finally from the red excited state, photosynthesis and competes heat and fluorescence. So it's a competing process, and we can use that to look very quickly different photosynthetic reactions. And the next slide, please. All right, so I, I won't bore you uh, or bother you with the detail, but just to make sure that you know that there are different fluorescence bands in the system, and they come from different complexes. Uh, I had slides for more of them, so I kept only one. The fluorescence 685 nanometer is coming from a particular complex, uh, CP43. F695 is most likely coming from what is called CP47. And no, no fluorescence from reaction center itself, but there are more, there are more. And the photochemistry, of course, takes from, from the reaction center, P680. Uh, okay, next slide, please. This is a kind of model. And so now what is, what we did, uh, I think, with, um, in Hyderabad was to see if uh, what happens when you turn different kinds of light. We get light two and light one. And what you can see, you can change by giving light one, you can move yeah, not you, but this algae moves, uh, chlamydomonas and other things, moves the protein complex from one system to that. So it's a regulation mechanism by different colors of light to balance the two systems. We, one of my students, Daniel Wong, have worked on it long, long ago, and Prasanna Mohanty uh, was one of the first papers, and Nuri Murata in Japan had done tremendous amount of work. The point is that there is a regulation mechanism, and you can fool with it in order <clears throat> to make better plants. Next slide, better growth of plants. Next slide, please. All right, that, this so the, the experiment, <coughs> excuse me, um, in the bottom was uh, done with Chlamydomonas and Razigopal uh, Subramanian's lab, uh, and a paper was go through at all 2015. And this is chlorophyll fluorescence. Just look at the bottom graph, so we ignore right now the top of the synecocystis. So you can see that you, if you have a mutant which is blocked in one of the states, state one, uh, you can see totally different fluorescence characteristic uh, uh, at height, at, you know, uh, depending on the time of the scale, 
the SMT uh, sort of disappears in this mutant. So basically, we use that as a tool uh, to look at the state changes. Next slide, please. All right, so I am going to end this by, it's a lot of names, you see, and people suggested, Govindji, why you said names? Well, I say names because I believe that the work is not done by one person and everybody must be recognized. So I read very qu quickly. Uh, many, from, I'm thankful to many from India, including Khalid Anwar, Sudhakar Bharti, Salil Bose, Mrin Moidas, Danaji Desai, Ashish Ghosh, who worked with me. He passed away, unfortunately. Anjana Jaju, Deepika Kondoy, Sirisha Kodru, Manmohan Laloria, Tirupati Malabhat, Prasanna Mohanty, who passed away, as I mentioned, Barnali Padi, Subhash Padi, Padasarthi, we saw him, Ashwani Parik, Tadimati Raja Rao, Sri Ranjan, my professor, first professor, Kamal Rohil, Raj Sane, Neera Balla Sarin, Gauri Shankar, Singhal, Snehlata, wife of Ashwani, Neelam Soda, Raja Gopal, we mentioned, Vidya Sagar, Vidyadhar, Tataki, Vaishnav Tripathi, Silas, Kalkan, Kungapa, Muhammad Aslam, Musul, and many, many more. So, next slide, please. And I thank you to those who have done or are doing special things for me. Joy Block here is a student of history of immigrants, uh, Lars Bjorn in Sweden, Sudhir Guru has written a lot, Ashwani Kumar from Rajasthan. Virendra Kumar, Pradipta Mohapapa, Patra, Shushma Naitani, Arthur Nonamura, Ashwani Parik, Dima Shabela, Vini Soni, Sandra So they have, they have been doing so much for me and many more. But I give special thanks to many who were once in my lab and who are now leaders in their own fields. And they are the ones who ran everything that I did. Glenn Bidell. Bill Coleman, Julie Nitten Rye, now in New Zealand, Oliver Holup, who is in Germany, Paul Jusnik in USA, Rita Khanna, she is in Washington, DC, John Monday is in US, Louisa Yangni in US, Paul Spilotro in US. Some of them are doctors. Paul Spilotro is a doctor. Uh Hyun Sik Shim, she is a leader, a very top leader in the field of cancer research. Ralph Schooley, Alan Stemla. David Vandermeulen, Wim Burmas, a professor in Arizona, Daniel Wong, uh, industry, Chunai Shu in China, and Barbara Zilangsas in USA. Next slide, please. I think I'm coming to the end. I'm highly thankful to many at USC, which includes Don Hart, mentioned his name, Steve Long, I mentioned his name, Carl Bernanke, I mentioned his name, Lisa Ainsworth, and Andrew Leakey. It's my website. And Rajni is the most important person in my life. Without her, I could not have done what you have just heard. So on the right, we have a picture in Mexico. And I have a little poem, <laughs> silly poem. I said, I was once a green leaf doing photosynthesis. Now I'm a yellow leaf doing protection biochemistry. It's not really a poem. I know the next stage I'll be doing ecology. And Donald said, I'll be biome. And so this was written at my actual birthday. And I think uh, at this one more slide, maybe. I don't know. Is there? Please see. OK, yes. You can see where this picture was taken. I think it is either in Varanasi, Banaras, or Prague, or Allahabad. Uh, I think it's in Varanasi. It's not my picture. And thank you very much. I hope I didn't take too much time and appreciate you giving me the opportunity to speak to you about some of the things I've done. I, if I've left out anything, my apologies. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, if uh, anyone has to just uh, ask anything on the, based on his talk, maybe he, we can have one. And afterwards, we can uh, move to the next session.
everyone has clearly understood what you are told nothing to be <laughs> clear well, i'm not so sure <laughs> yeah uh, gonji we have sent you a link uh, in your uh, whatsapp and that is the mm. youtube link and this will be followed by our cultural program which is going okay. to take place maybe you can share to your contacts also like uh, who have joined well, who have joined it's not possible for me to do that uh, to share right now i i mean, i still have to find you said whatsapp yeah it's I, on i'm on phone with me yeah uh, open whatsapp yeah it's on uh, whatsapp so i i don't know it has already been delivered in your uh, phone so well i i'm i'm looking at it says join our cloud as the video meeting yeah that is the one that so i click on that i'm not showing you yeah international conference on physiological and molecular mechanisms it says for video stuff. preview no no that is not the one uh, it has so been... i have no idea i'm sorry no from from my side from my name it has come from my name jos i know but where i have can't i have whatsapp i have messenger messages and i have email so if you send me by email i can easily get yeah, it i will send you by email also and uh, you can see the next cultural program which is going to take place here because it is uh, no, please, live i'm sorry i'm very confused you said whatsapp okay so i i click whatsapp <laughs> and i only see i don't see yeah i it, see yesterday something came from somebody else so there nothing is no, from you in, on my whatsapp no in another one minute i will send you by email is that okay. fine i'll send by email okay okay then you can watch that program it will be one hour of a cultural program which is going to take place from 8 to 9 okay L let us move to the next program so thanks a lot for joining uh, with us and uh, today morning we had the inauguration of this conference and it will go for another two days more and it will end by day after tomorrow it will end and it will be followed by five days of workshop so now we are closing this session govind ji we are closing Thank this session you very much i really appreciate you giving me this time i feel blessed okay thanks thanks a lot Okay. Now we will uh, start with the cultural program. I think you can enjoy more if you come to the front seats. Uh, why to leave lot of uh, seats in the front when you have lot of seats? i think you people can come in front also that will be good yeah Ro robi robi Ro robi uh, silvia robi come, come in front you can enjoy yeah please come yes yeah, sir sir yeah please Yeah, come this side. Come this side. Doctor Babu, come, come in front. Come, please. Yeah, please. Sergey
Thus, we have concluded all of today's formal session and let's move on to the most anticipated event of the day. We, the Department of Botany, proudly presents our young talents and the heritage of our lands as a gesture of our appreciation and love for all the participants. So sit back and enjoy.
the Kerala Kalamandalam has, for decades, been regarded as the most prestigious Kathakali school in the entire world. This legendary school of art is located in Cheruturuthi and was originally set up by the famous poet of Malayalam, Sri Vallathol Narayana Menon. Today, the Kalamandalam is the foremost proponent of a variety of traditional performing art forms that include Mohiniyattam, Kudiyattam, Tullal and Nangyarkuta. They have assisted and nurtured Kerala's traditional art forms for nearly a century. It is also an official deemed university for art and culture. Eminent artists from across the state and beyond perform regularly at its famous dance theatre, Kutambalam. A number of scholarships and awards sponsored by patrons from across the world are regularly awarded to aid the students' journey as artists. The department is honoured to have artists from this legendary school of arts to make this event more auspicious and vibrant. We wholeheartedly welcome the entire team of Kerala Kalamandalam to this function. Drishya Shravya Kalagalka, Ere Perimaketa Nadana, Kerala. Kerala Tile, Vaiviti the Aim, Pragirti Manohari the Aim, Varnisha Kundula, Kaida Pram Damodaran Nambudri at Varikalka, Nurthia Vishkaram Sadhima Kirikiana Ibide, Mahakavi, Vallathol Narayana Menon, Kunjan Nambiar, Iraim Mentambi, in the Viral Pariboshi Kipeta, Kerala Tile Sahiti Logate, and Smirish Kundula, Uravish Karamana, Kerala Kalamandalam, Inde Keralam in the Ienathilode, Kala Logatana Summer Pikinada, Idrishavirinil, Kerali Kalagalaya, Mohiniatavum, Kadagalim Ulpade, Vivida Kalaru Bangal Kort and Kikunda, Avadri Pikinu. Kerala is rich and reputed for its highly diverse audiovisual art forms. This cultural diversity is proclaimed by the poet Sri Kaidapram Damodaran Nambudri and is choreographed in his team. The poetic and the literary world created by the great poet Tuvalathol Narayan Menon, dions of literatures like Irian Mam Tambi, Kunjin Nambiar, etc. were proclaimed in this choreography. The Kerala art forms such as Kadagali, Mohini Atam and other art forms were woven together in this item. Malayan Makundaru Thalam Malayalatin Nunduru Ragam Matuchuri Yunduru Samskaram Malaranium Rudu Mohangal Aksharamadium Kavyangal Arthatalangadayam Nathyam Mamburium Nadavaril Mambaramudirum Pundudil Nalu kittin nagavadil Achanunatiya mantrangal Vishukkani pavanudirum pularigal Nanma perunal pun viragal Christmas carol in the inangal Kridayakadal in the arangal Samatu sundar keralam Idu samanayatin keralam Sagodariya pontiram in the Keralam, in the Keralam, oh, Sneha Keralam. Keep the 
ಸವರ್ಣತೆ ಪೂಂಡ ಮೈಥಿಲಿ ಪೋಲೆ ಸ್ವರ್ಣವರ್ಣತೆ ಪೂಂಡ ಮೈಥಿಲಿಯೇ ಪೋಲೆ ತುಂಚಂದ ಕೈರಳಿ ಶ್ಲೋಕತ್ತಿ ಮಾಮಲಯಾಳಂ ಕುಂಜಂದೆ ಶ್ಲೋಕತ್ತಿ ಮಾಮಲಯಾಳಂ ಮಣಿಪ್ರವಾಳಂ ಅಣಿಯು ಚದುರಂಗ ತಾಳತ್ತಿ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಗಾಥ ಪಾಡಿ ಚಿರುಶೇರಿ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಗಾಥ ಪಾಡಿ ಚಿರುಶೇರಿ ಸ್ವಾತಿ ತಿರುನಾಳು ಇರಯಿಂತಂಬಿಯಂ ಸ್ವಾದಿ ತಿರುನಾಳು ಇರಯಿಂತಂಬಿಯಂ ಕುಂಜ ಕುಟ್ಟಿ ತಂಗಚೆಯು ಪದಂಗ ಪಾಡಿ ಕುಂಜ ಕುಟ್ಟಿ ತಂಗಚೆಯು ಪದಂಗಳ ಪಾಡಿ ಪ್ರತಿಧ್ವನಿ 
ಜ್ಞಾನದಿರುಗಳಿಲ್ಲದೆ ವಿಶ್ವಂ ಮುಳುವ ನಿರಂಜು ನಿಲ್ಪು ಅಮ್ಮ ಮಲಯಾಳಂ ಅಮ್ಮ ಮಲಯಾಳಂ Thank you, Kerala Kala Mandalam, for that marvelous performance. I would like to invite Professor M. B. Chetty, ISPP President, former Vice Chancellor, University of Agriculture Sciences, Darwad, to present a memento to the Kala Mandalam team as a token of our love, appreciation, and gratitude. Sir, please. Yeah. Actually, we have this performing uh, arts university in uh, Kerala. and they are 100 kilometers far and they have traveled all the way to perform before the crowd so before getting late they will be going back and our performance will continue with our students and before leaving our uh, ispp president will greet them with a memento which we have already which you are giving from our side so thank you thanks a lot music gives a soul to the universe wings to the mind flight to the imagination and life to everything i welcome miss parvati krishnan to bless the evening with her melodious music Hello hello hello
ിൽ
lovely performance now let us have a melodious song by our office staff adira r
സമയ നദിയിൽ അലസമൊഴുകും നിമിഷ നൗകയിലേറി ഒരു കിനാവിൽ വരിക വീണ്ടും നിശയിൽ for that powerful performance Margam Kali is an ancient Indian round dance prevalent among the Saint Thomas Christian community based in Kerala Various stanzas of the Margam Kali songs describe the arrival of Saint Thomas in Malabar the miracles he performed the friendships as well as the hostility of the people among them, among whom he worked his persecution etc Typically a dozen dancers sing and dance clapping around nilavilakku wearing the traditional chattayum mundum the lamp represents christ and the performers his disciples before you we present our students anna anaka sulfat shruti krishna priya and krishna
students opana opana is a dance form popular among the mapilla muslim community of kerala especially in malabar performed during their wedding ceremonies the maiden sing and dance around the bride clapping their hands and sending tunes that leaves the bride blushing the bride dressed in all finery covered with gold ornaments and palm feet adorned with intricately woven pattern of mailanji that is henna sits amidst the circle of dancers next i welcome fatima rahina fatima nisni lulu mumtaz adira ravi arshita shaji fatima shehna and noor jahan for their performance
mesmerizing performance dancing is surely the most basic and relevant of all forms of expression nothing else can so effectively give outward form to an immense experience for the last and final performance we have our young talents stepping up to a musical fusion of indian classical dances hip hop and western dance I welcome Parvati Krishnan, Chantani, Ananya, Krishnendu, Anaga, Nitya, Sandra, Aparna, and Sri Lakshmi for the performance.
Go. Five, four, three, two, I let one go. Wow, get the fuck though. I don't bluff, bro. Aiming at your head like a buffalo. You a rough neck. I'm a cutthroat. You a tough guy. That's enough jokes. Then the sun died. The night is young though. The diamond still shines. Get a rough ho. Get jazzy on that night that you get on International First class seat on my lap, girl Riding comfortable Cause I ain't know what that girl them need New York to Haiti I got lipstick stamps on my passport You make it hard to leave Been around the world, don't speak the language But your booty don't need explaining All I really need to understand is When you talk dirty to me Yeah, I just uh, wanted to tell you the our students was trained just for 10 days and they have performed uh, in uh, 10 days time. So I would like to invite uh, Nidish, Dr. Nidish, yeah, he's to be Dr. Nidish soon. And uh, he was earlier our, uh, he's a choreographer of this uh, uh, dance program. And he was, uh, he started his PhD in botany and com uh, completed in biotechnology. Now he's faculty in biotechnology. So I invite, yeah, uh, Professor Danga to give the, the memento to him. The students have already said that they would like to have a photo with the uh, resource person. So I invite the resource persons to the stage and we will have a photo together. Yeah, open our team, all come up to the stage. Uh, Mark Gangali and uh, Tirvadira, all please come to the stage. 
our uh, dear resource persons, please come to the stage. We all will have a photo together. Please come to the stage. You can be in the front and we'll be in the back. Okay, so you can come into the front. Yeah. <laughs> Nambi sir, Pradeep sir, please. Please come to the stage. Who are like to have a photo? Lexman sir, please come. Yeah. Who are like to have a photo can come up to the stage. Yeah, please. No, the students have to sit. The first row has to sit, second row to be on knees. Then only we will be seen. The second row on knees. Yes. Anyone else would like to join for the photo? For, yeah, please come. You all are welcome. Harilal sir, come. Hey, 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 join, join, join. Please, come. Thank you all. So here we end today's session. Now there has been a dinner which has been out served outside. So kindly have the delicious meal. And there is a information that all the delegates and participants staying at the Luxora Hotel are reminded to be ready at 8 a.m. as the travel arrangements has been made at that time. So kindly be on time.